Sorry about that, but we are here. We are live at NDC Sydney here from the beautiful Hilton Hotel. Well, not really. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but we are live and we are on the YouTubes. And welcome, everybody. Uh, this is really exciting. We got a whole day full jam packed of all sorts of technical content. And um, before we get into all that, though, there are a few things that I just need to mention. Now, first of all, obviously, we are sort of in Sydney. We are actually everywhere, but it's Sydney that comes together for this event. Now, please go as a first step to go to expo.ndcsydney.com because we could not do this, with all this without all the sponsors that we uh, have this year as well. So go and check out all the uh, different booths, the virtual booths. Um, and you might even win some stuff, right? Yep. So go there, ndcsydney.com. Um, and then also we need to make sure that um, you stay around for the quizzes because you can win stuff. I know you can win more stuff. So in between all the talks, we're going to have a few different things that kind of keeps you engaged, entertained. Make sure that we have a great day with not just all talk, right? But we're going to also mingle, etc. But there are some quizzes. Um, they're going to be happening right here on the stream. All you need to do is just access Slido. That's it. Um, at lunchtime, we're going to try something new. If you have a ticket to NDC Sydney, so not just on the uh, live YouTube stream, which is free, if you have a ticket for NDC Sydney, you can join Gather Town. Um, I'm going to be there and we can hang out during the lunch break. And, and see, it's sort of like a virtual environment for conferences and you get a little avatar and everything. You should have a link. Um, if you don't, just check out the Slack channels as well. There should be all the inf information there. And then, of course, Slack. I just mentioned Slack. Everything happens on Slack behind the scenes, as in all the rooms, everything, all the communication is on uh, Slack. And there's an agenda. Of course, there's an agenda. If you are wondering what is going to come up on the different tracks, so we have four tracks this year, you can go to ndcsydney.com slash agenda and check that out there as well. And you can see everything that's coming up throughout the day. Now, the YouTube stream, if you're watching that, that is track one. So you can see what talks are going to come up there. Uh, room two, three, four are going to be uh, for ticket holders, and that's going to happen uh, through Slack. You can see how you join all the different talks there on Slack. Um, and then, of course, um, I am not the only one hosting this year. No, I know. There are other co-hosts that you will meet throughout the day. We have William Lindbergh, we have Aaron Powell, and we have David Wenger. Uh, they're all going to help out as well, so you're not just going to be stuck with my ugly face, right? Um, but I think that's enough. I'm just going to make sure I've done all the housekeeping. I've got little people telling me what to do here. Um, I think we're good. So I'm going to go straight into introducing our keynote. Now, um, it's Melissa Houghton, and Melissa is a lead software engineer at Asenix, Asenix, however you want to say it. <laughs> she's also a Microsoft MVP in developer technologies. Um, and she's focused mainly on the Angular.NET Azure stuff, but she actually does all the things. Um, so um, what else should I say? Well, Melissa is an advocate for women in tech. That's something I'm a big proponent of as well, to be honest. Um, I think we need more diverse crowds in tech. Uh, that's one of the ways we can do that. Um, she does a ton of community things um, all over. Azure Reactor, the NDC Sydney like this, uh, meetups. Um, yeah. Um, I'm sure she can tell you all about it as well. And she, of course, she travels all over the world when we can, talking at tech conferences as well. Now, she is originally from California, but she's pretty much an Aussie now. We're not going to give her back. So um, I'm hoping Melissa will join me on the on the stream here. Oh, there she is. Good morning. Hello, Hello. <laughs> Good morning. How are you doing? Yeah, pretty good. I'm excited yeah. to to be here today, even if it is a, in a virtual context. I know, I know. But next year, yeah. we're going to be there live in Sydney, right? So, yes, yes, definitely. I'm excited to yeah, for sure. go up and visit. <laughs> oh, man. It's um, so th it is what it is. We're here. We're doing everything that we can online. Um, now, you're going to be talking about leadership through self awareness this morning. And is there anything you want to mention beforehand, or should we just jump straight into your talk? What do you reckon? We can jump straight into it. Sweet. All right. So I'm going to be back with Melissa with some QA. If you do have questions for Melissa throughout the talk, put them in the YouTube chat. Um, and I will get to him after Melissa has done a talk. Take it away. Awesome. Thank you, guys. <laughs> cool. So my talk today, as Lars men mentioned, is leadership through self-awareness. And you can become a great leader by understanding yourself. A leader is not determined by a title, but by influence over others. 
and anyone can become a leader. But first, you need the right skills. You can build your leadership skills and become a great leader through self-awareness. In this talk, I will dive into self-awareness, what it is, how to develop it, how self-awareness can not only make you a better leader, but how it can help your followers become leaders too. Building up our skills to understand ourselves creates a positive impact on those around us and helps us to navigate the difficult world we're living in and enables us to become great leaders. But first, a little bit more about me. So as Lars men mentioned, my name is Melissa Houghton and I'm a lead software engineer at Xenix and a Microsoft MVP in developer technologies. I'm very active online, especially on Twitter. So please do connect with me on there and share your thoughts as I'm going in my talk today. You may also recognize me as one of your hosts from NDC Melbourne, if you're able to catch NDC Melbourne. And I am coming to you live from Melbourne. So unfortunately, I'm not in Sydney either, but I do hope to go and visit there for next year's conference. We have people tuning in from all over the world and people who have helped organize uh, and are behind the scenes from all over the world as well. So thank you to everyone for listening today and those who ma helped make this event happen. I was actually lucky enough to help with organizing NDC Sydney this year and helped a little bit on the agenda committee. If you're thinking I chose myself to be the keynote, you are very much mistaken. Oh, and my cat is here to say hello. <laughs> of course, hopefully uh, he gets his cuddles out at the beginning. But anyways, I didn't choose myself for this talk. If you're able to catch myself, um, catch my talk last year, it was all about imposter syndrome, which I suffer very heavily from and definitely battled against it in the lead up for today. Imposter syndrome is commonly felt by leaders and my tactics for dealing with imposter syndrome are very related to self-awareness. And my understanding of that and my battle against it have helped me to build my self-awareness. And all these experiences have fed into my talk that I have for you today. And my idea for this talk is not a unique one. When writing this talk, I pulled from many different leadership training courses I've done throughout my career. And I did tons of research, found hundreds and hundreds of articles and it, scientific studies on this very topic. But the idea for me originated from a leadership training camp that I attended and helped to run through Rotary Club. The camp was for young adults aged 18 to 28 called the Rotary Youth Leadership Awards, or we called it RILA for short. And it was all focused on leadership through self-awareness. The camp was over a week long in the woods with no phones, no computers, completely off the grid. I was lucky enough to attend the camp in 2016 and then become a counselor for a few, few years after that to help teach others those same skills. So this photo here is of me as a counselor at the camp with the group of young adults that I helped to teach. I'm not trying to retrofit this camp into a conference talk, but that idea of becoming a better leader by understanding yourself is one that has always stuck with me. And many other leadership training courses that I've done have focused on very similar concepts. If I could see everyone there in the audience, I would ask you to raise your hand if you've ever done a personality test as part of some sort of corporate training. And I'm going to guess that many of you have. And this is because self-awareness and understanding ourselves, our personalities and our different traits is one of the key skills to becoming a great leader to working well with others and successfully being in a team. Knowing how to improve our leadership skills boils down to understanding oneself. But first, what is leadership? Leadership has many definitions. In the dictionary, it says that leadership is the action of leading a group of people or an organization. I didn't find this too helpful, so I looked up the definition of lead. And it told me that lead is the initiative in an action, an example for others to follow. So if we put this together, we can say that leadership is the action of taking the initiative and setting an example for others to follow. Now, I like this definition because to me, a leader is a someone with followers. You can't force people to follow you. Other people will decide whether you are truly a leader or not, because leadership is not actually about you. 
It's about those around you. And it's not always the person who may have lead in their title or manager or executive or whatever it may be. It's the person who is truly influencing, the one who is motivating, supporting, and enabling those around them. And the leader could be anyone at any level with any type of personality, background, or experience. They could be you. A manager, on the other hand, controls to get a goal. There is that common depiction of manager versus leader showing the, the whole push and pull, where the manager is pushing the employees from the back, giving them commands, and generally not actually helping out too much. Where the leader is out at the front, pulling the team forward and get, driving them to their goal. With the right skills, attitude, and approach, people will follow. So what makes a good leader? I would like to hear from everyone uh, watching on the stream, if I can. I would love to see comments in the chat coming from you of what you think makes a good leader. There are many different leadership attributes that people have, and anyone can have it at any level. It's not just the ones at the front. So to you, what makes a good leader? People can be leaders in many different contexts. We have here a comment saying a good leader manages the people, not the tasks, and everyone works differently. Yes, that's definitely true. It's about looking at everyone's different skill sets. Pe leaders are the ones that are helping others out, and they're even the ones that are supporting the leader. We have to manage each other's strengths and weaknesses and work together to become good, great leaders. I see integrity and empathy. Leaders are the ones who are doing the little tasks that other people may have forgotten. They're checking in with the team members who may be quiet lately. There doesn't always have to just be one leader. Think about in a, a game of basketball. You have the coach, the person making the plays, someone who did the assist and someone who actually shot the poop. Who is the leader in that situation? All of them could be leaders. It's about taking this step initiative and working together to make that goal happen. I see more things in the chat, accountability, helping you to achieve your full potential, democracy. A leader sets a direction work, and works to clear those blockers for the team and avoiding those mindfalls, minefields someone who inspires. Any of us can be good leaders. It's all about taking that step and initiative and working towards a goal to make that happen. In the, in the game of basketball, they all play that small role to get to the end and they were leaders in their own way. So in the words of Bill Gates, as we look ahead to the next century, leaders will be those who empower others. But how do we empower others? How do we become that person that others want to follow? How do we separate ourselves from the managers and become the leader? It all comes down to understanding ourselves. Before we look at taking care of others, we have to first look at taking care of ourselves and our actions and how they are received by the other people. So self-awareness does not equal leadership, but it is a key foundation. And all those traits that people mentioned, the being inspirational, being accountable, having integrity and empathy, delegating those tasks and managing everything effectively, having active listening, good communication, the ability to really empower others that all first starts with yourself. So self-awareness is really when you are aware of yourself. It's, it's in the name, right? It's about being aware of your values your personality, your strengths, your weaknesses, your habits and emotions, and how they affect your actions and the actions of those around you. People are not born completely self-aware, yet research has found that from infancy, we do develop that rudimentary sense of self-awareness. And as we go through life, we continue to build our self-awareness and you can continue to work on it no matter what age you are, 
but true self-awareness is actually quite rare. Research estimates that only 10 to 15% of people are truly self-aware. And the concept of self-awareness has appeared in texts for centuries in the concept of self pondered by many for even longer. However, the official study of self-awareness as we know it now began with Shelley Duvall and Robert Wickland in 1972. Duvall and Wickland proposed that at a given moment, people can focus attention on the external self or your internal self and your environment around you. This theory and further research actually separates self-awareness into two parts. The first is your internal or your private self-awareness. This is how you look at yourself, looking at your inner self, your emotions, and your actions. Generally, we don't actually really focus on ourselves, but in certain, certain situations, it can cause our attention to be drawn inward. Take a moment now to think about how you are breathing. Take a deep breath in and out. Generally, we don't actually focus on our breathing, but because I mentioned it to you now and drew your attention to it, that caused you to become self-aware in that moment of your breathing. So this is an internal type of self-awareness. It happens when you become aware of an aspect of yourself in some private way, in awareness of your internal state. So seeing your face in a mirror or suddenly thinking about the way you're breathing in and out, that is internal self-awareness. And the other part of this is external self-awareness, which is our awareness, how it's perceived by others of how we appear to others. So it's an imagined perspective of our external self, an awareness of your appearance on how others see you. So it's not, it's called imagined or perceived because we are coming to conclusions on what this external self looks like to people. It's about our understanding of how our actions are impacting others. So for example, right now I'm giving this presentation and I'm aware of my body movements and maybe little things that I might be doing. And I'm coming to conclusions on how you are viewing me based on them. I don't actually know exactly what you're thinking, but I am having a bit of external self-awareness because you're watching me. And we, when we are aware that we are being watched and evaluated, we often try to behave in ways that are socially acceptable or desirable. It's like when we tell a joke that might be a little bit contentious and we look at our friends to see how they might react because we know initially our reactions it might not actually fit into social norms. And so we go off that external self-awareness and the reactions of others to understand our external self. So the internal self-awareness tends to result in behavior that reflects our personal values and our external self-awareness can cause behavior to become more consistent with that of social expectations and societal norms. So from these two types of self-awareness, Dr. Tasha Urch has developed four self-awareness archetypes. So if we start in the bottom left corner, we have seekers. This type has both low internal and external self-awareness. They don't really know too much about themselves and they're seeking the information. But because they're not aware, they often have feelings that they are frustrated or they're stuck. If we go up to the top left corner, we have introspectors. These people have high internal and low external. They're clear on who they are and what their values are, but they often don't challenge their views and have a closed mindset. And this can harm their relationships and limit their success. In the bottom right-hand corner, we have pleasers. They have low internal and high external. So they're focusing more on pleasing other people and how they appear within society. But this means they overlook things that are actually important to them and they can make it makes them feel like they're not being fulfilled. And in the top right corner, we have the small few who are truly self-aware. So true self-awareness is when you have high internal self-awareness and external. They know who they are, but they're continuously seeking feedback, having an open mind and adjusting to fit into their environment and improving. So building self-awareness is an ongoing task. 
And we have to ensure that we are working, working on both sides of our self-awareness. Because if we don't, it can have a negative outcome. If we do not build it correctly, we start to focus on the sort of negative side effects. Focusing too much on ourselves can actually make us a, a bit self-absorbed. And to the point where we're not actually paying attention to the world around us, we have that closed mindset. We're not gaining insight from others. It can also lead to distress, excessive self-consciousness, or anxiety. There does tend to be an element of vulnerability with self-awareness as well. And that negative focus that comes with it can really become a, a downer in a cycle that we get stuck in. People who are externally self-aware tend to be very concerned about how, how others are judging them based on their action. And this can lead to what's called evaluation anxiety, in which people become distressed, anxious, or worried about how they're being perceived by others. It's something called the sadder but wiser paradox that says learning about ourselves not only makes us wiser, but it can make us sadder as well. So how do we change this? How do we make sure we're not mulling over these negative emotions and instead reflecting objectively, aiming to find out more? It starts with asking the right questions, practicing that introspection, understanding ourselves and our surroundings. But introspection alone does not equal happiness or success. And if we do it incorrectly, it can make things worse. So much is hidden that we, in our unconscious minds, that we often end up creating excuses and form conclusions that are not necessarily true. And research has found that we are mentally not actually able to pull up all of our different thoughts and feelings from our unconscious mind. So we need to focus on moving forward instead of fixating on what happened. Change your reflective questions from why me to what can I do to improve? from why is this happening to what can I do to make it better? Change your questions from why to what. Change from why am I so upset to what can make me happy. Focusing on becoming the aware archetype, building both our external and internal self-awareness, looking at what you're doing, what you are feeling, and what your blind spots may be focusing on learnings, improvements, and moving forward from our failures. There is a technique called the Jahari window, which is designed to help people understand their relationships with themselves and their others. In this exercise, participants are given a list of adjectives, such as cheerful, observant, outgoing, and they choose those the ones that they feel best describe themselves and their own personality. And then some of their peers get the same exact list and they choose adjectives that they think describes that person. And they, you then compare the two lists and find out which ones match to describe the subject. And those are what is known to others and known to self. So that's what fits into the external self. The ones that are overlapping in other ways fit into the other four quadrants of the window depending on what the crossover was for selecting them. But these four areas represent your, your private internal self, things that you wrote down that the other people didn't, or even your blind spots, things that the other people wrote down that you didn't write out about yourself. And those unknown adjectives that neither person chose can be your unconscious self. So doing something like this and, and having a tool with impact from your uh, in information from your peers can help us understand how others perceive us, how that matches our reflection, and it helps us to focus on which areas we may need to work on and help us to change those questions from why to what. There's also a lot of positive outcomes with self-awareness. When we change those questions from why to what, we start to get those positives. And these are really increased understanding of our self-development needs, allowing us to focus on what really are our strengths and weaknesses, higher levels of confidence and creativity, an open mindset and the ability to adapt, acceptance and understanding of ourselves and those around us, we become more proactive at work, more willing to take on a challenge or to step up and take the initiative. We understand where we can fit in, what our strengths are, 
and where we may need to rely on the strengths of others. We end up making better decisions, building stronger relationships, having more effective communication. And research has found that self-awareness is the most important capability for leaders to develop. And it can create more successful and satisfied employees, more profitable organizations, and more effective leaders. If we want to understand ourselves, uh, first we need to look at things like our personality type. Personalities are determined by genetics, environments, and situations. It's really the characteristic pattern of thinking and feeling or behaving. And there's many different ways to measure your personality and different types of personality scales. One that I like is Myers-Briggs, which gives you one of 16 personality types. It's described on the screen, and I know there's a, a whole ton of tiny little information up there, and I could do a full talk just on personality types alone. So if you're interested in learning a bit more about this, I would definitely recommend uh, going and researching it a bit more afterwards, after this talk. But basically what the personality type does for you is it looks at where you sit on the scale within the, the different areas. It looks at how you prefer your, your world focus, whether you're more inward or outward. It looks at how you process information, how you like to make decisions, and how you prefer to live your outer life or how much structure you prefer. When you're looking to figure out your personality type, I would really look for some sort of framework that gives you a breakdown of what each piece means and where you sit on the scale. Because it is a scale and it does move around as well, depending on your situation. Some people may have uh, different personalities in a work context versus a home context. So if you uh, take personality tests in, in different times of your life, you may come up with different results. But doing these kind of personality tests, especially with a team environment, can be really helpful for understanding your, not only yourself, but your team as well. Have your team take one of these and share the results with each other. It's beneficial for us to understand how other people might naturally feel and versus how we will. I had a previous role where I was working alongside a colleague and both of us were in leadership positions and our roles were overlapping. We are constantly butting heads and just approaching problems in different ways and had a whole bunch of communication issues. As a, a group, we did personality tests and I actually discovered this person was on the complete opposite end of the scale from me. And that gave me some brand new insight. Having the understanding of how she operated and liked to operate versus how I did allowed me to monitor my actions when I was working with her adjust my communication style to one that more suited what she naturally enjoyed, and inevitably, it helped us to work better together. As a leader, when you understand your personality and the personality of your team, you can use these insights to adjust and work better together. In addition to personality types, there's many different types of leadership styles, and understanding what kind of style works best for us in, the, in a given situation can really help us to achieve our goals. There's one theory that's commonly referred to that it's called the full range leadership model. It has three distinct styles, one of which is split into two subcategories. The first is laissez-faire, and that's the least active, the least more of a passive engagement as a leader. And it gives all of the power to make decisions to the followers. It gives them the complete decisions, the complete freedom to make decisions over their work. So this can be highly effective if your team is super experienced and really trustworthy. But if you have more of a, a junior team that's just starting out, it may not be the best leadership style to use. The next is called transactional leadership, and that's working on a, a motivational system through rewards and punishment. So the first subcategory in that is management by exception. And that's when the management actually steps in when the team is not meeting those standards. So it can help in certain situations where the team may be falling behind and needs their extra helping hands, but it can also make the team a bit frustrated if they feel like you're taking over for them. The next part of that is transactional contingent reward, which is an active and positive exchange between leaders and followers and where their followers are rewarded or recognized for accomplishing the achieved 
object objective. So transactional leadership establishes more of a standardized practices within an organization. So it can be really, really useful if your organization is growing and going through some sort of transformation. The last is called transformational. And this is proven to be the most effective within the modern workforce, especially in the world of the pandemic because tra transformational leadership is all about that humanitarian approach. And it's driven in the most reliant leadership style on self-awareness. It's defined as going beyond exchanging inducements for desired performance by developing, intellectually stimulating, and inspiring followers to transcend their own self-interest for a higher collective purpose, mission, or vision. Transformational leaders are visionaries, and they're really role models who drive organizations. The Another part of being self-aware and being a great leader is all about your communication. Communication is often cited as the most important leadership skill and skill in working in a team. And internal communications in the organization can significantly increase employees' productivity and engagement. And with the recent move to our remote and hybrid working, communication is more important than ever. There's a famous 73855 rule in communication, which has created, which was created by Professor Albert Merchabin in 1971. And what he says is that the meaning of a message is 7% verbal, 38% tone and expression, and 55% body language. There's a bit of a debate on the specifics of this theory, and but researchers agree that somewhere between 70 to 90% of communication is nonverbal. So what does this mean for a remote workforce? It means that we have to try our best to still convey those nonverbal cues in our communication. Try to have your camera on when you can and connect in that way. Remember that people are watching you, so don't completely zone out and try to, try to look forward if you can. I know it's very difficult depending on our home situations. But do also pay attention to your tone of voice, even just in your writing, in the emails and messages that you're sending out. And provide supplemental information for your team to absorb that helps give context in nonverbal ways. Use those emojis and those gifs to support your message or send a video recording when you can't have a video chat face to face. In the study of remote leadership, communication effectiveness was also a strong predicator of leadership performance. So having really effective communication made it so that leaders performed better in the remote working world. And communication also comes in many different forms and styles. So understanding your own style is essential and communicating that to your team. Do you like to have all of the details beforehand or would you rather just have a short, quick summary of what happens? And vice versa with your teammates, understanding how they like to be communicated to can help you all work better together. So acquiring strong communication skills can help you to better connect with your friends, colleagues, and even your own leaders. For me, the, the most important leadership skill that is really underpinned and driven by self-awareness is emotional intelligence. This is sometimes referred to as EQ, which is emotional quote, quotient and how you measure emotional intelligence. And the very most essential part in being able to have some sort of degree of emotional intelligence is driving your self-awareness. So people with a high degree of self-awareness have a solid understanding of their own emotions, strengths, weaknesses, and what drives them. And emotional intelligence is the ability to recognize those emotions, understand what they're telling you, and realize how your emotions affect people around you. It also involves your perception of other people's emotions. When you understand what they're feeling, and this allows you to manage those relationships effectively and use emotions to your benefit. There are four components that you can break down emotional intelligence into. And the first really is self-awareness, the ability to detect your emotions and decipher what those different emotions that you're feeling may be. Perceiving emotions 
represents a really basic aspect of emotional intelligence, being able to process emotional information. The next is self-management, being able to control and really harness those emotions that we have around us. Catch ourselves before we react in a really harsh way because we're, we're a bit angry or maybe we're stressed out. Being able to adapt and stay positive. We can use our emotions to facilitate different cognitive activities such as problem solving and thinking and becoming more creative. An emotionally intelligent person can really capitalize on their moods and emotions to really fit the task at hand. And the next category is looking more external. So that's the uh, social awareness, the ability to understand the emotions that other people may be having. To appreciate people's, that people experience emotions differently from ourselves and understand how emotions may evolve at other time and really being able to empathize, empathize with other people. Being able to detect and decipher emotions in, in people's faces, in, in videos, or in pictures. And when you look at empathy, that's a, a whole other talk in itself as well. But empathy can be broken down into three main parts. The cognitive section, which is, I know how you think. The more emotional section, which is, I know how you feel. And empathetic concern, which is, I care about you. And you really need all three of these parts to really have empathy and strong emotional intelligence and be able to connect with others. And lastly, we have using those emotions for our relationship management, managing them in other people through coaching and mentoring and being able to diffuse a conflict or a situation and being that inspiration, inspirational leader that people may need. Becoming a diffuser and lifting the team up when they're down, harnessing emotions, both good and bad, and managing them to achieve your goals. So why is this important? Well, although in the past, a good leader was usually more one who was, you know, at the front giving orders, what we now see as a manager, and they controlled the overall performance of the organization. But now everything is different. Leaders are expected to be less authoritarian and more humanitarian. They're expected to motivate and create a sense of belonging and empowerment. They are expected to make employees feel comfortable, which helps them to work more effectively. People want leaders who are empathetic and understanding. Leaders who still need to Go, grow emotionally often have problems managing stress in difficult situations. So growing our emotional intelligence can help us to ensure we are able to manage our energy effectively and have a really solid life balance and get through the tough times. In a study done by the Center for Creative Leadership in the United States, they found that the three main reasons for executives who fail are difficulty in handling change, inability to work well in a team, and poor interpersonal relations. People with high emotional intelligence are curious. They want to learn more and are not afraid to ask those questions. They're able to empathize and put themselves in the sh shoes of others and diffuse situations. They make strong connections and are great leaders. So how do you build up your emotional intelligence? You can start really by just creating a list of the different emotions that you may be feeling. C sit down and write down as many emotions that you that you actually know of that you can list and come to your mind because having a bigger emotional vocabulary can help us to then match those emotions to the feelings that we're having and being able to articulate them. If you find your list of emotions that you can think off the top of your head is not very big, go out and do some research and find out what more emotions there are available in the world. Observe how you react in different situations and reflect on reactions that may have turned out poorly. Examine how you handled stressful situations and things that you have done in the past to help you manage them as well. Practice putting yourself in other people's shoes. Let's say, for example, a team member comes to you very upset because they, they got something wrong. Maybe they performed poorly or the outcome was not to the standard that they expected. You may have 
seen this happen and thought, man, that wasn't a big deal. Like, why are they upset? It, it doesn't matter. But if they come to you upset and you tell them that, how do you think they'll react? They might be taken aback, uh, think that you don't care and frustrated that you're not willing to help and maybe even annoyed at your not understanding of them. Instead, try to put yourself in their shoes. Understand that people react differently to different situations and everyone's definition of hard is different. Acknowledge their emotions and manage your own to empathize with them in their situation. Similarly, before you send off that angry email, take a step back and reflect and revisit with a new mindset once your emotions have calmed down a bit. If you do react in a, an emotionally driven way, make sure you take ownership and responsibility for what has happened and work to improve it in the future. Recognizing your emotions and reactions are when they happen will help you to manage them in the future. And the ability to do this is really grounded in self-awareness. Another tool that's really important in self-awareness leadership is a concept called self-leadership. And that's actually really just being a leader for yourself. It's a process of influencing yourself to achieve your goals, because not all managers that you may have or are great leaders. And so you can't actually rely on people around you in leadership positions to help you up to become self-aware or become a great leader. Sometimes you have to lead yourself. And you can influence your self-leadership using three key strategies. The first is looking at your behavior, having self-observation, setting goals for yourself, making sure they're, they're smart goals, that you're tracking them and revisiting them and looking at your little cues and idiosyncrasies. The next is by building in natural rewards. This is making sure there's enjoyable features in your work task and building in pleasure, making sure you're doing things that you enjoy or making things a bit more fun by making it a little game or giving yourself some sort of reward at the end. The next is constructive thought patterns. This is evaluating one's beliefs and assumptions and practicing positive self-talk. Turn negative thoughts into positive ones and motivate yourself to be the best leader that you can be. Taken together, these strategies really describe how individuals gain awareness over their own beliefs and their behaviors, and then constantly can consciously work towards mentally track and realize their goals. I find these strategies are actually quite similar to my tricks to overcoming imposter syndrome, which are to recognize, rationalize, and reflect. And building those up and becoming a self-leader and overcoming that imposter syndrome helps you to become a good leader yourself. When you do this, other people then perceive you as a stronger, more capable leader. And the overall performance of a leader is stronger when they're, perform when they're skilled in leading themselves. Closely related to this is another skill called self-efficacy. And self-efficacy refers to an individual's belief in their capability, capacity to execute behaviors necessary to produce specific performance attainments. So self-efficacy really reflects that confidence we have in our ability to motivate our control our behaviors and our social environment. It's the ability to believe in ourselves to succeed. And this skill is very important to motivation, to resilience, getting up when, when times are tough and keep going at it, to taking on challenging problems, stepping outside of our comfort zone and becoming more engaged in our work. Studies have shown that when individuals feel confident to lead, it positively impacts people's evaluation of them and their followers see them as a more capable, capable leader. So you can develop self-efficacy through experience, seeing others around you succeed and su support and persuasion from your team and the people around you. And it can help you to manage your psychological responses. So working on these skills will make us more confident, stronger leaders. So leadership and building up all of these benefits of self-awareness do not just benefit us, 
they benefit our followers, the most important people in leadership, in being a leader. They're the people who put us in that position in the first place. They're, they see us as role models and end up modeling our behavior. They're using our success and our, our openness and our awareness as motivation for themselves. It helps them to build up their self-efficacy and their pursuit for self-awareness. And you can also share your knowledge and encourage the learnings and encourage your team to reflect. Coach rather than give answers and use something called the five why technique to get to the real root of the problem, which is all about asking why five times. It helps you to shed root, shed light on the situation by getting to the root of the problem. Those continual questions help you to get what is really happening beneath. I once had a manager who I actually can see on the, the YouTube chat today, uh, Adam Watkins, he's watching, shout out to you. But I once had him as a manager and he pretty much answered all of my questions with questions. And at the time I did find it a bit frustrating, but it was very useful for helping me to get to the root of the situation and guide myself in my introspection. I would ask him, should I apply to the Rotary Leadership Camp? He would say, what do you think? I would say, I'm thinking it's a good experience. I don't know. What do, you, what do you think? And he would say, why? And it would keep going like that. Inevitably, in the end, I would answer my own questions. And his line of questioning would lead me to that answer, encouraging my introspection. And you can do this for your followers as well. A study was actually published earlier this year that was looking at the connection of self leader self-awareness and follow leadership as well. And basically it said that if a leader has strong self-awareness, that will feed into their ability to build up self-leadership, which in turn raises their self-efficacy, which in turn makes their followers more likely to become leaders and more likely to be nominated for promotion. So having that self-awareness as a leader helps your followers to build their self-awareness themselves. And in turn, it makes them become more likely to be leaders themselves. As I mentioned at the beginning, leaders can be in any context. There's not just one at the top, there's people in many different situations. So you need many leaders in your team to be successful and reach that goal. And there's also benefits that go on to the organization. Empirical research has consistently demonstrated that leadership behaviors influence organizational performance. Workers are more trusting of leaders who are self-aware. They're more inspired and more motivated. External relationships with clients and customers end up being stronger. In the words of Maya Angelou, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Being self-aware and having the strong relationships can make people feel good and it creates those positive connections. Self-awareness in leaders and your team creates an impact, it makes everyone more engaged in their work and in the end produces better results for your organization. We can all build self-awareness. First, by working to understand ourselves, then practicing and reevaluating with the context of others. According to Duvall and Wickland's theory, anything that makes people focus intention on their self will increase self-awareness. And they actually did some research by placing people in front of very large mirrors and videotaping them, then having them listen to a recording of themselves while they were watching themselves and, and being recorded in turn. So I think this is kind of funny because everyone absolutely hates listening to themselves. And Whenever I do a talk, I go back and listen to it afterwards, listen to the recording. And it always makes me feel quite uncomfortable watching myself give a presentation, watching myself speak. But I become a better speaker overall as a result because I'm able to look for those little ticks and, and maybe things that I, I'm doing that maybe I should improve for next time. So I'm able to be, help me become self-aware of the things that I am doing. There are also things called self-awareness triggers, which can be really big events in our lives, uh, things that are really impactful or really change the way things happen, something like a pandemic, you know? <laughs> um, but these triggers by themselves do not 
fully develop self-awareness. They need to be supplemented by that positive reflection, asking the questions of what, not why. And without those triggers, you can also look to your team and the people around you, get that 360 feedback, which is encouraging you to give feedback on yourself and look at how you've been doing and also supplement it with the feedback from your people around you at all levels. There's also scientific tests to assess and target different areas of, of self-awareness that you may be missing. You can take those personality tests and look up different leadership and communication styles, paying attention to your actions and the impact they may have on others. Do you need to maybe work on your mindfulness, building up your emotional intelligence, your communication, uh, trying to look more at your external self, having that open mind? Keep a journal, take a step back, and slow down when your emotions start to boil and really practice that self-regulation. In summary, we have learned a lot about leadership, that anyone can be a leader. It's not just about the title, but it's really about having people to follow you. We learned what self-awareness is, how it can be negative if we don't seek it properly, but we can fix this by changing our whys to whats. We've learned about different leadership skills, styles and emotional intelligence. We learn the positive of these in leadership and how they're all underpinned by self-awareness. We have heard how self-awareness can be beneficial to ourselves, our team and our organization. Leadership through self-awareness can make you a great leader. It can help us to become leaders, not just for ourselves, but for our team and our organization. I will leave you with a quote from Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu. At the center of your being, you have the answer. You know who you are and you know what you want. So thank you. If you scan the QR code on the screen or go to that bit.ly link there, you can access all of my resources that I use today. I've uh, put up a whole bunch of different articles and, and different um, blog posts that I did as long as links to some personality tests. My slides will be available there. I'm not sure if they're up there at the moment, but I'll put them up there shortly as well. So thank you very much everyone who tuned in today. And I don't know how we are doing for time, but I might take some questions as well. Um, and before that, I also have some swag to give away um, from our, our friends at Microsoft. Uh, if you go to the links up there, you can claim your free Azure swag. Unfortunately, the, the swag is only for people in Australia and New Zealand due to shipping constraints, but we also have some Azure passes there too. So thank you everyone for tuning in today. And I think we do have some time for questions. Let's see. We do indeed. Well done, Melissa. Now, Thank um, you. I learned something from uh, from we. Uh, I, you know, my company recently got acquired by another company, and they have this tradition of instead of clapping on a Zoom call because no one can hear it, everybody does this. Ah, and it's kind of an anyway. So I thought I'll just do this. There's also <laughs> yeah. There's also um. I think this is like clapping yep. in sign language as yes, well. So I've seen people right. use that too. <laughs> um, it's just it's interesting when you see a Zoom call with like 200 people and everybody does this or that or whatever. Yeah. But yeah. Um. Oh, well done. We do have a couple of questions if if you don't mind. Cool. Um, yeah. So the first one is as a leader, have you had like stressful moments where someone may have behaved inappropriately, say with a client, and what you do? How do you how do you manage that? Yeah, so it's I think it's about first talking with the person in in, in a private context as well. You, you know, you don't want to sort of call them out and from everyone else because you never know what might be happening and they might not actually be even aware of the situation. That's right. So so pulling the person aside, having a chat about what happened, making sure you're, you're using facts and really outlining this is what happened and, and this is the result and getting their insights on, you know, how did you think that went? So they might already be aware that something negative happened. They might be practicing their self-awareness and realize after the fact, hey, I should have changed that. Um, but they also, maybe they haven't figured it out. So you can help coach them through, you know, why it was negative and work with them to uh, improve it for next time. And you probably also have to go and do some ground control with the, the client as well and use that that empathy and emotional intelligence to help mend that relationship. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's an interesting one because it's it's always easy when it's everything's going smoothly. Like yeah, it seems doing yeah. well, right? It's always when something doesn't go to plan that all these things come out. So that's really good. Um, now, has you got have you got any tools um, for you know recommendation for self assessment or EQ or anything like that? Yeah. So um, I in my my resources, I'll, I'll share the uh, link on the on the YouTube shortly. Um, but there is some free sort of quizzes online that you can do to check your level of self-awareness and they pretty much yep. all also um, in, require input from your friends because that's part of that external self-awareness. So it's about, you know, comparing the two. Um, it, in terms of building up your own emotional intelligence, it's, you know, creating a list of the different emotions that you know, researching ones that you may not, uh, and really just practicing, recognizing your emotions. You can, um, after a situation, you use those, those what questions of, um, you know, thinking about what happened in that situation, your reactions that you had, was it emotionally driven where you, maybe you were stressed out, so you reacted negatively and uh, practice, you know, recognizing it as it's happening and, and taking a step back. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think it's important as well to say, that, you know, this is not something that's easy, <laughs> right? This yeah. is all really, really hard, but it's so worth it, like the self-awareness part especially. So, uh, And there's one last question. I'm just checking YouTube. Oh, many claps. Yay. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> if there's anything, did you, please ask questions. I can still see them, so keep them coming. Um, all right. So I have one more just before we wait to see if anyone yep. else asks. Um, what was your most recent focus been on in terms of self-leadership? Like, what was your reward for achieving it? Um, self leadership. Well, I guess uh, I can say, for example, it can just be a few little things um, that I reward myself with. So maybe I have, you know, I needed to do my slides for this talk, for example, but I really wanted to to go play Skyrim. Um, so that was actually something that happened recently. Um, I, oh, I, I wanted, <laughs> yeah, you know, I wanted to spend my my day off, my weekend, just you know, sit, sitting around playing Skyrim. But I was like, no, I need to get my slides done and have mm -hmm. that done before I can go do it. So it's you know, you can use little rewards like that, just kind of saying, you know, after this, I'll be able to relax, get it done first, then you can do yeah. that. If yeah. only it works with, worked with cats, hey? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. That's excellent. I don't have anything else. Is there anything you want to mention? Like, where, where, where can we see you next? What's your next gig? Yeah, I actually, uh, next week, I'm speaking at .NET Conf. Um, so that's oh. on, on Thursday next week. So that's the, the big Microsoft uh, .NET conference Fantastic. where they're releasing .NET 6. And yep. my talk is .NET Internet of Things. So talking about how you can oh. use .NET for IoT, which is really exciting. Very interesting. Very different talk than this one, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That's excellent. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. That's been a very insightful. I, I mean, I sat here actually watching it on, on the other computer the whole time. So that's very cool. Um, nice. So, um, yeah, I hope to uh, – we'll, you, I think you'll be on the stream for a little bit in case people have other questions. Yeah. Um, ask them there. But other than that, thank you very much. And I uh, shall invite my co-host, William, to the screen as well. Thank you very much for having me. All right, there he is. Hello, William. Welcome. Hello, hello. How's it going, Lars? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. We uh, we're doing the thing. Um, there was a lot of people. It's on happening. That. I know. Yeah, <laughs> it's 115 people at the moment, which is really good. Um, a lot. And I, I've got a little birdie told me there's another two, three hundred people on the uh, the closed track. So uh, there's still time if you want to uh, join on those. You can go to the website and. and Get a ticket, and you can also join yeah, Gather sure. Town. I yes, know, I know. I'm gonna. I'm looking forward to this Gather Town. I haven't tried that before. I created you get my little, little avatars. I yes. <laughs> so, so Gather Town. If you don't know, if Gather Town is like a, it's like an online um, event hall. I guess is that the best mm. way to say? It? So, like, you would normally mingle with people and walk around and talk to whoever. And go, hey, I like your T-shirt, or mm. whatever it might be. Right. You can sort of do yeah. that in Gather Town. I think we'll find out. Uh, but that's happening at lunchtime, which is when is lunchtime? Twelve thirty. I think. Uh, looking at my list, it sounds right. Yep. I should <laughs> know because sure. I've got a talk after that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, yeah, cool. Yep. So I um, just want to let everyone know that there is an agenda on the NDCSydney.com website. So you can see all the talks that's coming up today. Um, and, you know, there's the expo side as well. So if you go there, you can sign up uh, with any of the sponsors there to, to win uh, an awesome prize at the end of the day. And I think Lars is going to draw all the prizes. He's got the, the wheel of names and 
a, I don't know, you've got some magic way of picking a random winner? Well, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to that at the end of the day. It's uh, It won't take that long, but it'll be interesting. Um, yeah, just the first quiz, I'm just looking at schedule. The first quiz uh, or trivia thing that you can partake in as a, as on a stream on YouTube uh, is 11.15 city time. So whatever that mm. is your local time, but 11.15 a.m. city time. So in about an hour and 15 minutes, roughly. Um, now, we have a few minutes before we welcome the next speaker. Um, so I thought, what do we do some tech news? Um, is there something that, mm. what have you seen? Like Ignite was just on. Could we talk about that? What's the, what, what did you see there? Oh, Ignite, yes. Uh, one thing in particular for me, uh, I'm a big fan of using Cosmos DB. Um, now they have a, a way for partially updating your model. So you don't actually um, have to send an entire, you know, if you have a big model, let's say mm -hmm. arbitrary 30 fields. But you only need to change three of those. You can send a, a patch update to, you know, just those three fields needs to change in the model. You don't have to send the whole thing uh, back to Cosmos DB. So efficiencies, you know, latency, speed, all that, you know, everything gets affected. Uh -huh. it's, it's quite nice. Um, yeah, it's something I wish they had for a long time, but now they have it. <laughs> so really cool. You have to update a lot of stuff. Yeah, it's funny how you when you start using a product like say Cosmos DB for a long time and you get sort of into it. Like if you just start out, you go, "Oh, this is awesome!" You learn about all the features, and then you start using it, and little things mm. like that make a big difference, doesn't it? Because you start going, oh, "I wish that was a bit slow, a bit faster." Because it's sort of when I do, let's say, a hundred thousand things or whatever, it goes a bit mm -hmm. slow. And you get these little incremental updates. So yeah, if you don't know what we're on about, <laughs> um, if you're not into <laughs> Cosmos DB. These are the little things that we talk about that just make a product that little bit better and a little bit more usable. Mm. Um, Actually, one thing that goes along with that is the, um, they've also got MongoDB version 4 that can run on Cosmos DB as well, right? So you can you can bring your app, you know, if you know, typically you have to host it somewhere else or host it yourself. But now, yeah, you can run your Mongo in, in Azure uh, version 4 as well. So it's, it's up to date now. It's really cool. Um, that is really cool. And, um, mm -hmm. That's always been one of the the um, sort of not drawbacks, but one of the things about cloud platforms that implement another product. So obviously I'm into Azure, but if you do all the other clouds as well, um, something like Kubernetes, it's always been like one or two versions behind because they had to adapt it into the Azure ecosystem. So it's mm -hmm. good to see they're catching up. So I know with Kubernetes, they also just um, changed the uh, controller that, that does mm -hmm. all the Kubernetes to Azure stuff so that the Kubernetes version is independent of that. So little things oh, cool. like that yes. just makes it a little bit better, yeah. Um, I did notice yeah. one more thing um, about sort of mixing clouds. I don't fully understand it yet. I haven't read into it much, but I saw that um, AWS single sign-on is now supported somehow in Azure. I'll have to dig into that a little bit further, get you some uh, more news. But I saw yeah. that headline. I was like, that's interesting. That's cool. So we can have an AWS uh, sort of single sign-on identity provider in Azure. It's so cool, yeah, mixing the clouds together. You can pretty much use any single sign-on provider with Azure, as far as I'm aware, um, because you know I'm sure Microsoft is aware that Azure AD is not what everybody wants to use. Um, hmm. You know, ACG where I work, we use Auth zero with AWS, right? It's it's you're always going to have to be able to connect those two. So that makes sense hmm. to me using AWS yeah. single sign-on with Azure. Um, yeah, that makes sense. Now Melissa was talking about .NET Conf. That's next mm -hmm. week. Mm -hmm. Um, now we are at one conference here and obviously we want, you, you don't want to take focus away from that, but .NET Conf is pretty cool. And the main reason I like it is, um, we have .NET 6 coming out, right? It's a pretty big oh, yeah. deal. What is your favorite feature so far and what are you looking forward to about .NET 6? Personally, I'm very biased, but yeah, I love Blazor. Uh, the hot reload stuff, you know, I've already using it in RC2. Yeah. Uh, it, it just works. It's a, it's a game changer, really, for us. You know, there was a little bit of uh, chatter about. You know, it got removed briefly, and then we brought it back, which is great. A good community win. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, a lot of uh, happy thoughts uh, regarding that. That Microsoft listened to the community and said, "Hey, cool. Yeah, you really want it. We'll bring it back." Um, and uh, it works really well. So the, all the Blazor updates with .NET six, the efficiencies, minimal APIs. You know, I don't want to sell all of it, but. <laughs> Uh, I'm already playing with everything for .NET 6, so that, that final release is going to be exciting. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I've, I've looked yeah. at I haven't used it that much, I must admit. Um, it hasn't been quite in what I've been doing. I've been doing a lot more mm -hmm. uh, AI stuff, which I'll get to in my talk mm -hmm. later today, I'm in the last slot. 
um last slot no last slot um uh-huh. and, <laughs> um so yeah so <laughs> but done at six uh it just it fills me with joy um just all the little oh, yeah. i see from it so i'm definitely gonna join some yes. of those talks and there's how many days of the conference is like two or three days i can't remember the schedule but it's quite a lot of content as well a lot of cool yes. speakers as well so yep uh i think you know we also have to really mention now is uh, uh ndc sydney uh definitely wouldn't be possible uh without our sponsors and we've got a, quite a lot of sponsors it's, it's amazing everyone's chipping in still it is it's great so uh they all have uh, some video clips that will be popping in in a second somewhere so uh yeah if producers you could play uh, the sponsor ads uh, work from our sponsors I love running this company. I love running it because uh, of the people I deal with. There's such a great team of people. From a career perspective, it's the best move I ever did. Being a great consultant, which we are, this is W, is half-half between technical skills and communication. It's given me the opportunity to work with lots of different types of technology and explore some stuff that I maybe only dabbled in at university or before. SSW is a company that makes enterprise software solutions uh, and that's what we do. We build software for clients uh, on demand. We build bespoke solutions using the latest technology and the latest best practices. I've been involved in the development of some mining software, been involved in the development of software for a legal firm and everything in between there. Even in just under two years, I've been working across so many different projects It's just a really great place to come into and I always look forward to coming to work. Are you an engineer looking to impact millions of Australians? We're looking for big thinkers, problem solvers and challenge seekers to help us engineer the future of banking. ComBank Engineering. Do you have what it takes? Search engineering at ComBank. When you're talking sovereign ICT capability, It's more than a safe pair of hands. It's people with very specialised capabilities. It's why we created Telstra Purple. But talking is one thing. Being able to walk the walk is another. We've supported all levels of government across Australia with customised technology solutions. We help government agencies cope with a huge increase in demand for support in times of need, all while shifting to remote working themselves. And our long-term collaboration with Ambulance Victoria resulted in a digital platform that came to the rescue in a national emergency. A perfect example of how adaptable, purpose-driven technology can be. We believe purposeful technology, inspired and delivered by people, can make the difference. We believe we're uniquely poised to help write Australia's next chapter with you. Hello. Uh, so yeah, thanks to our sponsors. Now um, we have a few minutes before uh, our next speaker, Aaron, comes online. Um, and just one of those sort of tech news that we discussed before. If you have any special news of your own, so let's just drop it in the comments below, and uh, you know we'll, we can use those during the next uh, little ad break. Um, now I think Lyles was actually supposed to come back as well. There he I'm is. Here. Hello. <laughs> Chasing the llamas oh. on the farm? No, not yet. That may happen later. Um, yeah. No, no, speaking of tech news, I have I have a good one. I have a good one that I was really excited about. Um, <laughs> I'm just taking over here. Um, VS Code Online, like VS Code.dev. Um, so this is, if you're familiar with Visual Studio Code, and then it's just become like almost a de facto development environment for so many things like Python and JavaScript and C Sharp and um, things many other things i can't remember right now but it's as a fully online version now it is brilliant it is like almost fully features you can do extensions and all sorts on it um it can even run locally so um it can use your files that you have on your local machine so you load in the browser mm. but it runs locally it's it's magnificent i'm sure there's still many more features to come knowing vs code um but just check it out vs code.dev um it's very cool so if you like if you're on a public computer you can't install VS Code, you can just use it there. And if you can't use the local file system, you can use a cloud file system as well. Um, or you can use it on your iPad, of all things. Right? It's Yeah, I know, <laughs> it's really cool. Not sure I want to develop it. I should actually try it on my phone. 
you have you you've know, got a big enough like, phone <laughs> it's like remote desktop on your phone don't do it it'll just lead you know to uh to straight jackets and rocking in the corner immediately um don't do that um, even on github though like if you if you go to any of your github repositories uh i think the shortcut was like your windows key and full stop and it actually opens up that repo directly in a web version of vs code right so that was that's kind of nice so you can browse through the code, navigate with all the shortcuts that you're used to. Yep. And uh, yeah, quite nice. So a lot yep. of cool things, a lot of dev tools and productivity things that uh, just you can go and code anywhere. You can go I sit know. there on an island somewhere even and just work away. Yep. Enjoy. On a, or on a farm in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're a fair way out of town, aren't you? You're I, I'm sort of, I'm not town. quite halfway between Melbourne and Sydney, but it's not far off. Um, so yeah, I am. I am in the middle of, every, of of everywhere now. Later on today, we'll just see if we can make it happen. I might just show you around here and see what's outside, but uh, we just uh, got to make sure that works. Um, now, I was just going to mention because we can talk about something not developer, I think, but still techie. Um, I mm -hmm. got this Starlink connection, and this is oh, yeah. for rural people. If there are people here watching it from somewhere that doesn't have a fiber connection, one gigabit or whatever it is. I was on a, uh, a traditional satellite connection, which is a geostationary satellite. So the satellite itself is like 45,000 kilometers away up in space. Uh, that means it takes a really long time for data to go there and come back, about 600 milliseconds, in fact. Um, mm. And I had that for about six years. And now the good Mr. Musk has deemed me worthy to upgrade to Starlink, which is what I'm on now, which means that I can stream video like this in almost good quality i think um it sort of looks yeah, all right looking, looking, good. YouTube, looking pretty good um and it's it's still via satellite and i'm just i'm blown away i did not expect it to be this good i must admit um so what's the lag what like what's the lag it's about 40 milliseconds um sometimes oh, wow. down to like 25 it's it's as good as adsl or even some um you know um uh, nbn connections in australia and, mm. and that makes all the difference. I can hear you in real time. I can, we, can, we can't play music together because that's still off. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> I don't talk over you unless it's on purpose. Um, okay, just, cool. Yeah, I'm blown away. <laughs> now, I actually, I saw, I saw uh, one of your clips recently where, you know, with the Starlink, you, you got a new uh, router in the house or a new access point to sort of boost the signal. Yep. Uh, did that work? Because I don't think you quite uh, finished that uh, install when I watched it. The Wi-Fi six access point is that what you mean? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have I I never knew. Like I, I do YouTube videos and I do them because I don't know how to do a thing and I just record me learning a thing. Um, mm -hmm. And I never knew there was something called Wi-Fi six. It, it just wasn't a thing. It was just Wi-Fi, right? I knew that. Was, was there a Wi-Fi two and three and what happened to the rest well, of them? Well, there is Wi-Fi four and five. I think Wi-Fi four is two point four gigahertz. Wi-Fi five is five gigahertz. I think, like eight hundred two dot eleven AC and eight hundred. So now oh, Wi-Fi yeah. six is eight hundred two dot eleven AX. That's the like the protocol official name, whatever. And yeah, yep, so I installed yep. a Wi-Fi six, and I couldn't for the life of me figure out how to speed test this damn thing. Um, mm. And I still don't know exactly i've got a ton of, of, of suggestions but yeah it's tricky um because i have a modern phone like a pixel phone and mm -hmm. that doesn't have wi-fi 6 so i can't actually use a speed testing on that and then how do you test your local network rather than your internet connection um how do you know that you're connected to the, to the you know the best thing and turned out i hadn't configured the access point properly either so yeah i'm learning there's a part two video oh, cool. coming because holy moly <laughs> um but yeah wi-fi i'll 6. wait for you to figure it out I need, I basically need to do put the same it this thing. way with Wi-Fi 5, you can get up to 400 megabits. So if you're on a fiber connection with one gigabit, as an example, you can't use all mm -hmm. of that on your phone when you're at home. With Wi-Fi 6, mm -hmm. depending on the antennas, you almost can or you just can't. Like, so it's important in that sense for future-proving your networks. Um, so now mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. one Wi-Fi 6 access point that I can use. The rest are still five. Um, but it's a start. So. Ah, cool. Yeah. Um, no, that's good news. Uh, I might have to yeah, just keep an eye on that because uh, same here. I'm just right on the edge of town. Uh, yeah. There is NBN around me, but I'm literally one street away from so where the case. NBN sort of ends. <laughs> so I'm like, no. Oh, oh, I've still got some uh, pretty prehistoric uh, internet going here. But um, no, that's that's cool news, Lars. Uh, interesting to, to see what you're going to come up with and how well it pays off. I think it's time to bring in Aaron. He's our, our next speaker. See you, Lars. Hey, Aaron. 
Bye, Lars. Bye, Lars. We say bye, Lars. And, and this is where we go. Wait, am I on mute? Am I on mute? Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, you're here. Uh, you're here. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I'm, I was pretty sure I didn't have myself muted this time. So, yes, fingers crossed yeah, we've got to uh, that we have check all the buttons. everything all good. Yes, uh, I've got to hit all the buttons on the stream deck and make sure everything's working. <laughs> Now, cool. So you're talking to us today about type safe GraphQL with TypeScript. Uh, That's right. And I'm reading the uh, the abstract here, and it sounds really cool. So there's code generation. Uh, you're going to looking at um, uh, how to do have efficient storage and a whole bunch of cool stuff. You're looking at the the schema combining schemas. Oh wow, um, sounds interesting. Yes, yes, hopefully. I mean, we've only got an hour, uh, which seems like a long time, but we know how quickly an hour can go past when uh, when mm. we're presenting, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, no, it does fly. Uh, so uh, look, good luck. And uh, I'm keen to listen to all of what you have to say today. So uh, the show is all yours. Excellent. Well, thank you, uh, everyone who is joining in on the stream and, uh, and, and watching from wherever you are around the world. Um, Hopefully you are watching the right session. This is uh, TypeScript and GraphQL. We're going to be looking at uh, how to use those together and how we can build type safe applications. For those of you that I haven't had a chance to meet before or uh, haven't uh, been, uh, we haven't seen each other at an in-person event, uh, which uh, I, I miss them. I really miss in-person events. We'll get back there soon. Uh, my name's Aaron Powell and I work for Microsoft, uh, part of the cloud advocacy team. I've been doing web development for I'm gonna say like 17 years now. I don't know, it's it's to that point where I'm just like, I, do I need to keep counting? I don't really wanna keep counting because it's it's getting long and I'm, I am I feel old when I say things like that, particularly to uh, to, to people that I'm, I'm coaching, mentoring that are just coming into the industry. But in that time, I've been able to work with a lot of different aspects of web development. I've built applications that were like truly server centric where we were doing things like everything was on the server. You would always send the whole page back, kind of web forms and predating ASP.NET web forms to API centered applications where we were building custom APIs to um, uh, expose data out to uh, the consuming clients, to REST designed applications. And more recently, I've been looking at GraphQL and the role that it can play in the way that we be, uh, build applications. Um, if you want to reach out to me after this session, if there's uh, a, a question I don't get to answering in the time or anything like that, uh, you can find me on social media. You can find me on my email address um, there. Uh, I'll also be, uh, I'm going to try and get into to Gather Town at lunchtime. Um, I'm actually going uh, on a long weekend away because we're finally allowed to leave our houses here in Sydney. Um, so I will, I will try and jump in for a little bit uh, in between packing the car uh, to head out this afternoon. But uh, do reach out because I want to make sure that anything that you want to know, I can help you get answered. But that's enough about me and all that kind of stuff. You're here to learn about application design and particularly about GraphQL. But before we get into building an application and things like that, I want to make sure that we're all on the same page of what we're trying to do. So we're going to build a game today. Um, this is a game that I built uh, back when we first started doing the lockdowns and the only way that we were interacting with our friends was via a video call where we were playing like trivia and stuff like that. So I was like, well, how do we build a trivia game? So let's start with the data model for that because this is the, the, the fundamental constructs that we're going to work with is the, the underlying data set. So we're going to have a, a quiz or a game object that um, is represented with a couple of fields on that. So we've got an ID so we can uniquely identify games. We'll have players. A game will have a state like are we waiting for players to join? Is the game in progress or has the game completed? Uh, we're going to have questions that are associated with the game and we're going to have answers that players are providing to their to those questions. So then we end up with a relationship to a player's um, object and that might have like uh, the name of the player. Maybe we have some more information that we um, saw about the player, maybe not. Um, but then on that, we could uh, we, we also have kind of a, a two way relationship between those data models. We can go from players back to the, the games and we can go from the games through to the players. And then of course, we're gonna have questions. So these are our three primary data models um, and it's gonna have the, the name, like the, the question that's being asked, the all the answers that are available for that because this is multiple choice and then the correct answer that a player um, could uh, that needs to provide to get a passing point for that game. Now, this is a, like, it's a fairly basic data model but we've got some relationships here and uh, as a result, it could be, uh, there's a number of ways that we can represent this out in the way that we consume it. So let's start by talking about REST. 
Uh, I know this is a GraphQL talk, but I want to contextualize things about REST because that's what we've done a lot of API development over the last you know, n number of years. And uh, this is the way that I would model this in a very strict REST sense. So we have our, um, our primary routes that represent the data models. And then from those, we would either get back like all the quizzes or a quiz by its ID, um, all the players or a player by their ID, all the questions or a specific question. Um, and let's just think about the scenario where you're trying to display the, um, like the, the, the completed game screen. So for that, we're gonna to need to know the, well, the game ID, we're going to need to know what questions uh, were asked in that, we're going to need to know the answers, and we're going to need to know the players, and we're going to need to know the um, players and their answers. And in a very strict REST design, we'll end up with a lot of links that we end up having to follow. So we get back that uh, first game from our quiz endpoint, and then that's going to have back uh, a bunch of links through to the players and the questions. So then we're going to fetch to the players, and we're going to fetch to the questions, but we're also getting back data that we may not need. Like, we don't need all the answers necessarily on the, the completed screen. We just need the correct answer so that we know if the player provided the correct answer when they um, uh, when they submitted their, their response uh, the, through the question. And this is where REST can have some challenges in the way that a client will want to communicate with it. And then this is where GraphQL comes at a different approach to the way we can do client-server communication in uh, data modeling. So first off, GraphQL isn't a server, it isn't a client. GraphQL is a query language. Uh, we have GraphQL servers that implement a consumer of the query language and can process that query language, break it down, and then provide that through to your database and provide queries against your database. Um, you can have clients that will construct GraphQL queries that can be sent to servers to process and things like that. But at the end of the day, GraphQL is a query language. It was originally developed by Facebook. Um, it was built by Facebook to solve problems that Facebook has. So something to bear in mind is that GraphQL is not going to be right for every single project that you build because it was designed for a very niche set of problems that Facebook has. Um, it's evolved since then, or do I need to call it meta now? No, I think we'll still call it Facebook. Uh, it's, it's very much evolved from what the original uh, problem that Facebook was trying to solve. So it's a bit more uh, general purpose, but it's like I said, it's not gonna be for everything. Uh, it, uh, Facebook has since open sourced it. They've handed it over to the GraphQL Foundation and they manage the evolution of the GraphQL language. So then, what makes GraphQL really different to doing a REST API design is that you end up with a, a full view of the data schema that's available for your um, uh, from your backend system from, from your from your servers, and that for, by having this full schema view, you can then work out what you need at what point in time as a querying client. So this means that let's say back to that scenario of where I want to show the um, the, the the completed game screen, well. For that, I'm going to say I want the, the, here's the game ID, and then I want players, and I want maybe the player name because I don't need any other information about players. I need the game answers, and I need to know whether, uh, what the answer that the player provided. I need to know the questions, the question that was, uh, like the, the description of the question, and then the correct answer. And I can do that in one single request. But I can also drop off the fields that I don't need. So this avoids an overfetching scenario where we're getting more data than we actually need at the client which can be optimized then for maybe um, lower uh, bandwidth available clients like Lars when he's stuck out in uh, rural Australia or mobile devices that don't have maybe the processing power to deal with exceptionally large data models. Now, there are other things that are useful about GraphQL that you can't do with REST, such as a, um, a subscriptions model, which allows you to do real-time communication via WebSockets. So in that case, um, a, a use case in context of this game would be you're waiting for players to join and then you have a, a screen and instead of having to do long polling saying, is everyone joined? Is everyone joined? Is everyone joined? You open WebSocket connections via subscriptions to your um, GraphQL server. And as someone, uh, as a player joins, we drop a notification, send that back over the, um, the WebSocket so that all connected clients receive that information. So that's GraphQL in a nutshell. How does it look? Well, this is what a GraphQL um, query looks like. Um, so, this, or, so this is a subset of a GraphQL schema. Uh, what I've got is uh, I've hidden away a bunch of the type models and things like that. Um, and in, this is just the entry point, the way that you would query against the data structures that you've got with inside of your schema. So we get back a game by its ID, we can get back all the games and we can get back the results for a particular player. Now, if you look at this and it's 
kind of like JavaScript. Like it's that you can see there's a JavaScript heritage in the way that this is designed, but it's not exactly JavaScript. I mean, there, there's types that I mean, types don't exist to this degree in JavaScript, um, and the things like using the Bane operator, like it, it, there's no semicolons either. Um, I'm a very much a semicolon uh, supporter in JavaScript, um, but that's kind of, you can see where that data model and that, that object model is kind of related back. So then when we perform a query against this, so uh, we create a query, so this is the kind of thing that a client would be creating. We're saying that we're gonna perform a query against a particular um, available query option within inside of our schema. We're gonna pass that through, and then we're going to pick out the fields that we want back as a result. We'll see a bit more of this as we get into the demos and start building our application. Now, realistically, you're going to need you know, four core components to building an, uh, an application with, uh, well, basically any application. Um, you're going to need some way to store the data. You're going to need some sort of infrastructure to run it on. And then you're going to have a client and a server that communicate together. We're really going to focus on the top two pieces of this, the client and the server. Um, uh, for this talk, obviously, I'm going to be using certain infrastructure and I'm going to be using certain data stores. but the, the stuff that I'm covering I, are not necessarily impactful for the way that you could build this uh, application. Um, so I want you to really focus more around the way the client and the server interact together. So let's just talk a bit about those components. So for the server, um, I'm going to be building it on Azure Functions. So I like using the serverless um, programmatic model. Um, I, I find that quite uh, quite nice, particularly from a price point uh, for the sorts of uh, applications that I'm building at the moment. Um, and we're going to be using Apollo as the GraphQL server implementation. So Apollo is an open source project. Uh, they have a server implementation for GraphQL that runs on top of Azure Functions. It also runs across pretty much any common JavaScript uh, web application framework. If you're using Express or Koa, like you, you can use it on side of there. there. It supports, uh, I think, most of the other clouds and their serverless programmatic models and things like that. So again, the infrastructure here is not important, but um, I, I have to have some sort of infrastructure underpinning this. Uh, from a client standpoint, I'm going to be building it in uh, React because, well, it's a Facebook um, heritage language. So um, I, I, use, I also prefer React. That's my kind of go-to web framework. But the stuff, again, that I'll show you from a client standpoint is applicable whether you're doing Vue or Svelte or Angular or like vanilla JavaScript without a web framework. Like, do, is that doable? Do people still do that? Anyway, um, that's going to be my choice. Uh, <laughs> um, and again, you can swap all these components out. Um, it's not going to be hopefully impactful. But what is the problem that we're ultimately trying to solve? Well, GraphQL is a type-based schema that is exposing our servers, uh, our, our server's data out to our consuming clients. So it's got a type system within it. Uh, we define types, we can define enums, we can define interfaces, we can, have, we can define custom scalar, uh, scalar values and things like that. But then I'm going to be building this as a TypeScript application, and TypeScript has its own type system. So we're going to be talking to a database. We're going to have data models that represents the way the data is stored in our database. Um, we have uh, we then need to kind of uh, communicate with our, our pseudo ORM that we've got in there, and then we need to expose that back out as a as a JavaScript application. But We've got two independent type systems now with inside of our application. We have the type system that's represented with inside of our GraphQL schema, and we have the type system that's represented with inside of our TypeScript application. Um, they're not necessarily compatible because we don't want our underlying data structures exposed in their kind of rawness to our connected clients. But we kind of want something that helps us along the way. Like I, I don't want to add a field to my GraphQL schema and then have it explode in the data access because we didn't know that field existed or you know, kind of move things around. What does it actually look like at code? Well, on the left here, we have a, um, a subset of the GraphQL schema and the one that we're actually going to build through our demos today. Um, and you can see that kind of looks, it looks TypeScript type definition E. Like it's not exactly the same, but you can see the, the analogies there. Uh, we can we see there's enums, we have types, they, um, those types have fields and types against them and all that sort of stuff. And then on the right, we have um, our resolvers, the things that are going to handle the requests that have come into the server that are then going to work with our underlying data store. They're, they're going to probably want to know about the type system that's there so that things don't explode. So how do we go about generating these types? Well, there's two ways that we can do strongly typed GraphQL applications um, with TypeScript. The first is to go down a schema first model. 
So in this, we have the types with inside of our schema and they kind of look like our Java's or our TypeScript primitives. So I like this because it gives me a clean separation between the types that are making that I'm making available to consumers and the types that are actually downstream with inside of my backend um, aspects of the application. And I don't necessarily bleed out the internal implementations. So I'm going to be using a tool called GraphQL Code Generator that will take the schema and generate some TypeScript types, and then we can use those to do uh, to have some type safety between the way our resolvers work and the data that we need to expose out. So we're actually going to go schema first in the demo that we'll, um, that we'll get to in you know, just a few minutes. The other option is you could go code first. Uh, so code first is where we use our TypeScript objects that we're creating, and we annotate them in a way that we can extract the type definitions to create our GraphQL schema. So code, that's why it's code first. We, we start with the TypeScript objects and we turn them into a GraphQL schema. Now this gives you a clear relationship between the types that we've got with inside of our application and the way that we want those exposed out to our client. Now, uh, if you want to go down this route, um, check out typegraphql.com, um, and that has an ex uh, that is a project that will help you do that. Uh, my, like I said, we're going to be going co um, uh, schema first in the application we're building because that's uh, that's my preference and I, uh, that's the, the model that I prefer to tackle. But that's enough slides, at least for the time being. It is, let's jump over to VS Code and have a bit of a look around at building an application. So here we are in my VS Code instance, and um, I'll share the links out to the Git repo that we're going to be working with. Um, it's uh, it's publicly available up on my GitHub at um, uh, github.com slash aaronpower slash graphql typesheet workshop. Uh, like I said, the, the link is at the end. And this is a workshop we'll go through uh, building from uh, kind of zero to hero in building a GraphQL application. So we're going to start from the start. Um, I've pre-scaffolded it with some useful things that you're going to want with inside of your um, application. Uh, it does have the starting for the React app, but we're not going to get to that until quite late in the piece. Um, we have our API, which is where the uh, Azure Functions is running. Um, and it's got, uh, this also has a, a um, dev container, so it's running inside of a Dockerized uh, sandbox uh, if you're using VS Code remote containers, or if you're using uh, code spaces on um, GitHub, uh, you can uh, use it with inside of that. But the first thing we need to do is we're going to need to install uh, some N uh, npm packages. So I'm coming to the API folder and we'll do npm install and we'll do, uh, we're going to need the oops, Apollo server Azure and that's not how you spell server. Funnily, I actually did that when I was um, doing my dry runs. I kept typing uh, Apollo server. I'm not sure what that's telling me about my brain. Uh, Azure functions functions and we're going to function that's not how you spell functions and then we're going to need GraphQL and I'm just going to pin this at the version 15 of GraphQL uh, because version 16 of the GraphQL library has actually come out uh, and it has some incompatible types with uh, the Apollo server implementations they haven't upgraded to uh, GraphQL um, GraphQL 16 as an NPM package okay so those are installed and I'm going to use Azure functions to uh, generate a new uh, let's see, I'm, I might have it back here. No, I don't. Uh, we're going to use Azure Functions to generate a new template. Uh, template, and we will use uh, HTTP trigger, and we'll call that uh, the name of GraphQL. So we'll generate a GraphQL Azure function that we'll now find with inside of our Explorer. Excellent. There we go. Uh, so. Obviously, this doesn't have anything graphql -y in it yet. We will get to that in a moment. Um, but one thing that we do have to change for Azure Functions is the output binding for HTTP trigger. It needs to become a, uh, it needs to be dollars return. Uh, that's just for Apollo because it doesn't know what you've named the output binding that you've got with inside of your uh, function.json file. So you just have to, so it will return from um, the function handler. So you just need to tell uh, Azure Functions to look at the return value, not wait for it to be um, set onto a specific uh, binding. Okay, and to speed things up, I am going to copy and paste some code that I wrote in the readme. So this is a, like a super basic GraphQL server uh, that we will do npm start. We'll get that running uh, while I explain what this code is doing. So uh, in this super basic server, we are importing the Azure Functions um, package. We are importing uh, GQL, which is a template literal to uh, define a GraphQL schema. It has a single type. Cool. Our server is up and running. Uh, called query. It has a um, 
uh, an operation that we can perform on that query called hello, and that's just going to return us a string. And we have a resolver down here that is then the thing that is going to handle that request. So it matches the schema um, structure. So we have query, hello, and then it's returning a string. We provide that to Azure server, uh, uh, sorry, Apollo server, the type definition, so our GraphQL schema, our resolvers, and then we create a handler that Azure Functions can consume. So that's up and running. Let's pop this into the browser. There we go. And we'll come across to Apollo Studio. Zoom in a few steps. Uh, let's resize our windows a little bit and delete the uh, sample that I played with. So Apollo um, Studio is uh, a, um, this is a sandbox application that allows you to inspect GraphQL queries, um, inspect GraphQL servers, um, interact with them, test them out, that kind of stuff. Uh, we can see that we have a root type of query. So that's the, the entry point on our schema. Uh, it has a field called hello, which I can add to a query, hit run and Ta-da! We have created our very first GraphQL server um, in uh, fully in TypeScript, but at the moment it's pretty simplistic. Like we're not really caring anything about type safety or any that sort of stuff. We I just wanted to you know, prove that we can make a GraphQL server work, um, and we've done that. Time to go home. Wait, I'm already at home. You're going to be stuck with a lot of terrible jokes as well because I don't get audience feedback, so I don't know if uh, if you're laughing or just cry laughing with me. So uh, let's jump forward in time uh, to the next point with inside of our workshop, um, just so I don't run off script and break anything. Um, as I said, this uh, this does go through, uh, there's like eight steps. We are going to st skip some of the steps because it's about a half day workshop and I only have uh, 39 minutes left according to my countdown timer. Uh, maybe less, depending if they kick me off early. So uh, we're still here. We've still got our uh, schema uh, written the same way, but let's start extracting that out into a separate file because at the moment this schema is embedded with inside of this um, .ts file, which means it's it's inherently undiscoverable. Like we don't know where that schema exists. So I'm going to create a new file, and we'll call this graph uh, schema .graphql, and we will grab the type definition here, done that, cool, it's all formatted, lovely, and now we can get rid of this, but how are we going to get those type definitions? We need to import them some way and, and kind of parse that schema and turn it into something that can be consumed by Apollo. Uh, I'm going to, again, install some NPM packages, so to do that I will sneakily copy and paste from my readme file and we will put them into the API folder. Uh, so that will go ahead. Um, also, if you do actually go through this workshop yourself um, and you install the VS Code plugins that I, uh, I recommend or you run in the um, uh, dev container, um, I have these uh, this code tour, which is what these little icons here are on the side, um, which, will, uh, which you can step through and it will give you hints along the way of um, what to do at specific lines of the code base and stuff like that. So um, that's a, it's another way so you don't have to kind of alt tab back and forth between this schema, uh, sorry, this uh, readme file. Uh, and again, for speedness sake, I will copy and paste our updated server implementation. Let's get rid of the terminal, there we go. Okay, so what have we done? We've imp imported three new modules from a, uh, a collection of package called GraphQL Tools. We're importing one that will load our schema. Uh, we're doing this synchronously because of the way Azure Functions work. Uh, we we can't actually have to, like, we have to read that before we uh, return things. Um, uh, sorry, return the handler. So it's, it's a little bit clunky. It just means that, yeah, you're doing synchronous um, schema creation. Um, we're then uh, saying that we're going to be loading from a file and disk. This is because you um, you can be importing a GraphQL schema from a number of different locations. If we were building a maybe a GraphQL server that is then sitting as a it's like sitting in front of a number of other GraphQL servers, we could be loading from a HTTP endpoint. Um, so this is what we call GraphQL federation, where you're bringing through a bunch of GraphQL servers um, and then exposing them as one unified GraphQL schema. Uh, but we're going to be loading from a file on disk, so we're using the GraphQL file loaner. And then finally, we're using the schema tools to add the resolvers to the schema. So um, we still have our resolvers object here. We are going to load the schema and just a bit of path uh, messing around to go back and find that because 
we're dealing with a compiled TypeScript output. Uh, we're going to load it from there. We're going to add the resolvers to it, provide it to Apollo server, and then everything should go nicely and we should be able to do npm start again and our application should continue to run or be rerun given that uh, it wasn't currently running. All right, give that a minute. Excellent, looks like our API is back up. Come over here, we'll execute the query. And there we go. So everything's still working. We've, we've, we've done the first step. We've extracted things out into a separate location. So fantastic. We're, we're starting to get going. All right. So the next thing we need to do is start building out a, like a more realistic schema. And the schema that we've got here is it's pretty simplistic. So let's start building out the schema that's going to look, uh, that we're going to need to represent our, uh, our game. Again, I'm going to cheat and bring in some of this stuff from my, uh, pre-written script. So we're going to start with, so we find um, our question. So uh, we have the ID and we're using a special scalar value, a scalar type with inside of um, the GraphQL language, which is ID, um, just indicating that it's a unique identifier. And the uh, exclamation point indicates that this is going to be a strongly typed, uh, sorry, a, a non-nullable um, field. So we know that we have to have a question. We have to have a correct answer. And then with the array here, I'm saying that you'll um, that you will always get a array, an array of zero or more items, and those items are going to be strings. And it will always be a string. It will never be a null or an undefined or anything like that. Okay. Uh, oh, where did my readme go? I forgot to uh, open that in a pinned banner. There we go. So we have our question. Let's create our game. Add our game in, we'll add our enum that represents game state. And what else do we need? We're going to need our player. Uh, select that. Okay. And lastly, we'll have our player result. Let's pop that in. Save. Uh, we will just have to restart the server because it, while it's got a file system watcher, it's not watching for changes to the .graphql file. Um, and let's have a look at now what our uh, our schema is exposed as to um, or connected clients, such as the studio here. Oops. Okay. So we've had an error. Um, well, that's not what we want. We don't want things to explode immediately. We want to explode when I expect them to explode. No. So the reason it exploded is that um, the resolvers that we've got here, and this is where we're starting to lose some of this type information. Um, the resolvers need to match kind of one to one, or um, the resolvers can't have things with inside of them that aren't with inside of your schema, and that's what this error message has said. We've defined a resolver to handle something called query, but our schema doesn't have anything that has query. Now we didn't know that, or well, we didn't necessarily know that because well, there's no type information to help us along the way. I know that if I delete that, um, Apollo will, uh, if something doesn't exist in the schema, it won't um, kind of freak out. It will just, uh, well, it shouldn't have freaked out. Ah, uh, I don't have, uh, I don't have a root type. Um, uh, well, I'll put in the thing. I, I was trying to be clever and like jump forward with inside of uh, time. But we will put in, here we go. So we'll put in the query uh, and then that should, uh, oh no. We'll, and we'll pop in the schema. And that's the last piece that we need. Um, okay, and then we'll restart our server. Isn't live coding fun? <laughs> um, okay, so the reason it exploded was because um, it didn't know where the root was going to be for anyone that wants to come and uh, query your GraphQL server. Uh, because we hadn't defined any of that inside of our uh, schema. Uh, now that that's done, now we've defined um, a uh, a schema object that indicates that the that when you're performing a query, you're going to start like the root query is going to be at this type called query, not game or anything else. Uh, but the problem is that well, so our resolvers aren't uh, aren't there, and we don't need them there yet. Uh, and if we reload that, well, now we'll see that things start looking a bit better. Uh, we'll see that we have our query root here, we could query for a game with a, um, a specific item. So I could perform that operation if I wanted. Um, I could perform like a request for all games. Uh, whoops, uh, not game state. I wanted to get back. Uh, let's get back to the ID of all games and we don't need 
that variable there. So now I can perform that query and it's going to explode because we haven't written anything that will handle that. Um, you can see in the error message there, it says cannot return null from a non-nullable field uh, query.games. And that's because our type system with inside of our schema has forbidden us to return a null. Um, and because we haven't implemented anything, we're implicitly returning null. So we're getting some, like we're getting some type information and we're getting that back from our server. We're getting it from the way we're performing queries, but we've lost any of that with inside of our actual application. So again, we're going to jump forward a little bit in time where we'll uh, start writing out some of the resolvers. I'm going to skip over the data storage section uh, itself. Um, and instead we'll see the way that I've implemented data storage um, in the application, but let's just close off all the windows that I had open. I don't want to give anyone a sneak peek at what we've uh, got coming. So uh, for data access, uh, this workshop has an in-memory data store. So it literally is just an array of objects that is maintained in memory. And every time you restart the server, you'll lose all your game information. Um, or you can store it in a persistent way using Cosmos DB. Pick your poison. Uh, and I do have the uh, instruction in the workshop, will, which goes through both ways of setting up data uh, access. But for data access, we'll, I've defined a number of different types that we have here. So we have um, a, a base kind of, uh, like a, a base type. It's not, it's not a class, it's just a base type um, called model because everything is going to have an ID uh, and, a, uh, and a model type associated with it. Uh, the model type is just whether it's a question, an answer, a user answer, or a game. Useful for um, storing in Cosmos DB so that we can perform uh, queries against that and uh, we can set up the data in there with the appropriate partition keys. We have our question model, which extends model with question, category, incorrect answers, correct answers, type and difficulty. Um, so the data set that I'm using here comes from Open Trivia API, and this is the way that they return their data structure. So I've just kind of mapped that through. This is what I want to store in my database. Um, user model, we have our name, um, the identity provider, user roles, user details. So that this could be um, plugged into Azure Static Web Apps and use the um, authentication model there that gives us some, uh, some information. Um, we have our user answer, we have our game, and then we have our, uh, our three data sources, game, user, and question that we can access. Uh, as I said, there's an in-memory implementation and a uh, Cosmos DB implementation. Uh, we're gonna use the in-memory one uh, for the time being, and we can see that I create that here. It's an Apollo data context, uh, sorry, it's a, a data source, um, and I've strongly typed an Apollo context, which just is a way that we represent data sources. Um, and we'll see a bit more of that as we get to implementing type safety. Uh, but we have things like user question and game. So uh, that's all being given over to Apollo. So when it starts, it will understand that we can access data, but now we need to do something with that. So inside of our resolvers, let's go and build that out. Um, and I'll pop the schema here on the side. Uh, if I can remember the keyboard shortcut, which I can't, which is annoying. I've, I've recently changed my keyboard and my muscle memory in uh, VS Code has drastically decreased because I was just so used to where keys were on my keyboard and now keys aren't where they used to be on my keyboard. Yeah, I've gone like crazy split keyboard layout, but let's just move on from me complaining about my tools. Okay, uh, so we need to implement a something, never mind. Uh, so I need to implement this uh, this query type here. So we're going to have game, games, and player results. So let's start with games, because games is the easiest one to, to do. Now, I know that we're going to need, uh, so because I've worked with Apollo before, I know that the first argument to this is going to be the parent um, in the object hierarchy that's being returned from our server. I know that the second argument is going to be uh, any arguments passed through to the query. Or any variables. And the third argument is our Apollo context, which is where we can get data sources. Uh, data, data source, data source. Ooh, I, I can't remember whether it's data source or data sources. And I don't have any type information. Like I'm I'm losing the value of TypeScript here. Data sources, that's what it is. Data sources. Okay. And then we will return data sources dot ga game, games, I think it's games, get game. Okay. So that's how we perform games. Um, and let's just grab a bit of sample data that I've got. Oops, ah, where, where was that? There it is. Um, so this is just a sample game that we can use for testing. We'll embed that into our thing here, save, 
and we'll bring in missing type. Cool. Okay. Uh, and we'll go to API and npm start. Okay. So that let's hope that this comes up and running. Oops. Give it a moment. All right. Looks like it's looks like it's working. The server is up. Uh, so now we do have a game there. I should be able to query this and get games of, un oh, it must be called games. It must be called, so now we're starting to see where we're getting the problems of lack of type safety. Now TypeScript is great because it gives us that type safety. Um, GraphQL is great because it gives us that type safety, but I don't like this data source isn't any because it doesn't understand anything about this. It knows it's obviously not, it's actually called game, not games. So I didn't know that because I didn't have any um, type support. I didn't know this until runtime. And um, anyone that's done enough JavaScript development will know that you can very easily end up with runtime problems. And there's a reason that uh, that compiled languages or, or languages that have type checking in them as part of a compile step are quite valuable. But anyway, let's uh, do that. And did I, uh, is that games, games? Can I read null from non-nullable field query dot games? Did I not restart the server properly? Ah, oh, no, it should have been got. Let's get games, not get game. Of course. Okay, there we go. So now we've created. So fantastic. Um, you've seen the problems that lack of type safety can bring, um, and some of those were manufactured errors, and some of those were because I actually typed things incorrectly. Uh, but if we were to say kind of like flesh this out a bit more, so we could do game. And then again, we're going to ignore the first argument. Uh, we know that this receives an ID, and then we're going to have our uh, data sources, oops, data sources, and then that will need to be return data sources dot game game dot get game, and then we'll pass the ID into there. So now we can get back a game based off of a specific ID. So, but like. What is ID? How do I know that it's called ID? I know it's there because I've got the schema open side by side, but this is getting a bit tedious and it's going to be frustrating. So let's jump forward again in time and have a look at um, what, like, how will we bring some of this type safety information in here? And I'm going to skip over the first step of generating types and look at the second aspect of it. So when it comes to generating types, uh, as I said, because I'm going schema first, I'm using a tool called GraphQL CodeGen. Uh, so GraphQL code generator is um, is a tool where you'll provide it with your GraphQL schema, and uh, it takes uh, if you have a number of plugins that you give to it, and it will give you some output for that. Let's take our GraphQL schema just to have a look at it in the browser. What it's doing? Oops. Okay. So what it's doing is it's creating a couple of things like some utility types, like a maybe type, an ex um, exact, a few things like that. But then we'll see that we have scalar values, so ID, string, boolean, int, float, and how they map through to TypeScript or, or JavaScript primitives. So ID is a string, string is unsurprisingly a string, boolean is a boolean, int is a number, and float is a number because floating points are difficult. Um, we see that we have a question here, and we can see the fields that are mapping to that, and we see that's defined as arrays, and so on and so forth. Um, if I was to change, say, question to be um, nullable, now it's a, a maybe type, and we can see that it has that um, the question mark there indicating that this allows to allows us to assign null in TypeScript, uh, kind of so on and so forth. So, so we like that's really useful for us. Now we can get type objects that represent our GraphQL schema, and we can generate this. So I've gone ahead and set that up with inside of this step of the, the application. Um, I've installed GraphQL code gen um, and I've created the codegen.yaml file. And I'm generating two things here. I'm generating uh, the TypeScript definitions and I'm generating the TypeScript resolvers. So the reason that I'm generating the TypeScript resolvers additionally is so that I can come into my resolver object here and then I can strongly type it. I can say that the resolvers is um, uh, this object here. And it is, uh, let's just npm run gen, because I think things are not quite right. Oh, whoops, coming to the API. npm run gen, generated type. Let's see. The the type signature that I was looking at there wasn't quite right. There we go. Um, so we can see that the query, um, as we expected there, uh, we have game, which we know, and now that's got some type information. 
it know that it knows that it doesn't have any arguments provided to it. Whereas if I hover over game, we can see if I can get it, there we go. So it has uh, it has game query arguments and it's going to have a field called ID. We know that we need to return a game object from here, so on and so forth. Um, but we still lack that data source. Like it, it doesn't have a type yet. So how do we go ahead and give that data source a type so that it's uh, it's understood with inside of our application? Well, that's where uh, we have the uh, Apollo context. So I've created a strongly typed Apollo context here, data sources, um, user in game and question. And if we were to add that uh, as a custom bit of model mapping, which I'll grab from here, put it into my YAML file, make sure I get the indents correctly because that's YAML and nothing says fun like white space significance, says the person that is a huge fan of F sharp. Okay, so what I've said here is there's a file called Apollo Context uh, and inside of that is a type called Apollo Context. And where you have the Apollo Context, I want you to strongly type that. Awesome. Now data sources is strongly typed. We know that there's a property called games. It's called game, but we're getting another red squiggle. This time it is saying that, well, it's a very long error message that won't fit on the screen, but essentially I'm, I'm returning an array of model types asynchronously, but this expects a, a uh, array of game, not game model. So how do we fix that problem? Well, we come back and we grab some more stuff out of my sample here, which is model mapping. So this tells the code generator that where you find types, uh, map them between the, uh, the, the internal type that I'm using for my backend system will map through to this uh, type that is available from my GraphQL schema. Uh, so we run gen, and there we go. Success, npm start. All right, it uh, looks like I've got about five minutes left, so I'm going to be kind of powering on through a little bit uh, here. Oh, whoops, I forgot to do npm install on something maybe. Uh, or should I have, I should have actually looked at the error message. Um, it was not, uh, not what I thought it was. Uh, we will pop through to here and we are missing something there. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, npm start. So we'll get our server up and running um, and then I'll jump through to the fully completed application because I don't think I'm going to have time to implement this with inside of uh, the React application, but I can show you what that looks like and, where, and how we can do um, type safety all the way through to our connected client. But there is still one more thing that's possibly going to explode um, if I do this. Uh, so I get games, I want the questions of this game and let's get the question and the uh, correct answer and the answers. All right. And as predicted, this is exploded. The reason it's exploded is because it can't find a field called correct answer in the object model that we're returning. So why has that happened? Well, it's because if we think back to our database types, it's correct underscore answer, not correct answer in um, Pascal case. So like our, our type system is all there, it's all correct, it's all giving us this information, but we need to help it out and, and sh explain how to do some of the custom mapping. So for that, I can come into the right level here and we'll go question, wait, where am I? Ah, I'm at the wrong set of parentheses. And we're going to go question. So we can do, uh, we can give some help to the way that, um, Apollo will convert our backend data models into our output data models. So here we're going to receive a um, a question model. If we have a look at that. We're going to receive the question model, and I need to return. Well, I, I need to return that particular field of uh, for our question, which we can do with return question dot correct answer. Uh, similarly, we can do that for uh, answers because we don't have an answers property that we saw in our database. We have correct answer and incorrect answers. So again, we're going to do question, oops, not qubit, question, and then we'll return. Uh, we're just going to randomize this so that we don't get the answers in a predictable order. Uh, this will be question dot incorrect answers concat uh, question dot answer, uh, correct answer. 
Okay, save that. Wait for the server to restart. Ta-da! Now we have helped with some additional model mapping um, to deal with some of the custom data structures and everything is looking just the way that we want. We are getting data back. We are getting type information. We know that when we're mapping here, that it's the database type. We know that the question is going to be expecting um, uh, question types to return. We know that this is expecting a string out, whereas this is expecting an array of strings. So that's all given us kind of the things that we need. All right. And the last thing before uh, William comes back and joins me for Q&A, because um, I think I can see some questions uh, starting to pop in, is let's go to our fully completed application and have a look at how we bring this into the, um, the client as well. So uh, loading that up, there we go. Okay, so the last thing that I need to do is I, I want to perform things. So I'm using React hooks here, but again, it's sort of immaterial. You could be using it with any way to talk with Apollo client um, back to your uh, your backend server. Uh, but I want to say, let's let's have a look at the completed game. Um, I want a uh, I want to perform an operation. If I could find it here, where is it? Mm. Where is that one that I'm trying to perform? Okay, we'll start with create a game. So I want to create a new game. Um, this is going to perform a mutation that's going to need us to send some data and get some data back. So this is the query that I, or the mutation operation that I want to perform. Um, I want this strongly typed so that I know that I'm going to get back that string ID. Well, I can generate the types using GraphQL code gen that gives me this typed document node. So this is a, um, a thing that GraphQL clients in JavaScript can consume. This um, type document node can be passed through to um, any query operator, which then gives me back a, a mutation function. And then because this is a React hook, uh, it gives me back the, um, the values that will be updated from that React hook. So I know that um, loading, oh, sorry, I know that data, that's the thing that's coming back. It's going to be a create game mutation or a null or an undefined, depending on what state we're in. If we unpack that a bit more, um, create game is going to be a optional thing that can return uh, from a game, but it's going to pick out just the ID field. So if we have a look at dot notation, we'll see that we have ID, which again, matches the thing that we wanted, um, the, the operation we've tried to perform against our GraphQL backend. It's all there as expected. Um, and I think I'm just about out of time. So let's jump over back to our slides and quickly wrap up. If I can if I can find my slides, where did they go? There they are. Okay, so that was a lot of stuff to go through in a very short period of time. Um, and yeah, so we wanted to leave some time for, uh, for questions. Now, if you wanna get uh, the, if you wanna have a play around with this workshop and have a look at the stuff that I didn't get time to dive into, you'll find it on my GitHub at github.com slash Aaron Powell slash GraphQL TypeScript Workshop. Um, I'll also share these on uh, social media and in the Slack channel um, uh, with the NDC hashtag on Twitter. Um, if you wanna get them and you don't wanna frantically try and screenshot or type them down. Um, GraphQL Code Generator was the tool that I used to convert the GraphQL schema file into TypeScript um, type definitions. And if you want to learn more about using GraphQL and uh, on Azure, um, I have, I think it's a seven part series so far um, of doing that. Uh, you'll find the, the starting point of that, uh, of how we get started. We kind of build out a bunch of stuff that we've seen in the workshop today. Um, and again, uh, for, for the folks that are here in Australia, um, if you want to grab some Azure swag, uh, the link is now working. Uh, looks like we actually had a, a problem with it initially, uh, but that is now working. Um, so you can claim your Azure swag, um, or uh, uh, if you want, if you don't have an Azure account, you want to have a free trial. Um, jump on there and uh, use the Azure Pass to get ready to uh, have a play around. Uh, but looks like uh, William is about to join us again. So. Thanks everyone for uh, sticking around. I hope that that was interesting. I hope you've learned something new about how we can do GraphQL uh, in a type safe manner. Thanks for having me. So now over to questions. It's gonna be really awkward if William doesn't come back. No, he is excellent. Hey, oh. <laughs> that was really smooth. Hey, virtual clap. Yeah, well, look, because we can't be there in person, I have to bring my own audience applause. Um, I, I also have a laugh track, but I didn't use it because I didn't think my jokes were funny enough to warrant that. <laughs> I would, you could have played it. It would have been quite funny, actually. 
Hey, uh, Aaron, that, yeah, like I said, that's really smooth session. Is I, I, I'm actually was taking a lot of notes here, um, and uh, there is a question that in the chat, the one from Ben Lowbridge. So Ben's asking, is there a benefit to building out the application schema first as opposed to the types first? So benefit is probably a subjective term because um, everyone has. Um, a view of what is beneficial in a different way. So uh, mm. I, the reason that I prefer to go schema first than database first is that that tends to be the way that I think about designing my application. I think about what the client is going to be wanting before I think about how the data structures are going to be. Now, in uh, in my past time in consulting, I definitely worked on applications where we started database first, where we would design out a database structure and, and what was it going to look like for us to store the data and then turn that into an API that we're then exposing to our clients or um, into an application that was going to be consuming it or whatever it might be. So. Mm -hmm. Benefit is, like I said, it's, it's a subjective term. Um, there are going to be reasons that you would want to do it. There are going to be reasons why you wouldn't want to do it that way. Uh, but think about it in terms of what is going to be the best fit for yourselves, for the, uh, the, the approach that you want to take in the way that you're designing your architecture. And then ultimately that should help you with um, the decision on, do you want to go schema first or do you want to go um, data modeling first? Oh, that sounds sounds good. Yeah, it is definitely a, a subjective. You, uh, like I said, you get to a project and the, the database is already there, but for uh, some reason they decide, hey, we need GraphQL. Now you yeah. mentioned GraphQL. You've done all the demos here with uh, you know, JavaScript, uh, TypeScript, but you know what about all the other sort of platforms, other languages out there? So .NET, C Sharp, F Sharp. What uh, what do we do there? Um, well, first off, I'd say I will. Why, why are they important? Just do everything in JavaScript. Um, nothing goes wrong <laughs> with that. Uh, okay, sure. <laughs> and, and just as a, as a complete segue, um, and uh, something that I saw on Ignite's announcements was um, there is some updated support for Excel macros to be written in JavaScript. So like, JavaScript is taking over the world. You can write macros for Excel in JavaScript, but I digress. Well. Um, if you're, <laughs> let's say that you're building a .NET application. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of different um, uh, libraries out there that will do GraphQL servers uh, for you. Um, my pick of them is Hot Chocolate. Um, funny name, uh, serious project, I guess. Um, uh, it's a, but it's a, it's a very fully fledged GraphQL server um, implementation for .NET. It runs on um, ASP.NET. Uh, it can run on Azure Functions. Um, uh, uh, otherwise, there's um, GraphQL.net. Um, that's just it's another project that's out there, uh, another open source project. Um, and in my GraphQL on Azure series, I actually talk both about GraphQL.net and Hot Chocolate, and we look at how we can implement with either of them. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, like how do you like the the data structures and things like that, um, GraphQL CodeGen will actually generate you. Um, C sharp classes from a uh, a GraphQL schema. So if you are going down that schema first route and you want a way that you could generate your classes to maybe give the entity framework or uses as mapping between your um, your like your entity framework RM and your um, your uh, resolvers, uh, it can actually generate you that stuff as well. So you don't have to go down a code first route if that's not the way that you want to tackle it. So that's the tool that you you've used during the talk, right? The same one. Um, yes, yes, I oh, think cool, so. Cool. Uh, I'm definitely going yeah. to explore that one uh, a bit further myself. <laughs> um, yeah, got another a question here about um, uh, the schema. Like, you know, so it can be quite big. You know, let's say we've got a really complicated application. Um, can we split it up? Can we make it a little bit more manageable? Uh, and you know, what what's uh, yeah. any downsides to doing that? Yeah, so uh, if we think about some GraphQL servers that are out there, like, so GitHub is a um, has a GraphQL server component to it. So you, instead of using the REST API, you can use GraphQL, and there is like, there is hundreds of things you can do with GitHub's API. Um, I, now I'm making some assumptions here. I don't actually know how the GitHub GraphQL um, schema is implemented, but I would expect that they're probably um, splitting it out as a uh, as a bunch of separate schema files. Now you can. Mm -hmm. um, because you still need to expose this as a unified front, you can do that in a couple of ways. First is through um, federation, where we uh, where we have something that will then bring together a bunch of back a uh, bunch of schemas and then expose them out as a single unified view. 
Um, the other is you can just take a schema with inside of a, an application and split it out over multiple files and use um, GraphQL tools. So what I was using for loading the schema uh, from a file and then converting it into something that Apollo could consume. Uh, they also have a plugin that um, that is used to kind of extend the GraphQL language a little bit that allows you to write basically an import statement. So you could have um, the like the, the types for your your game and your player and your question as separate things with inside of separate files. Um, and then you can use it to just bring them all into a single file that is then the thing that you're mm. serving out. So that can be like, if it's maybe a, a project that doesn't warrant you creating a bunch of different microservices that are all exposing GraphQL, but instead you want to just avoid having one file that's like hundreds and hundreds of lines of GraphQL schema, mm. you can use that to, to merge them all into a single file um, and then expose it in a single server. Cool, no, that sounds great. Um, I've got just a sort of an obvious question. Uh, when does GraphQL go wrong or <laughs> what's the sort of uh, pain that you may have uh, encountered before? For others to be aware of. Yep. So probably the number one biggest thing that I find painful with GraphQL is authentication. Uh, because mm -hmm. GraphQL is a query language and it's pretty expressive in the way that you can uh, represent it, but it doesn't have a good way to represent authentication and authorization access. Because you are kind of giving someone the power to get very close to your underlying data models and query against those, how do you do authorization against that? So how do you make sure that, well, like I might have access because I'm authenticated to perform this particular query, but do I have access to that field within the database or that, mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that, that other data model that's following a relationship? How do you implement that? So that can be a difficult thing to, to do because first off, you need to make sure you're modeling it out for your clients to consume and understand the, the things they can and can't do. But also you've got to have your resolvers intelligent enough that they can deal with that. Probably the other thing is that GraphQL is very well known for allowing you to create a your own like DDoS attack um, against your own infrastructure. Um, there, so this is actually possible with inside of the schema design that I have in that GraphQL query. Um, yep. You can go from a game to a player, back to a game, back to a player, back to a game, back to a player, back to a game, back to a player. So you can end up with this object graph that just gets huge. Wow. And if you haven't implemented your resolvers to be intelligent enough to perf perform short circuits or to detect recursive mm. queries and things like that, yeah, you can you can very quickly create your own DDoS because you've got a query that is just recursing on itself. And if you're talking to a database, you're building a query that's going to the database that's then going that's building a new <laughs> query that's going to the database that's building a new query. Um, and and that's just so that's just a a limitation that you've got in the way the language is designed. Now there are ways around that. Like I said, you can have your resolvers intelligent to detect short circuits. There are projects out there that will um, enforce those short circuitings with inside of resolver chain. So you can't go more than like 10, uh, 10 deep in field traversals. Um, or yep. you can just hope no one realizes that they can bring down your infrastructure by writing a very poor query. <laughs> mm, yeah, so I was just thinking even like when you, what you said, that DDoS attack. So that is your, when you write the query, so if you're just nesting the same types over and over, deeper and deeper, right? So you get a very wide, yep. very deep sort of query, uh, and that creates that DDoS yes. uh, uh, headache. <laughs> oh dear. Cool. And, and I guess yeah. even if I think about subscriptions, can you, um, yeah, you know, somehow you can sort of you know, exhaust WebSockets as well if you want to subscribe to literally everything, or is that not really a problem anymore? Uh, well, no, it's it's definitely a problem, and. The other the other challenge with um, subscriptions and WebSockets in general is that you end up with a mm. very tight coupling between client to server, so scalability mm. becomes a problem. So if if we think about a, a right. cloud infrastructure where we're scaling out, um, mm. we've hit a scale limit and we want to add more infrastructure to it, or we want to scale up the size of our infrastructure, you know, more uh, more CPUs, more RAM. Well, how do we maintain those socket connections across scale ups? Um, also, uh, WebSockets don't work in a serverless model because they're kind of like anti-serverless. Like it's, the point of serverless <laughs> is that it's event-driven. And then if you're like, I want a persistent connection, well, the, how are you having a persistent connection to something that is inherently not allowed to persist? Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, like, you, you, you definitely can, and um, uh, you can definitely overload a system using WebSockets um, and using the subscription mm -hmm. model, uh, mostly because it limits the ability to scale. Mm. Cool. So, in a sense, really, you know, we have to 
make sure that we're picking the right tool for the job. You know, it, it's built for purpose. And, you know, if, if, if things change down the track, then you know, we have to be mindful of that. We don't want to create a, a really problem. Well, that looks Sorry. like all the questions I have, Aaron. Uh, so thank you very much. Great talk. Uh, I think uh, Lars is My burning to, to come back on screen. He's got something cool in store for us coming up. Are you there, Lars? Well, yes, oh, I hey, am. Is that someone new? Yeah. Well, it's my twin. Hello. I'm ready for the quiz. Are we ready? Oh, you haven't changed your shirt. <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh. Oh. It's just, I, I just have them lined up over here. There's just a whole wardrobe. Just, uh, no, not really. But, you know, it's uh, it's special. Ooh. We've got something really cool you can win. So um, I'm, I'm keen. I'm keen. Um, anything else you want to add? What I want to add? Oh, well, uh, do we actually know what the prizes are? We haven't actually listed yeah, out yeah. what people so, can win. So, okay, so let's put up the Slido joiner thing while I explain how it all works. I think that's probably a good idea. Um, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. we have this quiz. Now, you can use that QR code to get onto it. You can join on your phone or whatever. Now, the, the most important thing is that you don't do the quiz via the live stream because there's a lag and you're not going to do well. So join the link on your own browser instance, something, right? Don't just mm -hmm. watch the stream. Um, and then there's a time for each question. So there's 10 questions. Uh, and in this case, it's going to be about Sydney. Surprise. Um, and see, we're already joining. So as you join, I can see. And we're going to get hopefully lots and lots and lots of people to join. So the faster you answer the questions, the more points you get, right? So it's not just about getting them right. It's about getting them right fast. Right. So that's important because I didn't know that the first time. Um, and then also um, you get also a lot of points off if you get it wrong, I think. So you actually better a strategy mm. is better. It's better to not answer the question if you're not 100 percent sure. Right. Because you can lose. Points good. As well. Yep. So there's a bit of strategy to it. Um, and <laughs> the prizes, the prizes. So we have five, five NDC hoodies. So they are like. <laughs> Limited editions. Correct. I have the original 2016 hoodie here. Ugh. You can see Ooh. 2016. Whee! Nice. I think it says somewhere. Oh, my hat. No. Hang on. <laughs> I can't quiz without the hat. There we go. Um, so there's one of those for each of the top five. And then the mm -hmm. winner also gets a ticket for next year's NDC. And not just any ticket. It's an all-access ticket. So that's workshops. And conference the lot, right? That's pretty cool. Um, that's yeah, pretty cool. So a, yep. Yeah, it is pretty cool. So please join the quiz. Join the quiz, and you know, there's you can win actual stuff. Um, you see a bunch so, of names in there already. It's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just gonna give it a minute now. Melissa um, asked there uh, if 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 she can win pants. We've got um, hoodies, but maybe we should have pants as well. <laughs> well, well, you don't know if I'm wearing pants, or maybe I am. It's, wow. it's one of those questions. Mm. Yeah, it is. I know. I don't want um, an answer. <laughs> no, you don't. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> please join. Uh, I did put something in the general as well. So if you're in room one or two or three or four, just mm -hmm. uh, join room one live stream. Um, uh, da -da -da -da. Come on, people. I'm ready. But I'm going to give everybody a chance to join. Because uh, once we start, there's no way of stopping it. Like, it's just going to keep going. So, um Mm, I, I see some familiar that. names in that list. Yeah, I know. There's a uh, shout out to uh, Dinesh. You got Liam, Matt G, uh, so just, Melissa, Jacob. That... Oh yeah. Jacob? <laughs> yeah I'm hoping that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, might be a different Jacob. I don't know. I'm hoping oh, yeah, that bar pretend. barman is a spelling error. It's supposed to be Batman, but you know. Um, oh, it's barman. I know barman. Yes, yes. Yeah. He's a, so he's a lucky a... winner from uh, uh, our mail.net NDC. Um, Ticket raffle. So Barman oh. won the the full uh, ticket for NDC Sydney. This one. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> that's his well, name. <laughs> so we got we got thirty four people. Come on, people. Um, I'm just going to give one more minute, and then we're going to jump into it because uh, we got other things to do. So, mm. but the hat makes it better. It must do. It's nice and colourful. I don't have a hat. I'll have to find a hat for the next one. Yeah. So just to recap, if anyone's just joined, make sure you join the Slido on your own. Browser instance on device. Don't mm -hmm. look at look at it on the YouTube stream because there's a lag and you're not going to do well. Uh, you might even miss some of it completely. So 
Do it on your own instance. How long do we get for each question? I think it's like 10 or 15 seconds, right? I don't remember. <laughs> I thought it was 20, but it might be 15. Um, but whatever uh -huh. it is, you, the quicker you answer it, the more points you get. It's 20 seconds. I just That's right. 20 seconds. Um, mm -hmm. All right. So we are 39. Can we get to 40? Right. And then we'll good, start good the quiz. Course. So if you're ready, everybody, fingers I'm on. I'm going to hop off, Lars. You take buzzers. control. All right. Bye, William. Um, yeah. So put your finger on the buzzer. Actually, there's no buzzer. But, you know. Uh, so there'll be four, um, I think it's four, um, it's like multiple choice, right? So four uh, options for each question. So are we ready? 41 people. Here we go. Start on the quiz now. All right. So first question, which actor once worked as a painter on the Sydney Harbour Bridge? Mel Gibson, Tom Cruise, Paul Hogan, or Russell Crowe? And you can see the timer goes down here. 10 seconds to go. Quick, quick, quick. Get it in. We got 16, 21. Come on, everybody, answer that one. See, so it looks like there's a, there's a trend towards something. And time's up. All righty. So this is what you voted. And the correct answer is Paul Hogan. So half of you got that one right. Well done. Let's see who's in front. We get a leaderboard every time here. Ooh, Matt 88. Ooh, dear. Okay, I don't know how to pronounce that. Let's say with Matt. Matt, Chris, Patrick, Bryden, and Chang. Excellent. All right, so question number two. Here we go. How many light bulbs are inside the Sydney Opera House? 15,500, 73,000, 174,654, or 8,700? And you might be able to Google this really quick, but that's cheating, so don't do that. Um, we've got five seconds, four... Three. Oh, it's exciting. Oh, there's a bit of a split here. So everybody's convinced that it's not a, it's a lot. Everybody's convinced that it's a lot, it seems. But what, how many is it really? The correct answer, 15,500. Not as many as you thought. 174,000. That's a lot of light bulbs. That's a lot. But yeah, um, kudos to, uh, to the quiz question maker thing. That was very good. All right, who's in front? We're going to have, oh, Bryden's on front now. Very good. All right, all right. So next question. Here we go. That's it. In 2017, the New South Wales government named its newest ferry. What? Charlotte, Freshwater, Queenscliff, or Ferry McFerry face? <laughs> Which is fantastic again. Oh, God, my inner six-year-old loves that. Um, and we got another five seconds. Come on, answer everybody. And we got, oh, everybody's got an answer in, I think. Yep, there we go. Fantastic. So this is what you thought. Yep, yep, very good. That the correct answer is Fairy McFairy face. Yep, they actually did. So if you're not from Sydney, yeah, um, someone had a bit of humor. I, th I think this was a public poll that su suggested this, but uh, anyway. Who is in front now? It is, oh, Patrick Tan is on top now. See, the time has is important. 45 seconds for the three questions. Um, all right, 45 seconds left, I think, is what it really is. Um, all right, next question. NEC Sydney is typically held at which location? Hilton in Sydney, ICC, Sydney Town Hall, or Four Seasons Total Landscaping? <laughs> Sorry, I'm giving it away, but that's pretty funny. Um, all right, going on, five seconds. Five, four, three. Come on, everybody. And... There we go. Yep. Hilton Sydney is the most popular answer. And the correct one is, it is indeed Hilton uh, Sydney. Fantastic. So the leaderboard. Now, I'm a, I think I'm right in saying that it's going to be at the Hilton next year as well. But I'm sure Jakob will correct me uh, if that's not the case. But let's go with that for now. Well, well done, Patrick. You're still on top. Fantastic. All right. Next question. Which was the opening date of Sydney Olympics in 2000? Was it the 14th uh, of... Are these American dates? Yeah, they are. Oh, interesting. Anyway, 14th of July, 15th of September, 14th of November, or 15th of May. Ooh, okay. So giveaway, if you're not from Australia, if it was in May, it'll be kind of miserable because that's sort of um, spring-ish. But a lot of people saying 15th of September. Let's have a look. What is the correct answer? It is indeed in September. Well done, everybody. So who's on top now? Is it still Patrick? Oh, different Patrick. 
Patrick, now, so oh, there's a bit of a competition here at the top. Whew, lot to win. All right, next question. Uh, Australian television soap opera Home and Away is shot partially at which beach? Bondi, Manly, Coogee, or Palm Beach? What do you think? Uh, if you've never watched Home and Away, you're not missing much. It's rubbish, but a lot of people like it. Um, it's a typical soap thing. Uh, it's the same storyline for the last 20 years, I think. Yeah. Okay. A lot of you are saying Palm Beach, Bondi Beach, popular second. Uh, let's have a look what the correct answer is. It is indeed Palm Beach. Uh, well done. Okay. Is Patrick still on top now? Which Patrick? Ooh, Patrick is still there. Well done. Matt is in for it as well. Samuel and Patrick number two, Patrick 10. Maybe that's Patrick number one. I'm not sure. Uh, and Tom is snug in there. Well done, Tom. Next question. All right. Blank is the oldest street in Australia. So which street? King Street, George Street, Pitt Street, or Sussex Street? Which is the oldest in Australia? Interesting. So a pensioner street or something. We've got three seconds to go, everybody. Yep. Oh, the last struggler there. All right. There we go. That's it. George Street is what the popular uh, answer is. Let's see what the correct answer is. It is indeed George Street. Well done. So where does that put our leaders now? Ooh, Patrick is still on top there. Very good. There's not much happening at the top. Let's see if we can uh, change that up a bit or if they are just too good. Next question. In New South Wales, it's an offence to disrupt the wedding or funeral, be in possession of more than 50 kilograms of potatoes, correspond or engage in business with pirates, splash mud on public bus passengers. Right. I like the pirates one, but I actually don't know this one. <laughs> um, don't know what the potatoes would relate to. Anyway. All right, so you all said pirates, that it's an offense to uh, do business with pirates. It's not very Australian, isn't it? We used to be, anyway. Let's see what the correct answer is. It's, no, it's splash mud on public bus passengers, right? <laughs> Fair enough, okay. So that should hopefully shake up the leaderboard a bit. Let's have a look. Uh, we got, and, oh, Matt is now on top. Oh, and Jay, whoever Jay is, has got a bit further up. Now, in order, if you win, by the way, we are going to need your handle somehow. We need to be able to contact you somehow to be able to send you the stuff, right? Just bear that in mind. So we are going to reach out after, after this, uh, either today or tomorrow or maybe early next week when we know what we're doing. And next question is, who won the gold medal in men's 400-meter freestyle swimming in Sydney Olympics in 2000? Was it Christopher Thompson? Was it Grant Hackett? Was it Ian Thorpe or Matthew Welsh? Oh, we've got quite... Uh, there's a lot of you went very quickly for one person. Let's see. Okay, you might be guessed who you all think it is. Ian thought by a mile. But were you right? Were you right? Let's see what the correct answer was. It was indeed the Thorpito. Fantastic name. So where does that? I suspect that won't change much on the leaderboard. Oh, Jay moved up. So you were quick on the buzzer there. See. Matt is still one question ahead, one right right answer ahead. All right, I think we have, is it one more question to go? Yep, we are up to the final question now. Sydney Airport is formerly known as Nancy Bird Walton Airport, Kingsford Smith Airport, Mascot Airport, or Alice Springs Airport. All right. What do you think? What do you think? Ooh, five seconds to go. Last question. Got to get it right. Got to get it right. Come on. Come on. And what have we got? Oh, you always said Kingford, Kingsford Smith. Hard to say. All right. What's the correct answer? It is, you're right, Kingsford Smith Airport. Well done. So who was the winner? This is now it's getting interesting. You ready? Ooh, who are, we, who are our five winners? Oh, Matt, you, you made it. You did it. Congratulations, Matt 8 Yate. I think, I think it's Matthew Yate, actually. Um, Jay is number two. Obviously, we were going to need your handle so somehow to be able to, uh, to, to contact you, make sure of that. But all five, Matt, Jay, Samuel, Patrick, and Benjamin, you all want a hoodie. And Matt, you won our NDC 2022 All Access Pass ticket. So well done, everybody. Um, so that's it for the quiz. There is one more quiz with same prizes later on in the day. Uh, but for now, we're just going to have to uh, have a quick word from our sponsors because they make all of this happen.
International Women's Day is a key period of time for us within the shelter and the opportunity to raise funds sits right beside that. Just days before International Women's Day, our website was hacked. We contacted Telstra Purple and the team just didn't even take a second thought. We had a call late in the afternoon asking whether or not our team could help. Knowing that the users contributing to the shelter through the website were trying to make a whole lot of difference, anything we could do to help there was, was really important to us as a group. They took a website that had been completely destroyed and they rebuilt it in probably less than 48 hours. The kindness of strangers is actually what makes this shelter run. Telstra Purple, they took their skill, their love, their passion, and they used it for purpose and they use it for good. And finally, the top spot on our list of Medium Best Workplace winners for 2021, rocketing up from number nine in 2020 to the top place this year. Congratulations to our number one Best Workplace in the Medium category, Mantle Group. Mantle Group is a business that truly lives its principles. Customers rate its service delivery as excellent. Executives embody the best characteristics of the company. Employees and management are in it together. As one employee put it, the COVID crisis was tough for many businesses and watching a team of over 250 people reach consensus to get through the darkness together will be one of the highlights of my working life. To be certified with Great Place to Work here for us as an organisation is extremely important. It helps us translate feedback, input from our team and from the organisation to make us a better place to be on Australia's 2021 Best Place to Work list is a great milestone. It's, we're super proud to be amongst some really great organisations uh, in this list. We really put focus on, on the team. Uh, during COVID times, tough times, we really centred our business to focus on a few things that really matter. To keep our team employed, to keep people safe, but also to keep productive throughout the last 12 months. The message I'd like to give to our team is a massive thank you. There's so much gratitude as a collective group of people that make up Mandel Group and I'm super proud of everyone's efforts to contribute to making it a great place to work. It's never one person in Mandel Group, it's always a, a team that collectively delivers on our promise as, a, as an organisation. Oh, I'm back. Surprise. I'm not wearing a Lars hat or anything like that. And I am still unmuted. Fantastic. We're getting the hang of this stream deck, oh, sorry, this stream yard thing when it comes to uh, presenting. Uh, but you're not here to see me present. I've already done that and you've had enough of me. Uh, instead, uh, we've got our next speaker who's going to be up in just a moment. Um, and we're going to have uh, JK and he's going to be talking about ND Framework Core and some common mistakes. So I asked JK how he would like to be introduced for today's session. And he said, oh, nothing special to introduce me. So um, apparently nothing special um, to, to say about JK. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, JK is, is fantastic. He's been a, um, a huge feature at NDC over the years. Um, and he's a Microsoft MVP. Uh, he is a solution architect at SSW, who uh, we heard from earlier today. They're one of our partners here at NDC. Uh, but I would like to welcome JK to the stream and we'll get ready to hear about some common mistakes that you can have with ND Framework Core and how we can go about solving them. Hi everyone, yeah, uh, and thanks for the great uh, introduction. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, EF Core, common mistakes that I have uh, uh, found in production in lots of different projects. Uh, it's mostly Excellent. basically almost like a group uh, therapy of going all of the pains <laughs> that I have gone through in the past and uh, hopefully also show what are the actual impacts of doing those mistakes because most of the people say, hey, just don't do this. But, you know, 
what does it actually happen when you do it so we're going to have a look a little bit into that and hopefully with that you'll be like okay we definitely shouldn't do that excellent sounds good i'm looking forward to it uh but we'll welcome you to the stage with a round of applause <laughs> That's Thank it. We've got to bring that in. Um, oh, and oh, just, sorry. One final thing before I hand it over to, to JK to kick off. Um, for the winners of the quiz, can you make sure you reach out to NDC at info at NDC? There we go. It's across the bottom of the uh, screen now. Info at NDCconferences.com um, so that we can get that stuff to you. But without further ado, let's learn about ND Framework Core and how to make it a bit less painful. Hey, everyone. All right, my uh, screen shift. Uh, hi, everyone. As mentioned before, I'm going to talk about some of the common mistakes that I have found uh, in EF Core, uh, lots of pain that I have gone through it, uh, looking at other code and trying to figure out why is it slow and kind of also address uh, one of the issues that some people may have regarding EF Core, uh, saying uh, it's slow, we shouldn't use that. Um, in fact, a lot of issues uh, that I have found is basically just misunderstanding of how EF Core works and with some of the tweaks. Sometimes I got even up to 100 times uh, performance improvement just to add a few things. So hopefully what we're going to see is uh, some of the issues that you might have in your project, you can then fix them up a little bit and bang, you'll get a lot of performance uh, back. Uh, also better memory and in the end, what is even more important, better stability to your application uh, because the application no longer needs to work as hard as it did before. All right, so a quick introduction uh, for, uh, for myself. I'm Yene Kavka, you can just call me JK. Uh, I'm Solution Architect at SSW, an AI Microsoft MVP. You can follow me on all of these uh, socials. Um, I'm also organizing a couple, uh, couple of meetups like APAC AI, Global AI Podcast, the uh, Full Stack Brisbane uh, user group. And predominantly, I'm a .NET Core and EF Core developer. Uh, I'm also dabbling in the AI, but this is my main uh, main thing that I do every day. And I really like to perfect my art. And this is why I have focused quite a bit to figure out what are the actual best practices for EF Core. Now, um, why I like to use EF Core uh, is one of the big reasons for it is basically you get a nice balance between features. You get uh, good flexibility as well as performance. Uh, anyone who looked at how EF Core have developed since uh, the start of 1.0 all the way to EF Core 6, they can tell you it's not just that we're getting a lot of features with every single release. Every single release brings us also a lot of performance improvements, which ironically means that some of my slides might actually no longer be relevant in, say, EF Core 7. Maybe Microsoft will say, okay, too many people have issues with that one. Maybe we can solve the problem for them. So that's one really cool thing about EF Core. On top of it, you can switch between different databases. And in my opinion, um, it's really, really good for relational databases, um, not just because you have joins and they're pretty performant. Um, you can also switch between different database engines so you're not stuck with just one engine. Oh, and we can't forget about migrations, database confolding, and there's a lot of tooling around uh, EF Core, which is why I really love EF Core. And if you have any issues and you're thinking about, hey, we might need to switch to something else because of performance issues or something like that, hopefully this is going to help you stay on track. 
All right, so one of the motivations of why I wanted to build this is basically a lot of issues that uh, people complained about that I have seen saying, hey, this is running slow, uh, was uh, were very easily fixed. Uh, another thing that I also found is that when I fixed those issues, the code actually looked much more simpler, much more straightforward, and people could read it more easily. Uh, which was ironic because we actually make it more performant, yet it's more maintainable and more readable than the original code. So sometimes optimizing your code isn't a bad thing. And uh, sharing the best practices, um, and those best practices are going to be backed by uh, benchmarks and tests, so you can actually not just see the numbers, uh, most of them you'll be able to just pull my GitHub and try to replicate uh, that for uh, for yourself. And lastly, I had some scars regarding EF Core and what I've seen, and I hope that I'll never need to see them again. <laughs> All right, so test methodology for this was I used at the beginning a batch, um, benchmark uh, tool called benchmark.net, uh, mostly for consumption. Uh, memory consumption, uh, especially at the beginning of those more her uh, horrendous uh, queries to just show you that, yes, actually it has a huge impact, especially when your database starts to grow. Um, then most of the tests are going to go onwards with Bombardier, which is kind of a, like a simple load testing tool. You can say, uh, have five uh, active connections and for 60 minutes, try to make as many requests as possible. So we have a little bit more um, real performance information. We don't just get one hit and then see how uh, the database and our application behaves. We actually are uh, hitting uh, the service a, a little bit for a minute to see whether the performance get worse uh, over time or we have a stable uh, performance. Then I also use Postman to, uh, for that and doing one hit um, uh, queries. And also most of the examples that I do return back uh, the actual SQL statement that was executed so that we can compare uh, what is actually executed on SQL Server for each of the cases. And all of these samples are in .NET 5 and EF Core 5 because I started this demo about uh, three months ago, four months ago, and I really wanted to um, show one of my clients, hey, these this are the, the issues that we're having, and here are the better examples of how to do it. All right, and also this is my machine, in case you're interested, what is the performance metric for my, uh, what what hardware am I using to do all of this performance test? The SQL Server is on my machine as well as the application, so that might not be the best perfect uh, testing machine for uh, for doing that. Uh, but I think uh, what I have tested in production, it's a good enough indication to tell you which code is better than the other. All right, so for the test data, I have downloaded from this link. And this test data has some simple tables like customers, employees, products, uh, and sales. The most important one is the sales, which have 7 million sales in it, just to drive home uh, what can happen when you write a bad code and then the database starts to increase in size, then all of the sudden, something that was okay in performance when you develop the application, when you push it to production a few months later, suddenly the, the entire web website doesn't work anymore. And I'll show a few uh, pitfalls that I actually found uh, in actual production that caused the entire website no longer working. All right, so one of the common mistakes that we'll uh, look at uh, today is going to be going from iQueryable to innumerable. I'll show you some of the pitfalls uh, when you do this kind of casting. 
uh, then not using S not tracking. Uh, you might note that EF core, when you get data from the database, they're trapped. And with S not tracking, uh, you can make them not, not tracked and we'll see the impact uh, of that. Then getting all data when it's not needed sounds obvious, but in a lot of cases, uh, obvious doesn't seem to be enough. Um, explicit joins. Uh, they are sometimes really good uh, when you do the queries to do dot include, include the additional tables, but they can backfire. And I can show you how you can uh, avoid those issues. Then we're going to have pagination. That is also a very common issue that they have found with pagination just when implemented correctly. Uh, and lastly, over complex queries. I'm going to sprinkle a lot of wisdom all around uh, the session, but these are the main points that we're going to go through. And, you know, when when I first started doing EF Core and when people say, look, you can quickly screw up with um, uh, queries, I was thinking, how bad can it be? And for years, that kind of was in my back of my mind, but in the last two, three years, I really started to look into, okay, how bad can it be? And let me just say that sometimes some questions shouldn't have an answer. And, you know, this might be one of those. And let's start with something very innocent, counting. You would say, well, yeah, we have here an example that is obviously horrible, right? We have naive count, we have here uh, the table sales, then we do two lists and then count. I have seen this in production, but you know, it's an easy fix. You just remove uh, two lists and it's done, right? But there is one less obvious one. So here we have and again, sales table, but we say I save it under a variable, which is I enumerable, and then we count. Now, conventional wisdom, considering how c works, would be that this should be fine, right? Like it's enumerable. So when you do dot count, obviously it's going to execute on the database, right? Well, they are kind of the same thing. So when you run this as an enumerable, you are getting all of the data from the database. So this is one uh, thing that was pretty interesting uh, to find out. Um, so yeah, when you cast uh, to enumerable from that point onward, everything is in memory. And there's also the problem of naive where um, or anything that actually has a method like this over here, where you return, you basically returning a table, but a table is not I queryable, is I enumerable. Uh, and now you can start to think about, wait, we have used repository patterns and they are returning I enumerable. And then you start to think, Oh, all of the data we're trying to get from the repositories, we're getting all of the data from the uh, from the database without filtering first, and then we're filtering in uh, in in memory, and then you're starting to realize how many places you have uh, performance issues. So, in uh, what I enumerable is one of the issues that I found to be the biggest performance and memory issues in most of the applications and you should avoid them as much as possible. If you do a uh, repository pattern, maybe consider using iQueryable uh, for the methods that you know that they're going to be filtered on a higher level. iQueryable is not linked to EF Core. So if you have a different, different database engine, you'll still be able to use iQueryable uh, despite, you know, making that, uh, giving you the ability to actually change uh, what is going to be current in the database. 
So what's going on? So why is this a problem? Well, first, we download the entire database, obviously. But there's other issues as well. So because EF Core supports entity tracking, what happens is that all of these entities are being tracked. And in order to make them tracked, it consumes a little bit more CPU and it consumes a bit more memory. Uh, and then once we get all of that data, we're processing them in memory. Uh, we're doing the filtering, we're doing selecting, order by, and all of that stuff we're doing on the .NET application rather than on SQL Server. And if that's not issue enough, in the end of the day, we also need to run all of this data through garbage collector. So garbage collector now has to do a lot more work than it would uh, be necessary uh, if we wouldn't uh, need to process everything in memory if everything would be on SQL Server. And just to give you a feel for, uh, for scale, so for instance, if we have 7 million rows and each of them have five integer, that on its own is already 140 megabytes of data you're downloading from SQL Server. That's already uh, a lot on its own. And we're talking five integer. We're not talking about text and other things. And tracking also adds about four bytes per property uh, per row, although I found that uh, that metric might not be correct. Uh, I'll need to double check on it, but at least it, it seems to be four bytes per pro property per row as far as I understand it. So minimum consumption would be 218 megabytes per call. And now imagine you're trying to count all of the uh, sales and that takes 280 megabytes uh, to count all of that rows. Uh, that's quite a lot. And also it's slow and uses a lot of CPU. Now, the simple solution here is very simple. You change from I enumerable to I queryable. And this actually prevents um, the query to be executed in memory and gets executed to SQL Server. And to go back to how bad can this be? Now, if you have a small database, it's probably going to be a difference in a couple of milliseconds. Here we have 7 million uh, records. So, yeah, we can see here naive count takes just about 3.6 seconds um, and takes, I think this is about 2 gigabytes of RAM. Um, now, this is not a perfect test, especially for allocation, because um, what the uh, .NET benchmark is doing is, is running the test multiple times, and I'm trying to create and dispose EF core, and some of the memory of the previous execution may bleed into the next test. So it may not be the perfect test, but you can see here that the difference between the uh, the one that we did with I queryable versus I enumerable, the difference in memory is massive. It, it you cannot even compare this. Uh, this is like hundred thousands times larger, uh, and you know, well, performance is great to have uh, faster and faster execution. Uh, which here you can see that it's basically 63 times faster. Uh, I think it, the most important metric here is that you, you don't consume all of the RAM on your um, .NET application. And similar thing here for um, doing the way clause, um, enumerable versus iQueryable. Uh, obviously, the performance is 100 times faster. As I promised you, we're going to look at things that makes 100 times faster and changing from I enumerable to I queryable is one potential candidate to increase before, uh, performance uh, even in the scales of 100 times. And you can see here that allocation is also a massively smaller than what we had before. 
And, you know, to just drive the point here, I used Bombardier, and I'll show you an example how I used it, um, to basically load balance this for a minute with five connection uh, as much as it could. And the results that I got is that the naive count actually managed to do only 0 0.1 request per second, and it totaled with 10 responses for five connections constantly pinging uh, for one minute. So that is actually pretty terrible response time. Uh, compared to that, uh, when we have improved it, we're just changing innumerable to iQueryable, you can see that all of a sudden in one minute, we got uh, one uh, more than 1,000 requests back and the request per second uh, increased to almost 18 requests per second. So the increase is massive. All right. So let me, before I switch to this, let me show you in the code how this actually looks like. So over here, I have the worst case scenario. Um, so. Over here, what I have done is I use iQueryable for this, but I could use iEnumerable. And for the result, uh, I used a to list. Don't mind a tag with context for now. I can remove it just to not confuse anyone. Uh, I did to list and then uh, count. So this is going to cause a performance issue. And here, the query to uh, Two's query string. I use this. This is an extension method to EF core, where you can convert a iQueryable into the actual SQL statement that it would ex execute. There's one caveat to this: is that you cannot do against count uh, first of default, um, in cup, uh, max and a couple of others where you actually need to execute the query. So this uh, two query string um, is not going to, sh you're not going to be able to do it against first of default and uh, those kind of things. It's basically almost expecting it to be uh, a list. So that's one, one issue with that, but you know, it's good enough uh, for our case. And what I have here is the application running. I'm going to restart it just for sake of argument. And what I'm going to do is, let's clean this up. Just to show you what I'm doing is I'm going to take the name of the controller, which is examples count slash, and this is worst case. And I'm going to bring up uh, my uh, ta task manager. So here we can see that we have 0%, 300 megabytes on Venus terminal. So when I run this, you will see that CPU usage jumps significantly. Uh, the RAM usage jumps significantly. And this is now happily processing behind the scenes. So we wait for 10 more seconds, and we should get uh, results. By the way, if you're interested about the Bombardier tool, uh, let me get the browser over here. You can get it on the GitHub page, Bombardier, uh, from code Sandberg uh, slash Bombardier. And it's a really good, um, really do a good tool for you to benchmark uh, things a little bit more organically than you know, hit uh, with the postman and see what's the result. Now this takes a little bit of time after it finished because it waits for all of the requests to finish. So you can see that it takes a long time to just finish off everything. Oh, now it went to 17 gigabytes. This is this is why you try to avoid innumerable. 
O2 list prematurely. Okay, this may take a while. Is it because... Oh, interesting. Why is Edge using that much? Okay, usually take that took a little bit faster. Oof. Anyways, I'm trying to show the point, and I think I got my point here. Um, usually it finishes much sooner than this, but I'll kill this because it takes way longer than it usually does. And what I also, hmm. okay, Windows terminal completely frozen. That's all right. I'll just kill that. Uh, kill that. All right. So here we can see zero. That's wrong. I have tested this right before doing uh, this test. Um, anyway, so I'm going to run this and I'm going to show you in Postman over here. Um, there's a few things that I have done. Uh, when we run this, um, when I do one request, and by the way, you'll be able to get this all in the GitHub. When we uh, run this, this is going to also respond with a specific request, uh, with a specific answer. And what I'm doing is when I'm getting a response, I'm actually using Postman to show uh, the result in a little bit more stylized way with a visualizer. So hopefully, yes, we finally got a response for the worst case. Now, when I visualize, this is the query that's been executed on the uh, SQL Server. Now, if we do the best case, which basically means just we're using iQueryable, we can see here that the query changes. So let's visualize this. So you can see that instead of doing the proper select statement, we just have select, count, uh, from sales, and then as, as, but that doesn't actually matter. So the major difference here is, if I scroll down a little bit further, is that I just do count and that's it. All right, let's go back to the slides. Hopefully that bomb in the end is not going to cause too much uh, problem because I wanted to show some of the performance uh, uh, issues that I haven't put into the slide, but we'll see as we get to that. Now, another thing that you might want to consider is as not tracking. Now, as not tracking, what it does is it excludes tracking on the entities. Uh, and that results in using less memory, less CPU usage, and those uh, entities are not tracked. Now, that means that you cannot update or delete um, unless you retract them. Now, if you track them again manually, uh, all your properties might be uh, marked as changed. And then if you do an update, it will update everything. So maybe not the best thing to do. So just use as not tracking when you want to get rid only data. But the impact of doing that is pretty significant. Uh, now, I don't usually see this uh, uh, much performance improvement. Uh, here we have literally five times uh, faster performance, and we even uh, use up four times less memory than the uh, test, uh, than the initial uh, code, which the only difference is that we added dot .s not tracking. Um, but what I have seen in practice is that you get at least 33% uh, better performance and you get at least 50% uh, more uh, less memory consumption. So if you can, uh, if you can just have the data as read only, do use as no tracking. It's a one liner that can give you huge performance benefits. 
So here you can see that we have uh, the same uh, method without S not tracking. Uh, we got about a uh, hundred requests per second. We did the same with just adding S not tracking and we ended up with four times better throughput uh, than with, without it. So it's a very easy way to get better performance. Another issue, very common issue that I have found is also using explicit includes. Uh, that means that you have dot include and say we're getting the customer table. Now, one of the issues that I found, found with this is uh, they usually put it into a method. Uh, they say, okay, this uh, say the sales table includes includes all of the tables because you just want to make sure that all of the table that you might need are there. Uh, but that is a terrible thing because even if you don't need that data, even if you do mapping and you don't use any of that data, it will generate a SQL statement that will include the uh, all of the tables uh, in your joins. So you have now an unnecessarily complicated query. And to uh, solve this is, for instance, over here, we have a uh, include over here, and we're getting all of the data uh, for that salesperson. And then we are separately doing the mapping uh, from, the, um, from the full sales uh, table with the uh, salesperson. Now, uh, alternatively, you can actually uh, do the mapping in the database, and as an added benefit, you can directly reference the sales person, the first uh, name, and that will result in a implicit join. Uh, that means that, as you uh, can see here, I'm actually not using any includes, and if I, uh, uh, if there's a spec change that actually we don't need to have the salesperson first name or things like that, um, and we no longer depend on the salesperson, once we del delete them from uh, this mapping, we suddenly have no, no joins in our uh, SQL statement. So you don't have to constantly think about, am I using an include too often, which have pretty significant performance benefit, uh, performance impact. You, you just have, uh, you can just forget about it. One note, however, for this one is, if you pack this as a method, you need to do it as an expression of a function. If you just uh, do uh, as a regular mapping uh, thing, let me show you as an example, say we, we go to the ray clause and let's just take this one here. Let's say that we do dot uh, select x new, uh, uh, this is sales, yeah, so let's do uh, sales model. And let's just say that we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get quantity equal X quantity. We want to do sale ID X sale ID. And then we want to do product name X product name. Uh, it's going to be product dot product name. name. And let's just say that we are returning Sales model, sales model. Let's just simplify this and I'll just going to put over here. We don't need to complicate things. And just bear with me for, for a moment. So here we have a simple example of how we did the mapping. 
And what you can do is you can actually do control uh, R M, or you can do control dot, control dot, and then extract it as method. And what you'll notice here, this is an expression. So this is going to be executed on your server. Now, if I do the similar thing, but instead of this, I'm going to do this. So I'm going to return the sale model. And this is going to be X. I already have an X. And I use map in memory. I use this instead. Let's do this. This is now going to be processed in memory. So everything after this is actually going to be in memory. I'm uh, sorry, not in memory. Uh, there's a different trick. In later EF core, actually, this is executed in the server side but you will lose this mapping over here. So this is going to result in null. Um, so uh, because you can get only the actual uh, sale uh, table, sale uh, entity, uh, it will not know that you actually also want to have a reference to the product table and this mapping over here is going to fail. Whereas in this case, uh, where we are returning back an expression, um, it will understand, oh, wait, you're referencing product. Uh, so I should uh, also do an implicit join to this product. So this is one of the common mistakes that I have seen, and that resulted in ugly code uh, that is absolutely not necessary. Uh, this looks pretty nice to me, and it's reusable, so you can use it in different uh, queries and also very performant because you only get the data you need. I've already done the demo. And also the performance impact. I kind of forgot to add the performance impact on this, but uh, let's do this. Um, we have here, did I forgot to add the misc? Okay, I did forgot. Uh, but uh, the performance impact here, oh no, I have here, sorry. So the worst case scenario here would be that we include everything. So if we go back to the example joins and we go for the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario is we're trying to get everything. Uh, and this everything result uh, results in need ah, to run the application first. Need to fix this first. Second, I think everything. The joy of doing everything uh, live. So I think I can just do that and dot com that was the original code now should be able to run so the impact uh, of this is going to be that it's not running I just make sure oh, okay it's just not putting it in the foreground the impact of this is the worst case scenario is going to ta obviously take a long time to run uh, but if we look at the um, query, you can see that we have all of the inner joins that we have specified. But if we look at what we're actually using, we can see that we're only using the salesperson. We're not using the product, we're not using the customer, but we are still executing all of these queries. So right now it was 6.4 seconds. If you run this again, it's going to be slightly better, I think, because that was a cold boot. Yeah, 4.6, but it's a horrible performance. Um, now you can 
it's not necessarily a bad case. I would uh, discourage you from using this. You can add the include in the query, and that's going to improve the performance uh, significantly. So that's only two seconds. Um, but if I do this again, it's going to uh, result in exactly the same problem as we had before. Uh, it's not going to improve performance, even though we're not using that table. Now, the time that you actually do want to use uh, include is when you're updating uh, the, uh, the elements. So for instance, I want to get uh, all of the sales uh, for the salesperson. Say so we got the list and we do uh, wait query dot uh, to list. And then I actually want to update are you complaining? Does not contain definition. Hmm, interesting. That's a new one. Uh, list, is it because I'm reusing it? Hmm. Ah. I didn't have my morning coffee. Got the at async. So, when you're in situation where you actually want to uh, do this, and what you want to do is, for instance, you want to go, let's say, first one, and then you want to go to the uh, sales person and then update some of the information uh, of that person, then in that particular case, you do want to do include because uh, all of that is going to be tracked. Uh, and when you do uh, DB, DB context, DB context dot save changes, uh, that is going to be updated as well. So the included uh, tables are also being tracked and you can update them just fine. Now here it wouldn't update because we have as not tracking. So in that case, you would need to do um, with not tracking. And for instance, if I do uh, change the name to be uh, JK, that should work just fine. What are you complaining now? Are you seeing method not accepting? Ah, because I need to. Save changes async. Yeah, now it works. If I run this, even though this is um, this is a included uh, table, it's going to update. So this is one case where you actually do want to have include. And just to show you the best case scenario, which is with the implicit uh, join. If we run this, this is not only going to ah, need to run this. It's not only going to uh, give you a much more uh, efficient SQL statement. So here we're not only um, efficient with the uh, joins. We're also efficient for what we're asking for. And if you're interested at the end, I can show you that uh, reducing the number of uh, items you're getting from the database actually impacts the performance. So you can, uh, this is kind of an almost double performance gain. And to uh, in my eyes, it's actually more clear what you're trying to do. Here you can see it's very clean. Uh, I can. Here I know that um, this is only read-only data. We are filtering by that, and we want to have it in this shape. So in my opinion, that is actually a much more cleaner code. It's very concise. And as a bonus, it's high performance, and it has uh, it's very memory efficient. So for, to me, this is a win in all regards. So usually what they tell you is don't do premature optimization. 
this would be the exception of this. There's almost no um, side effects of doing this. All right, so the next thing that there's a common uh, issue that I found is the pagination. Uh, usually uh, it uh, happens because um, what we're trying to do is filter data. We uh, get the filter data, so we do two, uh, two lists, and then we count them uh, already. And only after that, we apply tag, take, and skip. And some developers do that because they don't know they, they can use iQueryable to their advantage. So for instance, if we go to the pagination controller, uh, the common mistakes that we have over here, so this is the worst case scenario. Here uh, we have the query, uh, we did the filter. Now, what I have seen, and this is a very common scenario, uh, you wouldn't believe how many times this happens, is we get all of the data, which is not too horrible because we are filtering first. But what happens then is we're using uh, that data to in-memory process um, additional things like skipping the page, uh, taking um, taking a slice of the results and then mapping it just so that at the end we can use dbresult.count um, so that we can actually get the right uh, number of results so that we can then also show the right number of pages and stuff like that, which um, may look as a reasonable code, but a much better approach to this is Leverage the iQueryable. Here we have the query. We do the same thing as before. But what we do is we make a separate request with this iQueryable to count everything. So what that means is we are telling the database that I want to have, um, I want to know all of the results based on this filter over here. And then what we do is we uh, basically do the pagination. So we skip a couple of items, we take a couple of items, and then we uh, make another request to the database uh, to basically get that one slice of data that we're interested in. Now, this sounds like it should work worse because we're doing two requests into the database. But one interesting thing here is that it actually is the reverse. So if we do the worst case scenario, we can see over here, we have a very simple uh, request. We have one join, so that's not interesting. But what you may find is that this takes about two seconds to run. But if we do in the database, for instance, uh, we end up having uh, a bit more code but, so you can see here, we have a bit more variables and stuff like that. But what you can see here, this takes only 127 milliseconds. This is on a completely different ballpark. So don't feel uncomfortable doing uh, small calls to the database. They can actually be a significantly better way of getting data than trying to get a lot of data from the database and then process it in, in memory. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I'm, I'm just gonna jump in um, a little bit. We're, we're coming up um, on time and I, I, oh. honestly, I could have, I could leave you go for like the next, um, however long you've got left. Cause I, like, this is really okay, so interesting, really, a really good look at um, a bunch of stuff. So, um, I guess the, my first question is, what's your what's your next big tip for people um, that are wanting to, to learn about some of these common mistakes? Yeah, so let me, there's two big tips. One would be um, the, um, the thing with overcomplicated uh, queries. And yeah, uh, apologies for that. I was thinking that I don't have enough content, but I end up having too much. <laughs> um, we all have been in that space. Um, so one thing that 
And this is all on GitHub. And I have done some performance benchmark and I'm going to improve them. But one thing that I learned is um, there is a thing where you can actually split, split queries into multiple ones. There's a feature called as split queries. There's some caveats to it. Unfortunately, I don't have time to get into it. Uh, where it allows you to split up the queries into smaller queries. For instance, salesperson, there might be only one, and it will query only one salesperson uh, instead of duplicating multiple ones in the same row. That saves you a lot of store, uh, a lot of transfer, and also a lot of SQL Server uh, process. But you can also do it manually, which I found to be almost two to three times faster than SQL Server. Uh, sorry, than EF Core, which is, but it's very simple. You just query the person ahead of time and then query all of the data that you want for that person. And then uh, just a simple for, for loop, uh, you join those data together. And this is like two, three times faster if you struggle with performance in this particular case. Another thing um, that I want to, Last just, thing. Oh yeah. yeah. Go. Okay. One last thing. <laughs> yeah. Cancelable queries. So this is very important. Uh, you may see that I'm doing in the um, uh, request. I'm doing cancellation uh, token, and I'm including those cancellation tokens in the to list, in the safe changes, in first of default async. And the reason for this is, if you cancel your uh, your HTTP request, the this cancellation token gets cancelled, and if you um, if you don't um, listen to this cancellation token, uh, what happens is the SQL Server will still go on. So if you have that count example where it took six seconds to process, mm -hmm. this six seconds is still going to happen in SQL uh, Server. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a really good tip. I I never thought to capture the cancellation token of the HTTP request and use and, and kind of pass that um, essentially as a kill code through to your underlying database um, calls as well. Um, yeah. So I, just before we we um, wrap up with you, oh, oh I see that that's the the slides. Yeah. Um, so the, the links to your demos. Um, I did have, have someone ask a question that I also was wondering the answer to. The implicit include stuff, um, mm -hmm. is that new to Entity Framework? Because no, I always actually remember the that, old. Yeah, having to. Um, okay. The problem with the implicit include is that uh, most people um, in, uh, use them incorrectly. So, for instance, they did the manual mapping and the manual, sorry, they did the mapping and they did the mapping, say, cell model uh, map cell, right? So they yeah. did this, uh, which is wrong. Uh, and this caused the implicit mapping to not work. Uh, if you struggle to, uh, to figure out how to do this, just make the selection, do control dot, and um, basically introduce, why don't you want to introduce the method? Anyways, usually it gives you the intelligence to introduce <laughs> the, uh, a method, and that is the right uh, way of doing it. Cool. Well, um, excellent. Thanks for that. Like, like I said, that was really, really excellent. And I, I loved how you stepped through all the demos um, and kind of broke each um, step down piece by piece because that, um, that I, I, I was able to really follow along um, how, how you kind of got to each step of the process and how you uncovered um, the different changes that happened along the way. Um, but yes, mm -hmm. unfortunately, we are we are just about out of time, um, and it is well. It's coming up to lunch at least here in Sydney. I know that you're in Brisbane, and you're like lunch. That's still at least an hour away. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm going to invite uh, Lars back to the stream, um, or at least I'm going to hope that Lars is there because we're having a, a changeover in our producers in the back end. Oh no, there he is, Hello. and um, he's I'm still here. got pants. I still have pants on. I apologize for the poor video quality, but it'll all make sense in a, in a moment. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. Because what are we doing, Aaron? Uh, so um, something that we wanted to try this time uh, and try and make a bit more of a, a like a um, interactive uh, virtual conference is uh, this is Gather Town. Uh, so if you um, if you sign up for NDC um, or, or if you want to join, um, go over to the NDC Sydney website and sign up. 
um, uh, you can jump into Together Town, and it's a it's a virtual networking experience. So uh, we can That's see right. Lars running around. Um, and what do, so, what are you doing, Lars? So, um, so this is yeah, it's like a virtual space for events, right? Because we we now live in the virtual world, at least for a little bit, and it's an it's a nice way of kind of bringing people that are otherwise just in a YouTube stream or a WebEx call or whatever onto the same sort of experience. So we're gonna try this um, now. With the camera, as you can see on my screen, I have the camera off here. Now, I put two cameras on before, so I've got like one camera right there I'm talking to you, and there's one just above it, which is the other one. When I put both on it, my computer went, hang on, what are you doing? I'm just not going to let you do that. So we'll see how that goes, but I might have to cut the camera <laughs> for here, for that one, and put the other one on on StreamYard. Uh, sorry, on GatherTown. Right. So... <laughs> Here we go. But the idea is that you can come and join me. Now, if you do talk to me on, on the call, actually, as you can see, this is streaming to YouTube. This is just my screen share. Um, but do go in and try and find someone you don't know. You know, walk up to them like I'll do now. I'm just going to cut this camera. So apologies. I'm going to go off the camera there, and I'm going to turn the other one on here. And we'll see. So there we go. So I'm in the corner down there, as you can see. And now I'm going to try and go and talk to Dave. And now we'll see how it works with two microphones as well. That's going to be interesting. Anyway. I'm going to go down to Dave. I was uh, just busy uh, creating my own avatar and joining in and seeing how much of a mess that I can make it by also yeah. being on. That's right. So now I've walked up to Dave and Dave can hear me and I can hear him, but whether the sound is going out to YouTube, that's another thing that we're trying. I don't know. Um, that's right. We're going to test the, the limits of uh, rural Australia networking. <laughs> no, no, it's Elon's network. Um, so I'm just going to turn the. Oh, I don't know what I'm doing. Can you hear me on the YouTube's? And can you hear Dave? Can someone just put that in the comments? All right, you are now banned from this. This. Uh... <laughs> hey guys, that's awesome. Um, yeah. Okay. Well. Yep. Yeah. So can hear Lars, not Dave, is what I've got. Cool. All right. So that didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to mute on. So I... Then, then I can I can join. So you can have two copies of me. I don't know which one's the audio. Yeah, I, I I know it get, it gets very audio. <laughs> Oh, we probably won't hear audio on stream from uh, the people that joined unless Lars shares his screen with desktop audio. Um, if... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> no <Nah. laughs> 
can only hear Aaron giggling. That's because Aaron's in StreamYard audio. He's not in uh, GatherTown audio. Uh, so, um, but I'm on audio now, at least. So you can hear one quarter of the conversation because there's four or three other people here. Go to GatherTown. Uh, you should have a link in your emails. Um, otherwise, just uh, reach out in the, which track are we going for? Or the general track. Um, if you don't know how to, to, to join uh, and someone will help you get there. Uh, it's kind of neat, actually. So it, please do. Um, we can't get the audio to work with the screen share, which is interesting. This is a... Uh... Oh, look at that. See, I could hear that. Yep. <laughs> this probably threw me. Um... Yeah, exactly. You are hearing me via StreamYard. Well, that's both. Yep. So, <clears throat> but otherwise people can't hear me. No. It's odd because I have shared it. Oh, but now it's not sharing. Hang on. Why is it that different? So it's sharing it. And oh, now I'm sharing the whole window. Okay, I'm going to try again. I'm going to sh stop sharing. Sorry, Chin. Um, Chen's going to go, oh, God, not again. Um, I'm going to share Chrome tab again. And I'm going to share tab audio. And now, try this, Chen. Are we going to get audio through now? Uh, I don't know. So we can still hear Hello. each other. Hello, um, somebody. Yeah. We'll see. If it goes through. So, oh, yeah, there we go. Okay. Mm-hmm. So if I oh, if I mute the stream yet thing, yeah. Hey, sure. working but I, that, yeah i probably shouldn't oh someone said they heard me on youtube <laughs> it's, it's not i'm not sure i'm not sure it's worth it but never mind i feel like these, av these avatars should yeah, these avatars should do more. <laughs> we can. Uh, so I'm. I'm watching all the the various communication back channels. So I can. Yeah, I can. I can see our um, organizer Slack channel, as well as listening on YouTube, listening on Streamyard, listening and gathered down. Yeah, now that I know that they can hear me, I'm gonna stop talking. <laughs> Producer. Hello. Oh, we probably want to hear audio on. There we go. Oh, ah, cool. I'm just going to close the stream because that's trippy. <laughs> Fair enough. Go check out the beach. <laughs> also, proximity audio. That's interesting. Bye, YouTube.
So when you walk into some of these darker areas, that's the, the private spaces. Oh, wow, this is a bit laggy. There we go. <clears throat> oh, so we got two over here, Stephen and Eugene. See, they're in a private space. See, it's how it's gray. Oh, Aaron's in here. JK, why are you all in there? Oh, I'm just going to walk past. Do, do, do. Can't hear anything and probably has gone on far too long. Is <laughs> someone saying on YouTube? <laughs> yeah. um, what we can do is that you can also just go join Gather Town instead of watching on YouTube. Oh, Dave, go away. Dave's there he is. He's trying to get. Because then we can go and talk to other people that are not on YouTube. So it was worth a try, though. I think. <clears throat> All right, because this is interesting with the sound. Uh, I'm just going to stop the screen share. Go and join. There we go. Hello, everyone. Actually, I can uh, change the camera over now, I think. Let's do a better camera, shall we? That's better. There we go. All right. So, yeah, please don't go and join Gathertown. They didn't quite work as we intended. Audio through tabs and screen sharing is tricky. Um, but uh, do go and join Gathertown because that will actually give you all of what I just showed you, right? So you can talk to people, meet new people that you might not have known. That's kind of one of the reasons of going to conferences is that you pick someone else's brain on what makes them uh, interested in technology and what they think is a cool developer thing. So go do that. Um, I'm going to hang out and gather time for the next while, and you can all come and find me if you want or find someone else. Um, but we will be back with sessions at 12.30, I believe it is. Let me just check the schedule. Um, sorry, 1.30, of course. Um, and, yep, we'll be back at 1.30 um, with uh, David Wenger's talk. Um, sorry, William's talk, William Lindbergh. Very good to get my schedule right. Um, so we'll see you all then for um, after lunch.
Are you an engineer looking to impact millions of Australians? We're looking for big thinkers, problem solvers, and challenge seekers to help us engineer the future of banking. Combank Engineering. Do you have what it takes? Search engineering at Combank. And finally, the top spot on our list of medium best workplace winners for 2021, rocketing up from number nine in 2020 to the top place this year. Congratulations to our number one best workplace in the medium category, Mantle Group. Mantle Group is a business that truly lives its principles. Customers rate its service delivery as excellent. Executives embody the best characteristics of the company. Employees and management are in it together. As one employee put it, the COVID crisis was tough for many businesses and watching a team of over 250 people reach consensus to get through the darkness together will be one of the highlights of my working life. To be certified with Great Place to Work here for us as an organisation is extremely important. It helps us translate feedback input from our team and from the organisation to make us a better place. To be on Australia's 2021 best place to work list is a great milestone. It's a, we're super proud to be amongst some really great organisations uh, in this list. We really put focus on, on the team. Uh, during COVID times, tough times, we really centred our business to focus on a few things that really matter. To keep our team employed, to keep people safe, but also to keep productive throughout the last 12 months. The message I'd like to give to our team is a massive thank you. There's so much gratitude as a collective group of people that make up Mandel Group and I'm super proud of everyone's efforts to contribute to making it a great place to work. It's never one person in Mandel Group, it's always a, a team that collectively delivers on our promise as, a, as an organisation. International Women's Day is a key period of time for us within the shelter and the opportunity to raise funds sits right beside that. Just days before International Women's Day, our website was hacked. We contacted Telstra Purple and the team just didn't even take a second thought. We had a call late in the afternoon asking whether or not our team could help. Knowing that the users contributing to the shelter through the website were trying to make a whole lot of difference, anything we could do to help there was, was really important to us as a group. They took a website that had been completely destroyed and they rebuilt it in probably less than 48 hours. The kindness of strangers is actually what makes this shelter run. Telstra Purple, they took their skill, their love, their passion, and they used it for purpose and they use it for good. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to uh, the afternoon session of NDC Sydney 2021. Uh, my name's Dave. I'm going to be one of your co hosts for this uh, next little bit. Um, if you haven't yet, 
please don't forget to check out the expo at expo.ndcsydney.com. Uh, most importantly, you can enter and win prizes, which is probably what we're all here for. Um, but I'm not going to waste any more of your time because you're not here to see me. Uh, let me bring on my our next talk, uh, speaker who needs no introduction, William. Welcome back to the stage, the virtual stage. Uh, and uh, yeah, you're going to talk to us all about uh, arms, I believe. Uh, arms and bicep. Yes, Dave. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to talk a bit about um, how we automate infrastructure creation or provisioning in Azure uh, using this new tool called Bicep. Awesome. Well, I'll let you take it away. Folks, please ask questions and I will uh, happily parrot them at William after the talk. Take it away, William. <laughs> Uh, thanks, Dave. So hello, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about uh, flexing your biceps with Azure. And I'm going to start off with a very rough definition of uh, infrastructure as code. Now, the point of infrastructure as code, or IAC, is uh, to automate the provisioning of your resources in cloud. Uh, usually now, as it's been triggered by the success of CI/CD pipelines becoming very popular, you know, plays a, you know, that's, these are the tools we use to automate everything we do. Uh, so sort of on the platform side and even on the, the build side, right? So we want to build our software and want to provision our hardware. Uh, and, you know, we don't want to do it by hand. So the CI CD processes along with uh, infrastructure as code uh, is, is you know, a big part of what I do as well every day. Now, why we do this is to help manage our cost, risk, and to increase the speed of delivery for our applications. But the cloud infrastructure, cloud applications, that whole landscape is getting very complicated. This is hundreds or even thousands of different services that we can uh, deploy into the cloud uh, you know, from all the different providers. But for me, I, I see a lot of these sort of just data formats like JSON, YAML, uh, and XML everywhere. You know, this is what a lot of uh, the sort of the go-to choice for people to define their resources uh, uh, and the configurations for those resources as well. But they're just data formats. And then to get them to be a bit more dynamic, a bit more intelligent, We've tried to shoehorn uh, like programming constructs into them, for instance. So we'll look at some of the uh, the classic ARM JSON templates uh, and compare that with uh, the Bicep and other sort of uh, IOC providers out there. Because for me, I, I, as an engineer, I like to keep everything simple. So I want to follow that, uh, keep it simple, and or keep it sweet and short uh, principle. Uh, so you can say that one in different ways, but that's my favorite. A little bit about myself. Uh, my name is William. I'm a lead software engineer at Xenix. Uh, so I spend a lot of time with customers, building new projects for them, but also play a big part in the platform side to make sure that we can uh, migrate customers into Azure that need to or enable them to get into Azure as well. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. I have uh, a GitHub repo as well uh, and LinkedIn. So if you want to engage me in any of those, feel free. Also have a blog site called azuregems.io. And uh, a lot of today's talk will also go on there. And uh, you can find me on the mel.net meetup uh, page as well. So uh, yeah, like I said, big fan of Azure. Pretty much every day I do something Azure related. Uh, and, and .NET, been using .NET since version two, uh, two since 2005, oh, I forget the day or oh, the year now. It's a long time ago, but <laughs> I skipped the first version. I think what's this uh, crazy new technology? I was a, a very dedicated C++ uh, fan back then. Uh, but then, you know, .NET 2 came around and changed my life. It changed my career, basically, as well. So I've been doing .NET ever since. Uh, currently, big fan of uh, Blazor WebAssembly, uh, pairing that with some of the serverless uh, offerings like Azure Functions and, and Cosmos DB. So, you know, can definitely write up some really cool applications using those services. But the new favorite is uh, Azure Bicep. So that's the tool that we're going to be looking at today. And just for the agenda, so I'm going to quickly cover what is Azure Bicep, compare that with the other uh, providers out there like Terraform and Pulumi, and then see how do we use Azure Bicep, what we can do with it. And there's a cool new feature out called Bicep Registries, and uh, we'll look at how we can sort of encapsulate our complex architectures using these registries and demos everywhere. So uh, yeah, we're gonna gonna have some fun. Now, first, I have to just explain where ARM comes from. So it's actually the Azure Resource Manager. And we can see that the Azure Portal, PowerShell, the Azure CLI, uh, and even other REST clients, they all 
to either talk directly to the ARM REST API or via one of the uh, SDKs from Azure, so .NET, uh, Python, Go, I think. There's a variety of them now. Can't keep up so many. But yeah, it's a way that we interact with the uh, ARM or Azure Resource Manager to go and create the, the resources or the, the services that we require for our applications. So you know, data stores, web apps, VMs, this is a whole, whole stack of them. But what is Azure Bicep? So first, it's literally, we start with a file. It's some code in a file. Now, infrastructure as code. And this time, I think we're going to be dealing with real code rather than sort of a, a weird mishmash of, of data format with some programming sugar added to it. So we can start with the Bicep file, and uh, we call it ARM Bicep. Because once we actually take this Bicep file, and we try to deploy it in the background when we call the Azure CLI Bicep build, it takes the Bicep file and transpiles it into the existing uh, ARM JSON that we're used to. And in a moment, we'll see what the sort of differences are with, uh, between these two files. Uh, but you know, up until recently, we actually had to do this manually. You have to do the build, and then we can deploy the JSON file that was output from that. But uh, the tooling has improved a bit. So we can actually deploy the bicep file directly. So sort of like just in time compiled for us. You know, so we don't have to care about turning it into a JSON file. So again, then that file, you know, the bicep file, we hit the ARM interface, and it will just go and provision whatever sort of resources we need. So you can see there's you know, more than 250 available resources in Azure right now. Uh, and just to recap, there's two types, JSON and Bicep, but they're both called ARM templates. So yes, I guess now we have to be a bit more specific when we talk to someone, which one we're actually talking about. But I kind of hope you know, when we say ARM templates, you're just going to mean Bicep ones. You don't want to touch the old JSON one anymore because uh, we'll see why. And both of them, yeah. So they, they end up translating to calls into the ARM uh, to make these resources that we want appear. And just a further definition of, of BICEP, so it's a, it's a domain-specific language, a DSL. So it's actually dedicated uh, language to describe the resources that we want. We're not piggybacking off something that already existed, trying to make it do what we want. This is dedicated for creating stuff in Azure. It's way simpler to write something in BICEP than it is compared to JSON. Now, they've added a few extra sort of cool things to it. So we can actually have more modular templates, and we can actually reuse our code a lot easier than we previously could. Um, but it doesn't matter, you know. In the end, it still provide uh, transpiles to the JSON equivalent underneath, uh, but it's actually quite a lot of JSON underneath. And you don't really want to be playing around with it. And the stuff that we can do in Bicep, you can definitely do in ARM. Yeah, you know, that's it's all. Everything has to go through ARM JSON, but they've just made it so much easier. And so this is what a basic, very basic Bicep template would look like. Uh, in this case, I'm just creating a storage account. And just like the um, JSON files that we're used to, we've got input parameters. You know, so and just highlight it with the param keyword, we give it a, sim a symbolic name, so in this case, storage account name, and we can give it a type. Uh, in this case, it's a string. Then we can go ahead and define our actual resource. And we're gonna look at a few of these uh, during the talk today. But in this case, I'm creating a storage account. Uh, start with the key resource keyword, storage account, and symbolic name. So it's like an object you can reuse. So it's a, or like a variable in, in most of our program, programming languages. And in fact, it's, it's an object. So we'll see later if you use that dot notation, you can actually drill down into that resource to you know, uh, inspect some of its properties and reuse them. And then we actually specify after that the resource provider type. So these are um, sort of carry over still from the ARM JSON templates. Um, instead of a type, we just give it there, the whole string there with an API version. And uh, But it's really cool. Though, so they've made this a whole lot easier as well with Bicep, with the, the tooling provided in VS Code. Um, and we get some really cool IntelliSense as well. Now, another thing that we can do with the Bicep is that once it's run through and provisioned a, a resource for us, we can actually pull some properties out of that resource and uh, send it as an output. And so we can either print that to console or we can actually wire it into another ARM template or Bicep template. Uh, and so it's definitely uh, quite useful to wire up multiple things and create a longer process. 
So that basic storage account example, uh, it's on the left-hand side. Now the screen's a bit tiny, but just to sort of show that the bicep on the left, a lot simpler than the arm JSON on the right-hand side. So when we take the bicep file, we build it or transpile it, we, uh, we get the, the thing on the right-hand side there. So you can see it's almost half the length uh, in, in this case. And it does vary a little bit from resource to resource and the number of um, properties that they have, et cetera, and all the different constructs that we're using, functions and conditionals, all that. But uh, generally, it saves us a lot of, a lot of keystrokes, a lot of time. I was a yeah, big fan of that. <laughs> so I'm going to quickly jump into uh, a demo. And if that works, well, there we go. Um, now I'm in VS Code and I've got a folder ready to go and create just a, a storage account. And if I can type correctly, I'm going to call it storage account dot bicep. What you need to do first, obviously, to get going with this, you need to install the bicep language service. And it's a cool little extension here. You just click that one, install that. Current version 4.1008. That's the latest one. And once you have that installed, you can do some really cool things. So if we go and type in the resource, or well, RES for short, we're going to pop up. So we can already get some intelligence here to say, you are trying to create a type of resource. Let me show you the ones that are available. So you can scroll down here and look for all sorts of stuff. You can see there's all the various API flavors of Cosmos DB, Data Lake, Firewalls, Key Vault. There's, there's quite a lot of stuff already there, so some nice snippets. So what I'm looking for right now would be storage. So if I just highlight that one, click Enter, and automatically we've got all this code done for us. It's quite nice. Uh, so what we then can do is give this a symbolic name. I'm just going to keep the one called storage account, but you can obviously change that to whatever unique variable you want. Then uh, we need to give it a name. So I'm just going to call this um, EC store 21. Uh, we can change the version, and we can see here they automatically got some IntelliSense to show us all the possible values for that the, the, the type of storage account that we want, all the different enumerations here. So I'm going to keep the latest one, V2. And even here, we can change the SKU type. But it works now. Oh. Not long ago, the, this one was not available. So they're, they're constantly improving the IntelliSense uh, from a lot of the feedback on GitHub and so forth is when uh, a particular resource uh, property is not available, uh, it means that there might be a, a piece missing from the ARM swagger definition. So the uh, Azure and Bicep team are working quite hard to sort of make sure that all these um, bad definitions or missing definitions uh, get fixed up. So now that's cool. Now we can actually easily see what type of uh, storage account we want to provision. I'm just going to pick this standard one here. And this is already a done Bicep module. We can actually take this one and deploy it. So let's see if that actually works. So I've already got a little PowerShell script here just to go and create a resource group for me. So it's AZ group create, give it a name, give it a location, and then we want to go and deploy this template to our resource group. We make sure we save the, the correct file. So in this case, storage account dot bicep, not JSON. Um, and uh, give some parameters. Oh, I was going to say, oh yeah, let's do, let's add a parameter. We want to have a parameter, we want to have storage account name. So we can actually make this a bit more dynamic. I don't want to hard code strings. Um, and to string, we can give a default value. Uh, we can just call it Fred. Oh, but it complains about something here to say literals. Uh, do, 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 do. Strings are defined using single quotes in Bicep. So that's right. So what we also have is a linting tool that's sort of built into the, the Bicep language service. It tells us when we're doing things wrong. And we can actually configure that as well. We'll show you a bit later. So strings are all done with single quotes in Bicep. Cool. And we're saying, see here that we're actually not using our storage account name parameter. So I'm just going to take that and put it in here. Cool. Uh, don't have a hard-coded name anymore. So I'm just going to copy this, make sure that it is the same in here, storage account name. Yep. 
All right, so now for the scary bit, let's just go make sure I'm in the right folder and I'm gonna deploy the storage account straight away. There we go, uh, it's gone and created a resource group for us and it should now be spinning around in the background to create the storage account as well. So if I go to my Azure portal, refresh, should hopefully see that here, NDC storage, there's the resource group. And I'll quickly get to the deployments tab. We can see here, our storage account is actually being deployed right now, which is cool. And what we can also do is, we can see the inputs that went into this template. So that's the name we gave the storage account. There aren't any outputs just yet, uh, but the template that we're actually that it's running against, we can see here is now the JSON template. That's the, uh, the JSON equivalent, equivalent of the byte by set file. I say that fast five times. Um, so let's see, it, here we go. The resource uh, has been completed. We can go there, here is our storage account and you can see it's all, it's all working, great. So here we go and the CLI finished for us, which is really, really awesome. So we have a, a bicep file that deploys a storage account, nice and simple. Uh, Happy days. So we can actually see, uh, just to show you one more thing, if we look at the storage account, we go control space, see there's other properties, there's identity. So if we hold tab on that, it'll tell us whether it's an object or an array. If we go in there, or to complete, here's all the other fields. You know, it's, it's nice and discoverable. It's, it's, it's how you want a programming language or a domain specific language to work. So the, the tooling is really great. And we don't really have to go back to the the Microsoft Docs site uh, uh, often. It still happens now and then with something that's missing, like I said earlier, but it's got a lot, a lot nicer. So yeah, we can go there and we can assign, it even tells us if it's a Boolean and give us some auto completion. That's so cool. Okay, I'll leave that there. And um, what I also want to show you, so I've created a resource, I've got parameters, but there's a whole lot more we can do. Like I said, so it's a, a domain specific language it is like a programming language. So I've got a whole bunch of examples here. I'm going to start from the top and work my way down. So the basics are, that goes into an, a BIOSEP template is parameters. So like I said, uh, showed earlier, we can have uh, a parameter, give it a name, give it a type and a default value. You can actually have it just like that, no default value. So then it becomes a required parameter. But we can also say these are the allowed values. So you can't give me an input other than these three. So I only want to have Australia East, Southeast, and West US as my uh, locations where I'm going to deploy this resource. And so if I try and give it one that says uh, East US, it'll say, you can't do that, sorry, denied. So we can then also go further and have real comments in our code now, which is uh, not, you know, it's not a JSON thing. You can't really have J uh, comments in JSON until recently they, they said they did make that work. But uh, yeah, now we can actually add comments, make our BICEP file sort of be a bit more descriptive and have some good information in there. We can add other decorators. So apart from allowed, there's things like description and max length. So you can actually say what this input parameter is for. You give it a description, the name of the project and the maximum length, so 32 characters. Or if it's a different type of value, so for uh, numeral types or integers, we can give it a min and max value, which is really cool. And a description. So we can just pile up all these things and uh, we'll see later on when we uh, reuse another template, uh, how useful it is when it shows you uh, these descriptions when you're reusing a template. We can also go a bit further and include secure strings. Now what this means is uh, you, you still give it an API key or a password or something sensitive. It's just that when your template is being deployed, that value will not be displayed anywhere, it will not be logged. But the trap is if you do assign it to something else that you do want to log or um, you pass it into a script that then goes and prints it to the console, then you've exposed that key. So just be wary of that it's not going to be a magic solution. You can still do the wrong thing, but it already just helps you for the basics so that uh, you don't want to expose keys or stuff like that by accident. Now we can also go and define variables using um, functions. So a lot of the ARM functions, well, pretty much all of them, they've all carried over into BICEP. 
So here, for instance, I'm creating a variable called storage account name, and I'm following a convention. So prefixing it with the name storage, and I want to make sure it's a maximum length of six, and I'm using a hash of the resource group ID. So it's going to be storage and some random characters after that as an end result. Just yeah, quite nice. So you can uh, create some conventions for all your resources in Azure. Makes things sort of nice and easy to understand, easy to follow. And um, last up in this little bit is uh, outputs. Like I mentioned, you can actually print values uh, to the console or into other modules when uh, this one has completed being deployed. So, and you can give hard coded values, you can pass in other variables, or you can do the same thing and define it with functions as well. So whatever you need, you can output from the template, which is really nice. Um, so I've already done this one to show you how to create a resource, that storage account, so I can skip that one. <laughs> and one of the input parameters, for instance, here, this one, enable geo replication, it's a Boolean. So you can give it a, a value of true and false. But we can actually use the conditional operator in the code to say, if this is true, do this, otherwise do that. So if I enable geo replication, I want to use a standard GRS type uh, storage account or a premium local redundancy uh, store. So um, yeah, nice and easy. So there's other ways you can do this as well. You can uh, have the comparison operators. Most of most of the logical operators that you uh, expect to be available are there. So you can actually find the whole table in the in the documentation. So the next one is modules. This is what makes ARM templates or BICEP templates extremely useful. So we can go and create a uh, BICEP file. And basically every BICEP file is already a module. We can reuse all the files that we've created before and chain them together. So that storage account that we've created earlier, I can actually reference that using the module keyword, give it a symbolic name, tell it which file we want to use. And this will actually do the IntelliSense for us. If you have them stored in folders, it'll discover that for you and show you the options that are available. And then for instance, in this case, I'll just, I'm just going to go and delete this line and show you what happens. So it's giving me a red squiggles and saying uh, something's wrong. Uh, it needs to have the params uh, included. So if we go control space, it'll show us what we can do. Parameters are required, press tab, and it already knows that other module that we're referencing, the storage account module, this is the input that it requires. So it, it sort of completes that for you. Much easier to discover rather than you have to go look at the other file and do it all manually. So and save a whole lot of time. So I'm going to just replace that with what the original one is. And oh, what I haven't shown you yet is that what we're doing here is string interpolation. So we're give, giving a prefix uh, using that dollar and squiggle bracket syntax. We can then uh, render the value of another variable into the st string. And if we actually try something different, if we try to do just basic string concatenation, which oops, should work, and normally it does, but you can actually say, um, oh, maybe it doesn't work. Oh, yes, that's right. It doesn't work that way. You have to use concat. And then you do this. And we do this. And then it'll give us a yellow squiggle. That's right. So that the recommendation is actually to use the string interpolation instead of this function. Yeah, fair enough. So it's very helpful. It tells us what's best practice. And I'll show you later actually how you can configure what you think your best practices are. Cool. So string interpolation, we can do modules. We can also do looping. So um, very simple. We want to say create multiple storage accounts. So we give it a, a value uh, two in this case. And when we deploy it, we're going to go and create a, a base name, reference that storage account module. Cool. And we're going to loop through this range, this, this count of ours twice. So we get an index variable called i. And we can then reuse that inside of this object. So if you notice, there's a square bracket here and here. So we want to create uh, an array uh, of objects. And here is a, an individual object inside. So it's going to loop around and create us all these storage accounts with whatever logic and properties we put in the middle here. Cool. But we don't have, we're not limited to one way of doing uh, arrays or sorry, uh, loops. We can actually use array elements. So if I've got an input of a number of strings, I can then re-iterate uh, over that using the, the for each sort of syntax that we used to in other um, languages. So for name in storage names, I can then go and get that, that name uh, element and just use it as I like, as normal. Cool. 
And there's one more. One uh, now there's like a com combination of the two types before. Um, same thing. I've got a, an object here with some input values. And I want to loop across that. Uh, and not only do I want the individual object, but I want to have the index for that object as well. So uh, it, it's very useful. So you know, I find uh, when we're doing VMs and network um, setups, you know, to loop through a lot of these configurations that we pass in, that this is very useful. It makes it quite nice and easy. Uh, always make it sort of part of some of the naming, the zone one, zone two, etc. Now we can do other things. So we can actually tell our bicep template, you know, what sort of scope we're dealing with. So by default, when we try to define a resource or uh, use a module, and when we deploy it, it'll go to the current resource group. So when we deploy something to Azure, we always have to specify a resource group name because we're using the deploy group create. Okay, so by default, this is going to go to that same resource group that we specified. But we can actually, with Biosip, it's much easier than in the, the um, JSON to deploy things to other resource groups. So it's, you can change the scope, use the resource group function, and give it the name of that resource group. Pretty cool, much easier. So you can actually deploy things across multiple resource groups from one template, uh, you know, because you might want to keep your databases in one place versus the um, the application because of some RBAC that you want to add to that resource group, you know, all sorts of reasons why you want to do that. And this makes it way easier. Uh, and then we can actually go through and, and do the same thing, but even further than different resource groups, we can go to different um, subscriptions, which is also really cool. So you can actually deploy uh, to your uh, disaster recovery subscription or even later we can see different tenant. Then, uh, you know, it's, it's quite nice to do that all from one place. Much, much easier. And uh, so here again, sort of I, another version of what we saw before is that by the uh, at the top of the template, we can completely change the scope to go uh, to subscription level resources uh, instead of uh, resource group level resources. And I can actually go and create resources in this case as well, and more you know, storage accounts, VMs, apps, etc. So we have a lot of power available. So even on the tenant level, so we can go and deploy, uh, I've got a, a management group template here to a particular tenant. Uh, you know, policies and all the other things that we want to have um, in terms of governance for our subscription or our tenant, sorry, we can do that as well. It's all very easy, very nice and simple now. And uh, one sort of interesting thing with sort of changed the way I do my ARM templates now is, um, this comes from the Microsoft Docs actually, to, is to use config maps. So normally we'd pump in a lot of parameters for each environment. So you might have a parameters.dev.json file. So it's called the development environment specific values that we want to use in terms of scale or performance tiers. And then we have another one for testing, production, so forth. But uh, an alternative way of doing that is to actually sort of have those values or those performance figures um, inside of a, a BICEP template for the different environments. So we define the values for a web app, the SKU for a web app in production, and same for staging and same for development. And in our code, what we do is, so we, we as an input parameter, we say which environment we want to work with. And then when we create a resource, uh, when we say looking at the SKU name, we can just index into our config map for that particular environment name and get the uh, web app SKU name, which is cool. And I think there's a typo here, Sky, but you know, I'm not going to run this one. But you get the idea. So it's, it's quite nice. It's nice and easy to follow. You can see everything. It's quite cool. All right, so that's the basics of ARM templates. There's uh, sort of bicep templates, all the programming constructs you want. Uh, we can do loops, conditionals, modules, and, and changing the scope. This is quite cool. All right. So what is Azure Bicep not? You know, what does it not do? <laughs> um, so it, it's not a full con configuration management tool. It's, it's really just responsible for provisioning resources in Azure and then that's it. You know, there's no further configuration after that. So if we spin up a VM, we don't get to then say what software to install and rules and policies to apply to that that VM. You know, that's those. There's other tools available for that. But you know, so things like Chef and Puppet, etc., uh, they are definitely the sort of full-fledged configuration management tools. And some of them even do cloud uh, infrastructure provisioning as well. But uh, yeah, in my opinion, it's sort of the bicep is sort of a, a, an ARM template. It's a much nicer tool to use in some of those. 
but you know your mileage might vary uh if if the best tool for the job is usually the one you know the best as well so um you know no problem using those tools at all so i'm going to compare bicep with terraform and pulumi the ones that i've used a fair bit in the past and uh, i sort of summed it all up in in one big big table now what sets azure bicep apart from terraform and pulumi is you know, things like state management where Azure Bicep has access to the live state of your resources in Azure. Whereas uh, Terraform and Pulumi, they actually manage that state outside of Azure by themselves. And there's a whole lot of good reasons for that, you know, um, applying uh, when config configuration drift comes into play, someone's been messing around with the resources in, in the portal, then we can have this known state that we want things to be in and we can use that to then correct that drift and bring everything back into um, what we need it to be. Now, Azure Bison can do the same as a declarative uh, template. So this is how things needs to be, but uh, it live queries the states rather than managing it outside. And uh, the, uh, the the way that Pulumi does that is very similar to Terraform as well, but the way that they offer it is a little bit different. So by default, Pulumi has a managed service, so they do that for you out of the box. So if you have an account, that state is stored in the Pulumi services for you. Whereas with Terraform, it's usually st stored locally, but you can store that in cloud or elsewhere with some of their uh, other SaaS options. But you have to pay for that, so it's not just free out of the box. Um, Bicep is a DSL for itself. Terraform, HCL, which is a HashiCorp configuration language. Again, dedicated uh, way of doing things. It's quite nice, quite simple. It's extremely popular. Uh, also, where I work, everyone loves using Terraform. Uh, I'm currently trying to convince everyone to use Bicep. We'll see how that goes. Um, <laughs> and uh, then there's Pulumi, but it's different. It's using our common programming languages to, to get the job done. So they support a whole lot of them, C-sharp, F-sharp, JavaScript, TypeScript, Go, Python. And you can do some really complicated stuff that you may not actually be able to do easily with Bicep or Terraform. But uh, it just, yeah. Uh, uh, even though I've had a great success with it, it is actually a little bit harder to learn and get used to it. There's a few quirks in there, especially when it comes to wiring up the outputs to inputs of other resources where I, th I found Pulumi, which is a little bit hard to get, get sorted for me. But um, th these are all th awesome options. They differ a little bit in uh, the way that the projects are managed. So we can have modules in both Azure Bicep and Terraform, but in Pulumi, it's sort of it's a code project. So they're sort of like monolithic applications or deployment applications or, or micro projects, it depends on the size, but um, it's specific to that stack that you're trying to work with. It's a, little, it's a lot harder to reuse the Pulumi stuff uh, compared to what we can with Bicep and Terraform. Uh, Multi-cloud is a big thing for some people, but it doesn't all really matter too much. Now, I think the best tool for the job is the, the cloud provider specific tool to use. Uh, it's just, yeah, if you want to use something like Terraform to go multi-cloud, you will actually need to be skilled up in both clouds to know what you, you can do. It's not going to magically solve that problem for you. But uh, some people just like to see that it's a tool that's multi-cloud. Um, now, the support is provided by each of the respecting companies, Microsoft, HashiCorp, Pulumi. Um, but even though uh, with Terraform, you can deploy your resources into Azure. If something goes wrong, you have to go to HashiCorp for support. Microsoft might support you directly, um, You know, depending on a bunch of stuff, I guess. But they're all open source, which is great. You can see how the things work under the covers and, and contribute for in different ways. So yeah, go go and uh, have fun with that. It's really cool. Now the last one, the learning curve uh, measurement is totally subjective. I just made this up for what I feel like. Uh, your your view on that might be different. So uh, for me, spending a lot of time in ARM with Jason, uh, getting into bicep was super easy. So you know, there's no learning curve there for me. But uh, Terraform and Pulumi was a little bit more work to get used to. So how do we really use Bicep uh, properly? Uh, well, first you have to start by installing the tools. Uh, you can do that with the CLI or PowerShell and you can you know, choose your, your flavor there, doesn't matter. Uh, if you wanna use it with the, the CLI, it's not already on there and you just go AZ Bicep install and when there's an update, you can just run AZ Bicep upgrade. And you can run all this stuff in your DevOps pipeline. So Azure DevOps and, and GitHub uh, Actions or GitHub workflows you can use the, to do all your work as well. So I'll just go and show you another uh, quick demo. And 
might have to cut it short because I think we're running a little low on time. Um, so I have a bunch of stuff in here. One of them is called a full stack web application. And inside of here, I've got a whole bunch of stuff. So I've got a key vault, there's a database, there's a storage account, uh, I've got two, may have been by accident, um, and then actual web app itself. So I've spent a bit of time uh, crafting up this application, I've got a whole bunch of inputs, and I always want to have project names, environment names, and tags you know, for billing and sort of other discover discoverability purposes, you know, all the allowed inputs, and then I go and define my resources. So I've got log analytics, app insights, uh, which then here, oh, this is one I haven't pointed out before, is in ARM templates, you have to always have the depends on property to say how the re resources relate to each other so that it can work out the most optimal way uh, and the dependencies uh, of how to deploy your, your template. So you can't, you know, chicken and egg problem, you know, deploy a database before there's a server, it just won't work. So if you put the dependencies there, it'll deploy the server and then the database. And you know this is what's happening here. So it, just by reusing this object, that resource, that implicitly creates that dependency for us, which is really cool. And uh, so as it goes on, there's a whole bunch of stuff here, just defining a web application like normal um, and uh, adding key vault secrets, uh, policies there. Oh, what have I got? A whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, I might even actually adding some R back here so we can use, um, turn on AD authentication between our, my application and Azure Monitor, which is cool. So you can't just uh, spam the telemetry using the instrumentation key. You must actually come from that application. So Microsoft, uh, Azure will make sure the app is authenticated with uh, Azure Monitor, and it, only that app can send stuff to Azure Monitor, which is quite nice. Um, so what I want to do is to actually deploy that app and just let it run while I move on to the next bit. So if I go da, 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 I'm not on Linux anymore. So I want to go to registries, and then I want to deploy web app. <laughs> this all works still. <laughs> um, so I've created just a PowerShell file, the same uh, deal as before, create a resource group, and then go, let me show you, and, and create the deployment. So I've got the, the template file here, just given the resource group a name, uh, and some input parameters, and that should be, Good to go. So it'll take a couple of minutes and uh, we'll come back to this uh, shortly. Now, what I mentioned earlier, DevOps, big part of what we do every day, just to show you that it is uh, totally uh, nice and easy to do in, say, GitHub Actions, uh, GitHub Workflows. Uh, here's one workflow I have set up for this application. We can go and run a, a job here to uh, lint or you know, apply the linting rules to our bicep template file. We just do that simply by running the AZ bicep build uh, command and, and giving them that file. So that will actually run against the, what configuration we have in our folder to you know, say, hey, are you following best practices or not? You know, like hard-coded strings or passwords and inputs, uh, or if you have a secure input with a default value, that might not be allowed, uh, or even outputting a secure value that, you know, that'll fail that sort of best practice step here for you. Then, you know, we can go and validate the template, compare, it, the sort of resource that we're trying to deploy with uh, into a resource group. And uh, the magic is sort of down here. Instead of uh, create, we're using the validate keyword on that same template. So we'll just do like name checks and see if it all complies and it will be uh, good to go. And then after that, we apply another one called what if. So this is where actually we want to see what changes are we going to be applying to our existing resources in Azure if you run this step. And it's sort of like the Terraform uh, um, plan, I think, when it shows you what you're going to do, uh, what's going to change if you run this deployment. So this is the equivalent for uh, Azure ARM. And here's just a step for deploying the application. I'll skip that part. And then the final one here is to deploy the actual infrastructure. So it's just a little bit more complicated than the other ones because I'm actually doing it all by hand. Uh, I'm not reusing some of the available GitHub actions. But then, yeah, just for demonstration purposes that you can actually do it all with the CLI and output some of those uh, values from the template. Um, the magic here is just that, that sort of dash dash query properties.output. So I want to get the outputs from the template and write them to GitHub um, 
my actions or sorry, my my job so I can reuse that later in further down in the workflow. I think which is uh, down here. You know, we can ignore the problems that we had there. It's a bit hard with this. Um, oh, here. So here I am uh, reusing some of the outputs from the template in the step where I'm actually uploading the function app to a storage account with the uh, run from package setting enabled. So yeah, let's have a look and see. Oh, we have an error here deploying our application. Mm -mm -mm. Conflicting error, a vault the same. Oh, somehow I have a key vault with the same name somewhere else. Well, that's okay. We can move on from that. We'll get back to a different example. So, cool. How do you buy set? Uh, yeah, we can definitely go and write the templates, you know, create a, a workflow with GitHub Actions. You know, here's some of the basic commands. Uh, sorry, first one is a buy set build, and then we can have AZ deploy group validate to make sure all the naming and resource types are correct, uh, and then run a what if to see. We can actually use the what if step to, to go, hey, uh, there's a manual check or approval check here on the step to see are we changing the right resources? You know, someone else can uh, check that PR for us and say, uh, "Oh, you're you're dropping the database." You know, please explain. You know, we don't want that to happen. Um, and so that's what what if is really good for, and just to see any sort of configuration changes, all that. So you can uh, put of a subjective check there to make sure what's going out is actually what you want to happen, rather than after the fact go, "Oh, configuration is missing," or "We lost the database." Uh, that will definitely make it easier for us to to spot it. Then uh, also just the final one, just to you know, deploy the actual template uh, AZ deployment group create uh, with all the parameters. Cool. And if we open up uh, our GitHub workflow, you can check the, the actions tab. This is what we would see. So I created the dependencies there uh, initially to, to build the app and to uh, check for best practices and validate the resources. And after that, run the what if, deploy the application, oh, sorry, deploy the infrastructure first and then the application, all green ticks exactly what you'll want to see all the time. Cool. Now, the next awesome feature I'm going to talk about is private registries. And what they let us do is to, um, in our file, in our BICEP files, we can actually reuse other BICEP files because each BICEP file essentially is a module. And then these modules can go into a registry. And what we can do with that is just, if we have a complicated application or a set of resources, um, then we can reuse them much easier. So we can encapsulate it all. And we can actually use tagging uh, to do our versioning, just like the Azure Container Registry, you know, used to putting our container images in there. It's just using the, the open container uh, image format. So we can actually store anything in ACR that we want. And in this case, why not store BICEP module files in there, which is pretty cool. Um, so I'll jump back to the demos there real quick. And uh, we'll see here, I have a registries file. I did actually go and create a, a container registry already with a BICEP file. And I'll quickly show you that, that registry. And I'll just call it very appropriately, BICEP flex registry. You go in there, I can go and look at my repositories. And you can see I've already uploaded a whole bunch of modules. So I've got a full stack app, I've got a key vault, um, database storage, another storage, and, and a web app. So for instance, if I open up the, the web app one, I've got different tags, different versions of that web app. Cool. But why is that so useful? Um, I'll go back to the code real quick. And I'll go to this full stack web app. And a whole bunch of inputs at the start, but we can move over and see here, I'm creating an application by reusing the modules that are stored in the container registry using this special notation. So. Uh, BR, that's sort of the, the schema we're defining for um, the, the um, ACR, what we want to use. We specify the Azure actual repository itself, so bicepflex.azurecr.io, and then the path towards that module that we want with the version tag, which is cool. So uh, in this case, we want to specify version 1.2. But what's really cool as well is that if we take these uh, properties out or if we start from scratch, we actually get IntelliSense as well. Even though it's stored back in a registry in Azure, uh, it actually restores that, that module onto my local machine, the local cache, and, and interprets that just as if it was a file on my local machine. And then we get the IntelliSense, which is so cool. Uh, really nice. So we can have, as a team, for instance, 
uh, doing a lot of cloud uh, adoption framework work, have all our BICEP modules stored in a registry, and then we can pick and choose uh, which modules we need and orchestrate a deployment to a, uh, a subscription or a tenant with that, super easy. And I've gone here, I'm just referencing modules for all the different things I want in this application. Cool. Now, uh, with that demo of the one that failed before, pretty much have the same thing, um, but I want to deploy it from the registry. What's different here is nothing. It's exactly the same way to deploy it. It's just that how it references the application, or sorry, references the modules is what's different. So I'll let that run, and uh, it's going to do the same thing, and we might come back to it a little bit later. But that's it. So we can actually reuse all of our modules, we pick and choose them, apply our best practices, and, and yeah, it's a whole lot easier. You don't have to have everything on one machine to get the job done. Thanks. Cool. So just an overview, like if you do want to have a, a proper workflow with the registries, it's very similar to how you would do it with containers. But you know, you have uh, the, the dev team do some work, uh, commit the work into the Git repository. We want to run that uh, validation and linting rules that we had uh, seen earlier. But more importantly is also, if I want to store a whole bunch of resources or templates in the registry, I want to make sure that they really, really work. So you want to run a type of smoke test on them. Now, this is where things vary a lot. You know, every service or every resource you're going to have to test differently. You have to come up with a whole bunch of uh, different ways of, of, of implementing these. So if it's a web app, you might want to use something like K6 to do a quick load test or a spoke test on that. Uh, if it's a database or a storage account, uh, if you've enabled uh, or disabled public access, try and access the application and also try and access that storage account and see if it works or not. Uh, and then you know, pass or fail the test. Cool. And then you can go and merge the code and publish it to your Azure Container Registry. Nice and simple, but the really hard bit in here, it will be the smoke testing bit. So um, hopefully now that the, the sort of ACR and the private registries is a, is a real thing, we're going to see some cool examples of uh, how we're going to do some real test-driven development with uh, ARM templates or BICEP templates. So definitely looking forward to that. And just a way to, to publish our templates to the ACR, I forgot to show you this in the demo, we just run the BICEP, publish, the module file name, and then the target container registry with a version tag. So you can upload those uh, templates uh, or modules quite easily. Cool. Uh, pros and cons. Let's see. There might be a few. Uh, a pro for me, but there's no state management in BICEP. Um, there's uh, definitely a problem with that. that sort of live state uh, that we get to use is not very accurate. So sometimes it gives you a couple of weird results, but I'm sure that's going to get better and better over time. We have a simpler programming syntax compared to the old JSON uh, format. Uh, there's a visualizer in VS Code, but it doesn't really work that well when we try and visualize a, um, I'm going to try this one here with web app. Click this little icon here. And it should work it out for us. Here we go. And we can see all the resources that we're trying to provision. But if we try and do that with one that is using a whole lot of modules, let me just clean this up, make some more room. We only see modules. It's, it's not really giving us the full architecture of the application and, and all the relationships, relationships between the resources. Yeah, maybe one day this will work a little bit better where it sort of expands out a bit nicer. But uh, that still, that's OK. Uh, it is a con, but it's not that bad. We can change our scoping so we can have one template that can work at all different levels of Azure. A big thing that's missing, the active choice is not to bring user-defined functions from ARM templates into BICEP. So it's one thing they didn't bring over. But if you listen to the reasoning, it actually makes a lot of sense. You want to not have some really crazy dynamic logic in there. You want things to be very declarative. So that's probably why they decided to, to drop that. Uh, modularity is great. We've got modules. It's easy to reuse code. Uh, makes a whole lot of sense and uh, sort of reduces your workload a lot. Um, there's no resource provider aliases. Oh, yeah, I was going to get to this. Uh, so those long resource provider names, like this one here, yeah, this is still not very pretty. Well, hopefully one day they can make this look a little bit nicer. But uh, yeah, we live with it for now. But I think that's one thing that can definitely be improved. Validation, awesome. So we can make sure whatever we deploy uh, should work pretty much every time, but not always. 
Uh, parameter files, if you want to have a parameter file that inputs into a bicep file, it's still a JSON format, which is unfortunate. We have registries, a really cool feature. And uh, hopefully in the next few days, there'll be a public registry provided by Microsoft. But yeah, wait and see what that's going to look like. Trying to get keys and configuration or connection strings from resources in a bicep file is a little bit ugly. It's not as easy as you'd expect, but uh, well, it's no different to doing it in the ARM template, the JSON templates. But uh, again, I wish it was a little bit nicer. Uh, to, to, to get that done. Now, Microsoft says this is totally supported, day zero support. So anything you can do with the ARM JSON templates, you can do with BICEP. So all the stuff that was announced recently at uh, Ignite, we can actually deploy them with BICEP straight away. We don't have to wait for Terraform or Pulumi or whoever to build in support to, uh, to provide those resources, which is quite, quite nice. Uh, one dirty thing is that it's hard to discover modules that are in a, a repository. So um, hopefully, you know, it's early days. They will improve that over time as well. So you have to actually know what's in that container registry to be able to reference it and actually know what it does. There's nothing that lets you dig into it and see what's actually in there yet. Um, and the cool thing is you can actually take your old, old um, JSON templates and convert them into BICEP, which is really nice. There's a cool tool for that. It's just uh, AZ, decompile, give it a file name, and it does a conversion for you, which is really nice. But here's some useful links. I'm going to put all my code all the slides up on my GitHub uh, repository. Uh, you can sort of capture that link and I'll put it in the comments as well. Here's a whole bunch of links to Azure Bicep on GitHub, Microsoft Learn, uh, the Architecture Center, which you can go and find some really cool template the architectures to deploy. And some of them are in Bicep already. Um, and there's also the Bicep Playground, which you can sort of use to turn your uh, Bicep templates into ARM or ARM into Bicep. And yeah, this is a nice little tool to play around with. So just to sum everything up, uh, KISS by design. So by, I think is still very simple. It's much easier to use than uh, um, JSON. Um, it definitely has a very nice improvement in the programming syntax. And it saved me a lot of time. You know, I'm a big fan of this one. Less keystrokes is much better. Uh, and regi registries are awesome. We're going to definitely use a lot of this. And uh, you know, there's more coming because we're not even at version one of BICEP yet. And uh, now infrastructure as code is fun again. Yay. Thank you very much, everybody. <laughs> Thank you, William. That was excellent. Uh, well done. Um, I just have a couple of quick questions. Um, yes, sir. We have a few minutes. So the first question uh, is from Ryan on YouTube, but I'm just going to expand it a bit because it's the host's prerogative. Um, the question was, <laughs> can you use .NET libraries from Bicep? Um, but I guess to expand that a bit, is there a sort of a library story behind Bicep, with Bicep, oh. other than the modules you've talked about, is there any you know, libraries to use it or to, you know? That's a great question. I, I think the answer is probably going to be no, because they don't have the, the user-defined functions feature. Yeah. Uh, I think because they want to limit it to be very declarative and not move towards that sort of uh, uh, imperative the programming style model, right? Um, I think the answer is going to be no, but, you know, happy to be wrong. Uh, it would be hard for me to see what benefit there is really, but it, it might actually violate that KISS principle that I, I mentioned. Mm. But uh, yeah, we'll wait and see. <laughs> could, they could do anything, right? <laughs> the, well, that's right. I mean, and, and that actually brings me on to the next question, I guess. You said it's, you, you know, it's not at 1.0 yet uh, and we're waiting yep. to see in, in some respects. So I guess the, the big question, the $64 million question, would you use it in production? Is it, is it ready or are we still waiting? I'm using it, yes, for sure. Microsoft is supporting go. it already. So since version 0.4, I think. Um, cool. Yeah, so I'm using it already. It, it works great. Uh, okay. No complaints. Uh, look, the, the things that are missing is only the, maybe the programming uh, uh, experience, but in terms of capabilities, all that's working. It's, it's beautiful. Okay, and so then the next sort of the final, I guess, money question. Uh, if I'm... Uh, I'm at work and I've got a bunch of ARM templates I've written and I've invested lots of hours in. Uh, how do I essentially sell this rewrite? Even though I know you said I can decompile it. <laughs> how much quicker is everything going to get if I use Bicep versus ARM templates going forward? Is it oh, worth right. that conversion? The conversion may not be absolutely necessary because I think the big time saver is from the authoring experience, right? So if you have a bunch of ARM templates that work and they don't need change, then don't, yeah. don't bother changing it. I guess if you do need to go back and make some changes, the conversion should be fairly straightforward. You may have to do some cleanup, a couple of things. I mean, it's not always perfect, but yeah. 
when you have a reason to do it, try it out. I, I, it's, it's a good experience, uh, in my opinion, so far. So, yeah, really happy with that. But if you don't need to, don't worry. It's not going to change the speed things get deployed at, at all. Okay, that's good to know. And I guess because it is ARM under the covers, right? So ARM's not going anywhere. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Correct. Yes. Cool. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we hmm. thank you. We now get this weird transition where William transitions from being a speaker to a host because he's <laughs> hanging around, uh, and we're very happy to have you. But uh, <laughs> we are we're going to. Do I have to go away now? I can't remember. I have to no, see the run sheet. I, I, everything's turned off, away. so I don't know what's happening. Cool. You I'll just stay, stay here. here. <laughs> uh, and we're going to bring in Lars, and you and I both get a bit of a surprise because I have no idea where Lars is, but he has threatened to not be at his desk. So. Uh, I guess we'll just Okey wait dokey. and find out together. Um, Lars, for those of you who don't know, is someone in the country. Hey, it's Roaming Lars. Hello. Hello. I am, uh, Hello. I'm, I'm not at my desk. That's right. I'm, I'm not at my desk because oh, I thought we needed a bit of a change and it's such a lovely day outside that I thought we'd go and say hello to these girls. So just something that's not tech. Actually, I'm going to make it tech related, but see if they come over. There we go. This is not a recording, right? This is live. <laughs> this is live. I'm just walking here. Um, this is very live. Hello, girls. Well, we practiced it very well. <laughs> is, is, yeah, is, I know. This, I had a, uh, is this your neighbors or is this your property? Wait, well, it's my is... paddock, but they're actually okay. a neighbor's llamas. And they right. usually come over. <laughs> come on. Here we go. Look at them all. Yeah, they're they all got up because they know. See, I've got mum mums here. Num nums. Mm -hmm. so, come on, girls. Mm -hmm. But. It's not all just llamas. Well, it is all llamas, isn't it? But That's I think we can probably make a tech connection here, really. Come on. Is it electric fence? Is, is it, I was going to say, is it electric fence? <laughs> is that how we're going to do it? It is actually, but it's not on because llamas I, are easy. They don't, they I, don't go out. Can I SMS a number and give you a shot? Is that how this works? <laughs> well, we could. No, let's not do that. Um, so here they all are. That's the, that's the girls. That's the herd. Say hello, girls. They're like, what? Mm -hmm. um, oh, they don't want to eat today. There we go. They're just very curious animals. But I thought I'd just make a tech connection to this because they're all here. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't intend <laughs> – sorry, this one has grass on its ear and looks ridiculous. <laughs> um, I, didn't, I didn't intend to, to have llamas. Like, I'm a nerd, right? I'm not a farmer. I, I work mm -hmm. in software development or training now. Hello. But everybody loves llamas. Like, who doesn't love llamas? So what mm -hmm. happened was that I, I – we got the land and the neighbor asked, hey, can I put my llamas in there? Yeah, sure, whatever. And it just kind of took off because everybody loves, loves llamas. So I thought I needed to learn some more about Azure. And um, I set up this project that I, I, I call a llama cam. And it was a way for me not only to share llamas with the world, but I actually have a whole lot of knowledge about Azure media services now because I stream everything through, well, Azure media services, the, the llama cam stuff. So it's like just another... Yeah. And I usually use this as an example of, hey, if, if, you don't, if you want to learn a technology, there's nothing better than finding a project that is sort of either makes you laugh or, or makes you curious or share something with the world, right? So yeah. these guys, I mean, the girls don't know they're on the internet, but I don't <laughs> think they care. <laughs> they're no, just looking at Absolutely. Me having, having some kind of side project to force you to learn mm -hmm. something or, or work on something. Um, yeah. Or even committing to do a conference talk about a subject you don't know about. <laughs> Not that I know. It's exactly. a real thing. <laughs> yeah. It's a real thing. Conference-driven yep, development. Yep. There you go. For those looking, yeah, conference. <laughs> that's very true. <laughs> For those people that don't know, it's uh, it's very very common to write the abstract and then forget about it and then go, oh, there's two weeks till I have to do the conference. So, yeah, um, that's not unusual. So that's anyway, I'll deep. share them. Do you get a lot of llama drama, given that you're not a farmer? Oh, man. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm the llama must... drama farmer. Llama. I just had to get that out. I've been thinking about something. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they're very cool. So these are very easy. Um, there's another herd up the back. But, um, yeah, this – and it's actually not far because my office is right there. Uh, there. Uh, there we go. In the water there. tank. Just. <laughs> yep, that's it. Uh, there. This gimbling is hard. <laughs> Uh -huh. But yeah, that's so I just sit in there before. So I just walked out here and they're right here. So, um, this is I my think I almost saw the Windows XP heel behind you. The that is side. the one. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's actually up there. Uh, yeah, it's a bit, it's behind the trees, but yeah, there is, it looks a bit like Windows XP. <laughs> yeah, that's right. If I'd have known, I'd have taken my uh, camera outside and shown you, uh, I don't know. 
<laughs> my my yard I'm trying to grow grass. Yeah, suburbs. That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but thank you, Starlink. This is all possible, right? Mm. Yeah, it's been working well. Yeah. So I'm I just going to change um, my arm. I don't quite understand how yeah. it's supposed to work because don't they constantly move around the world? But... Come to my talk at four o'clock and I'll tell you. <laughs> well, where else would I wow. be? <laughs> <in this> <laughs> smooth. <laughs> yep. So um, now I can't see the YouTube comments while I'm here, but if you've got questions about llamas, go for it. <laughs> I usually get a few uh, questions. Um, the, but no, uh, they don't the, spit. Yeah, so far, no questions on llamas. But, uh, <laughs> People just like, what is going on? Why yeah. is this guy showing llamas? There's a few, a few they... puns. Oh, they're all looking at you now, or looking at yeah. us, I guess. And very oh. expected. <laughs> what, what do you reckon, What are girls? they for? What are they for? Like, yeah. What are they, you know, do, do you do you shear them and make jumpers? Or not you, but the neighbors? Do you shear them and make yeah. jumpers? Or? So, so he doesn't do much with this group here. Uh, there's no male in here. There's a male in the other paddock. So we keep getting new llamas, which mm. occasionally show up on llama camp. Um, but, you know, the, the, apparently the first crop of wool is the best wool you can do. I don't know. I don't know anything about llamas um, okay. as such. Me neither. Sorry, about llama farming. Llama facts, <laughs> go for it. Um, <laughs> so, and occasionally the, there would be males that jump out and apparently they become lunch for lions, I've been told. So right. that's the, the less, less glamorous side of area or? Yeah, yeah, just over the hill. Yeah. You know, there's a zoo. It's a zoo not far away. Lion, lion cave. So, yeah. <laughs> What's well, good? This is right. this is good, you know. The, the petting zoo in the conference is a it's been a trend in the last few years. So mm. I'm glad that we could uh, we could do this virtually as well. Yeah, for sure. It, it's it's kind of interesting. So I have it's it's llamacam.com that are you if you want to go and have a look. I think actually it yeah, it turns off in about twenty five minutes. Uh, because reasons, but um, <laughs> okay. I want to use it. Out, right? <laughs> well, because I get, yeah, I get, I get a like a motion notification every time there's a llama in front of it in my on my like internal system thing, and I want to use that so that I can met, you know promote it or say push notifications or whatever. And then someone said, yeah, "But why don't you uh, have a thing so when you donate a dollar on whatever llamas or dot org or something, it feeds mm -hmm. them?" I'm like, "Oh yeah," <laughs> but that's a lot harder because. There's, there's 12 acres of paddock. So if there's no llamas, a lot of the time, people go, oh, that's boring. So, yeah. yeah, we'll see. That's a lot of Ethernet cable to, to get to. <laughs> no, no, I have I have about 35 acres covered in Wi-Fi. It'll be fine. Cool. Hmm. I, have, I barely have four bedrooms covered in Wi-Fi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, lockdowns and stuff, what else do you do when you're stuck on a farm? So, and a nerd. I don't want to do farming. No. Probably. No. Ah. Well, speaking oh, of websites, what else we got? Well, yeah. I was just going to tell everybody to go and uh, register for the competition if they haven't already at expo.ndcsydney.com. Good plan. Um, All right, I'll join you in just a sec. Got? All right. <laughs> Thank you. Just coming back. <laughs> uh, heading back I inside, we, I guess. Um, yeah, I think we've got a the quiz we're, coming we're up. Four minutes to kill. Uh, quiz is a bit later, I think, isn't it? That's at uh, three forty-five. Oh yeah, all right, cool. What have we got next? <laughs> oh yes, I see. I just got the the, the schedule back up. Uh, yeah, so I'm just gonna wait for the web a... sockets to synchronize everything. That's right, and then we've got uh, Brooke, our next speaker. But uh, yeah, cool. So I'm just looking at the comments there. Someone asked if there was a way to convert arm to bicep. Yes. Um, this is a command. Matt Wicks posted the the answer there. AZ bicep decompile and then the file name. Uh, you can also use the bicep playground website to, to do that for you as well. Um, That's cool. Yeah, just how, for how good's the how good's the decompilation? Like in terms of you know, does it make code that you would have written, or is it a bit you know complicated? Oh, it's good. It's quite code. good. Yeah, because uh, I think that, that the scope of how they want you to do things is is fairly uh, straightforward. You know, you can't do too many crazy things. So then when it decompiles something from ARM template, it'll be pretty usable. Like there are sometimes just naming and a couple of links that you have to change. But for the most part, it's, it's, it's totally usable as is. Yeah, That's pretty good. Mm. Welcome back, Lars. Yeah, very happy. Uh, can Lars hear us? Muted. I don't know. <laughs> I can hear you. Oh, yeah. Oh, he's <laughs> playing. <laughs> Sorry, there was a slight freeze uh, and I went. 
it's always good to prove that these things are real. But yeah, no. if, if this was pre-recorded, <laughs> surely we would have pre-recorded some better material. Yeah, well, exactly right. So, no, it's um. Oh, we're gonna see the Windows XP last. Tim saying that's very true. I'll take a picture later and put it on Twitter. How about that? I think it's yeah. a good day for it. Mm. I don't know. I assume it was producer Landon who was changing your name throughout that whole segment, but it was a very, very good job. Uh, so <laughs> there's there's a team of people behind the scenes trying to make fun of Lars. It's going well. <laughs> That's my job. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's um. Uh, what have we got? We got five minutes. All right. So I'm going to look at. Okay, there's no questions on YouTube, which means we can talk about what we want. Hey. Now, hey. I had a little, because there was a question early on YouTube, so humor me here, lovely people, about how the sausage is made, as in how do we make mm -hmm. all this happen, right? Because when you see oh. a live stream, you know, you sort of go, oh, that's nice. And it's, it's today's running really well. I haven't been on mute once even, <laughs> you know. But the, so, the, so I thought I'll just give an insight into how all of this works. Um, Great because idea. there's quite a lot of people involved to make this look as good as it does. Um, so first of all, we have StreamYard. StreamYard is a web product. So you go to StreamYard.com and it's a way that you can share a single link with a presenter. They click on it and they're in your, you know, stream back channel, essentially. So there's a in the broadcast studio, studio, I think they call it. Broadcast studio. Yep. Yep. That'll do. So there's a producer for StreamYard that can see everybody. So they can see all the people that are currently logged in. They can see all the assets. So that's all the overlays and all the videos that show up, the sponsor videos and all this. And they click all the right buttons at the right time. Super important. So mm -hmm. there's two of those, two producers. Um, there's someone. So obviously we're here talking to you. Um, but then there's also, um, you know, making sure that speakers are there to start when when we're ready and we talk here in like, you know, five minutes, Brooke's going to be on, for example. Um, we got to make sure. Oh, and no, I didn't drop out. Oh, it's a bit jerky, jerky. You're getting choppy. So I don't yeah. know if I'm, oh, choppy, choppy. Anyway, I, bl I blame Elon. Um, there's also like a whole run sheet. So we know exactly what's happening at all times, who's doing what. That's really important because otherwise we step on each other's toes or someone doesn't show up, whatever. Um, then there's one person that sort of ties everything together for this live stream. Remember, there's three other rooms as well, but for the live stream mm -hmm. um, to make sure that, you know, all the videos are do looking good and that, the you know, we get we show the sponsor videos enough times and we note all the prize winners and that the, the Slido thing is working. There's all those things. Um, and of course, there's the whole NDC team because the three of us and Aaron don't work for NDC, right? We do this because we love it. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a whole NDC team that you haven't seen that sits behind the scenes and do all the other things as well. Um, so it's a big operation. Um, there's a lot to mm -hmm. it. It is. And you bring up a very good point, Lars, about the sponsors because uh, we wouldn't be able to do this without them. Uh, in some extent. So uh, I think we should probably let them have a few minutes of time. Sounds good. We don't want to sell technology for the sake of just selling technology. It needs to solve a business problem. There's a number of different ways in which you can technically create a solution, make something work. But if with the wrong attitude, with the wrong mindset, um, technology will not solve the problem. The technology kind of happens in the background, but it really is about attitude and aptitude. The most important thing in bringing purpose to technology is the people. It comes down to communication and relationship building and having that mutual respect with your customer. If we as a team, uh, as individuals, are building solutions that's moving people forward, that's helping uh, make people's lives better. Bringing purpose to humanity through technology. That really drives home to my heart through personal experiences. Puts a smile on your face to be able to put a smile on your customer's face. And that makes me feel really proud, uh, not just of my team, but also proud of, of our company.
I love running this company. I love running it because uh, of the people I deal with. There's such a great team of people. From a career perspective, it's the best move I ever did. Being a great consultant, which we are, this is W, is half-half between technical skills and communication. It's given me the opportunity to work with lots of different types of technology and explore some stuff that I maybe only dabbled in at university or before. SSW is a company that makes enterprise software solutions uh, and that's what we do. We build software for clients uh, on demand. We build bespoke solutions using the latest technology and the latest best practices. I've been involved in the development of some mining software, been involved in the development of software for a legal firm and everything in between there. Even in just under two years, I've been working across so many different projects it's just a really great place to come into and I always look forward to coming to work. Are you an engineer looking to impact millions of Australians? We're looking for big thinkers, problem solvers and challenge seekers to help us engineer the future of banking. ComBank Engineering. Do you have what it takes? Search engineering at ComBank. Hello, everybody. We're back. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Brooke Jameson, and uh, I think Brooke is online. So if we can bring Brooke into the view. Hi, Brooke, how are you doing? Hi, a tough act to follow with the llamas, but I'll do my best. <laughs> uh, look, I, I just had a read of the, the talk abstract, and uh, the title is uh, How to Become a Tech Conference Speaker. And the, the abstract is very inspirational. I think, uh, I wish I probably would have had the advice that you're going to give you know a few years ago when i started getting into this uh it seems really cool uh i think we're going to have a lot of takeaways from this uh today um and but brooke where where are you based in in australia are you in melbourne brisbane sydney um, i'm in brisbane currently in this gray box which does not symbolize brisbane at all but yes up in queensland <laughs> it looks more like melbourne gray weather <laughs> yeah no i'm not wearing all black that's how you can tell Ah, cool. Now, Brooke, I'm looking forward to this talk. So, you know, the, the show is all yours. Perfect. Um, I'll just swap over to my slide tab. Cool. Great. And we'll get started. Um, so, like I said earlier in the chat as well, please leave comments um, and questions along the way that I will get to at the end. Um, and first of all, I would just like to take some time to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm broadcasting from today. Um, I don't normally show this map, but I wasn't sure how international the audience would be today. So this is a map of different Aboriginal language groups across Australia. So the language groups and the cultural or clan groups are a little bit different, but this at least shows you more about what's going on. So um, I'd like to acknowledge the Yagara and Turrbal people who are the traditional owners of the land that I'm broadcasting from today. And as you can see here, I put a little circle around Brisbane but you can really see how rich this heritage is in Australia. And if this isn't something that you know about, definitely take some time to look into it because there's such a rich history here. And I think that's something that Australia really could and should share more with the world. Oh, and I've lost my tab, but we're back. Cool. Um, so how to become a tech conference speaker. And so what I'll do today is I'll talk through a little bit more about why I'm doing this talk. And then at the end, just smash through with actionable things that you can actually take away from this. But I wanted to start to talk about really what has led to all of this. So this first picture is me probably about five years ago. Um, I would, I had such bad anxiety that I tried to go to events. I would force myself to still get ready because that was in my wheelhouse and I would always force myself to get public transport to the venue. Um, but then I would usually just have a panic attack at or near the door and then immediately go home. and. I did this for a while, honestly. I kept forcing myself to go because I knew I did want to get better at this, but it was a journey. Um, so it led to this second phase, which is something I'll call the fake it till you make it phase. I just kept trying to power through. I would stay in the venue. I'd finally get into the venue, fantastic. Um, stay for a few minutes and talk to people and then leave early. And I just kept doing this all the time. Um, another good point is that all of this I was doing on my own as well. I think if I had waited to go with a friend, I still would never have gone to an event of any kind yet. So really just faking it till I made it and trying to push through as best I could. I finally started to make some friends at this stage. Brisbane's fantastic because there is a really vibrant tech and startup community here and everyone's really excited to meet everyone else. So 
once I started to see some familiar faces and make some friends, this whole process got a lot easier and I would be so excited to see people that I hadn't seen in a while at events and it just started to get a little less daunting. This stage is where I started plotting a little bit more. So I would find myself, I really loved going to panels um, just because I feel like that was the most engaging for me. And then I could always in the back of my mind think about things that I would like to say on that panel if I was asked one of the questions, or I would, even if I was super brave that day, start asking questions at the end of panels, really just starting to go through working bit by bit the way up. Um, and the final stage, I have sunglasses on at this point. Cool, obviously. Um, and this is where I started speaking at conferences. So I worked my way up and then started speaking at, speaking at really small virtual events. Um, and then I've done really large in-person conferences as well. So really just approaching this from an incremental standpoint. Um, and this is really what I wanted to talk about today because when I was down in stage one, um, I kept seeing people posting advice on how to become a speaker, but they were all really extroverted and outgoing and neurotypical. And I just found that I couldn't resonate with it at all. And it wasn't, they'd never had to try. So they didn't really have any strategies to make things easier because it came so naturally to them. So most of this talk is just me showing you that it is possible to make iterative improvements. And I'll step through what lots of those improvements and lessons are that I've learned along the way so that you can learn from my mistakes so it's not as bad for you. Um, and I'm really hopeful that at the end of this, you'll be able to start applying for some conferences or start applying for some meetups locally in your community so that you can work your way up and then just put all of the pieces into place so that you can start making this for yourself. Because the whole thing is to work out why you actually want to talk. Some people want to talk at a conference because they want to be known as the really smart person or they want to be the most authoritative topic or they want to really be the one that owns a specific programming language or something like that or they just want an ego boost i didn't want any of that so until i really worked out why i wanted to speak at conferences um i just really couldn't force myself to make those extra leaps so working at the start about why i wanted to do that was a really key part for me um, and this is pretty much that so this is a picture of my house very personal to share um this is an art I made for myself. You can tell I made it because there's tinsel glued to it and I don't think <laughs> you could buy it like that. But um, be who you needed when you were younger is really my core value, my motto that I live by. I think the world and especially tech would be a much better place if more people lived by this. So if you're writing documentation, write it for the you developer five years ago, 10 years ago, something that would have really helped you to understand those concepts. And if you're living in that aspect, it really helps. And I brought this into conference speaking as well, because when I was at going through those stages, when I start to really think about when I decided I could and should start speaking at conferences, there's a few speakers that stood out to me and I saw them on panels or I saw them doing a keynote and I just thought this is something that I could do. I could actually be getting through this. Um, and it wasn't until I'd seen one or two people that really did change the course of my life. So that's really what I go into speaking with. Um, every time I talk, I just want one person in the audience to think that they could also be a conference speaker. I'm not trying to be the most knowledgeable or anything like that. It's just more about how can I open more doors for more people. And that's really what drives me. And that helps me so much because it makes me less nervous. Um, it's helped me so much with imposter syndrome because I'm just making sure the and goalposts that I'm actually going for are meaningful to me, but also attainable, which is really good. So this might not be what you want to go into speaking for. This is just from me, but I would say find out what it is specifically for you. So work out why you actually want to talk at a conference and then use that to guide you along the process because that will help you to start talking at conferences, but it will also help you to understand what you should talk about or which specific conferences you should really chase after if you can get to the core of why you want to talk in the first place. Um, and just as well, so I'll go through a little bit about me now because this will help you to understand some of the conferences that I've spoken at. Um, so the first, this is how I represent my resume, which is a bit weird, but um, the first part of the set diagram is my maths background. So I studied pure maths at university. I've also gone on to study data engineering. I now work at Blackbook, which is an AI machine learning consulting firm. Um, so that's a really big part of everything that I do, this really rigorous technical background. Um, but then on top of that, bringing in creative problem solving. I've always been someone who's solving problems or 
looking at things from different directions. So that's a big part of everything that I do as well. Um, I've also worked as a user experience manager for a global prop tech firm and really bringing in all of my design and marketing and behavioral science knowledge, applying that to everything that is part of what I do as well. And the last part, which is not a skill that I ever wanted to have or tried to have, and this really does come from a part of my life earlier that we'll get to in just a little bit, but talking to people in the media, because I realized uh, after my degree that there was no point getting to a result if I couldn't tell anyone about it. So being able to not only do the technical aspects at the start, but then be able to prob so problem solve using those technical tools and then do that in a user-centric way and then talk to people. That's really where I fit into all of this. Um, and I think it's important to go through a diagram like this, not just to tell you about me, but also because I think everyone should do this. Drawing a diagram like this for yourself or a way that helps you to understand your sort of pillars of information will really help you to then dissect what sort of conferences you could or should speak at. Um, you can look at the same problem through different lenses then, because if I was doing, I could do a talk about artificial intelligence at a user experience conference or at a design conference or through a PR lens or something like that. Just being able to understand your different facets of knowledge and really unpack them in this way will help you to be more strategic about what conferences you can actually make available to yourself. Um, so we'll get started now with the other parts of it. So more practical tips. And this is my previous life. So what do fashion models and tech speakers have in common? The part I left out of my diagram is that I modeled in Australia and overseas uh, during and after university. Um, once again, not something I ever set out to do. It's just a very good job to have during university. Um, but there's, it wasn't until I actually started doing conference speaking that I realized how similar so many aspects of conference speaking are to modeling. And I think a really core part of this at the end of the day is in neither field, no one tells you how to do it. Um, no one's upfront about this is what you should actually do, or this is a pathway that actually works because everyone wants to sort of gatekeep other people out of it. So it keeps more jobs for them. Um, and I just have never had an interest in that. I have no interest in that. So I really want to break that down to make it more attainable for other people. And so I went through some transferable skills from my past life. Um, and the first and key point is that a bad headshot will haunt you. Um, when you have, you have to send a headshot with every single spe speaker application. And every time the graphic design teams of that conference will go to town with that headshot. So I would recommend, I still hate having my photo taken. Um, I, it's a chore, I don't like it. But being really deliberate about making sure you have a nice photo that you don't mind being on every single website until the end of time is going to pay dividends long term um, and make sure it's something that does actually look like you in person and something that really reflects what you're trying to achieve with your speaking and everything like that. I know it's uncomfortable. Most aspects of preparing for speaking are uncomfortable, but it's just one of the key things that will really help you to look more legitimate as a speaker and book more established things, as well as doing that in a way that ties in with everything else you're actually trying to achieve. So I know it's uncomfortable, just power through. And this idea of being able to show yourself the way that you want to be seen, um, you really have to be strategic about your brand and think about what is my speaker persona, if you want to call it a persona or something like that, to make sure that how that actually ties in with everything else. Um, some people, when they do speaking, they only speak from their company point of view. So they only ever talk about the company that they work for through that lens. I have never really done that, um, but it's more about everything that I do directly ties into the work that I do, but it is still coming from Brooke the person, not Brooke the employee of the company. And you have to be really strategic about how to do that in a mindful way that's really respectful to your company, um, but also will keep things fine for you if you do end up changing companies or jobs so that you so still have some sort of continuity there. And so to be strategic about it, you have to understand what your brand is. So that exercise with drawing sort of overlapped circles can really help you to understand where you sit at the intersection of, and that can help you to then work out what you need to do. But the same thing with modeling is no one's ever going to show you how to do this stuff. Um, it's just the good people that rise to the top have done this. So you just have to find a way that's natural for you to be able to do it. And you have to be really strategic from the absolute start. And this part as well is so setting goals and work out how to actually reach them. Speaking like modeling is a huge pyramid. So with modeling, you don't 
walk in and book the cover of Vogue for your first job. That's not a thing. So you end up doing, you do smaller, they're called test shoots where you don't get paid. Um, and that's where like a new photographer or maybe a student photographer or something like that, up and coming people will work for free to everyone boosts their portfolio. Um, and the equivalency to that in speaking is doing your local meetups, which maybe are in person in a room with 20 people. And obviously they're not going to pay you for that because people aren't paying for tickets for that. So working out what are little things you can do, I would say at the bottom of the pyramid for speaking as well is also filming video content somewhere on the internet, just because that shows that you can at least speak. And it's a way you can break out of that catch 22 of how do you get experience. Um, and then you can move up to sort of mid tier conferences, maybe start to do some larger events that are ticketed, and then you can get up to doing more international events and things like that. So you have to really plan strategically how you're going to move up through the pyramid, but you can only do that if you realize that it's a pyramid from the start. So modeling is the exact same. And the same thing in modeling is no one ever tells you this. Um, no one really plans this out for you. You just really have to be in charge of that. So work out what your goals are and then how you can reach those in a way that aligns with your brand that you're giving out and then what you would actually like to bring to speaking as well. And as part of the pyramid, transitioning from free gigs to getting paid is really hard. It's the same thing for modeling. When you start to get paid, it's really weird. Um, some people just start booking really large campaigns or they might do a type of modeling that pays really well. Speaking is the same. There's different types of speaking that pay different amounts. Um, and it really does change regionally as well. Especially in Australia, it's really hard compared to America where lots of things are paid. Um, a few ways to get around this. Number one is, uh, just as a side note, I've always donated my speaker fees um, because it's a nice thing to do and because I would have to work a lot harder to actually raise that money for charity. But also when I do international work, um, I can just donate that money to a women's shelter or a local queer organization, something like that, that will be near there. So I'm not ever having to do the double tax transfers, it's a lot. Um, and then the other side of getting donation money is that you can, you're making sure that people are still valuing your time and not expecting you to work for free, but you can get through those early stages of charging weird and small amounts of money um, that would be sort of uncomfortable if you build for them. I guess it's weird to send, so if you sent someone an invoice for like $40 or something, if you're just thinking about an hourly rate, um, that's always uncomfortable, but Doing those as tax deductible donations to registered charities is a good way to sort of break out of that loop. Um, and the other part of getting paid for speaking, especially in Australia, is especially in tech, you can understand that even if you're not getting paid by a conference to talk, if you think about the amount you're salaried as a job, if you were getting a new job, would you get more money if you had done speaking before? Um, so work out how much of an increase your salary would get over the year as a result of the speaking you're doing, and then think about that as payment for speaking um, is often a lot more sensible in terms of how you can actually get extra money from this. And that also means you can do a more varied range of talks that are going to lead to the end goals you and your employer would then also want. So just think about it more creatively about how you can actually unlock this and then think about it within the realm of that pyramid as well. And the thing that people never understand about modeling is that being on time will book you more work than being really skinny or pretty or something like that. Um, being on time really friendly, I get repeat bookings from that just because I was super organized with things. Um, they always, if still running a business, there's still time is money. So being on time. And the same thing goes with speaking, um, knowing, being known as a person who's really on time and up to date with deadlines is going to be so valuable long term because of reputation really does stay with you. So when you're freaking out about thinking, oh, I'm not good enough at this, I'm not good enough at that, you can always be on time and you can always be friendly and this really will just carry with you and think about little things like this you can do that will set you apart from the pack early on because it makes it so much more attainable. And now please bear with me for a brief self-help tangent that I know will be uncomfortable, but it's also helpful. So just stay with me through this. Um, but have you tried speaking to the manager within? When I'm talking about mapping out your values and mapping out your different facets of knowledge and information, it really is important. And I know it's deeply uncomfortable. I hate it. I hated every aspect of it, but I wouldn't have been able to make those incremental growth step changes, I guess, if I wasn't really actively trying towards with this. Um, 
I have worked so hard uh, with different medical professionals and mental health professionals to get my anxiety and neurodiversity to a point where I was working with it, not against it. Um, and that's really helped me to have success in this field. And no one ever talks about this with regards to public speaking. Um, it is stressful, it's stressful for everyone, but that doesn't mean it's not a learnable skill. So approaching this with a self-development mindset, not to get too woo-woo, but it will actually help you along the way. Um, and I really would find out whatever this actually means for you. And this is what will help you to be a better speaker. Because if you only watch speaker training of American men who are used car salesmen, teaching you how to do sales speaking stuff. I don't know, maybe that resonates for you, but it doesn't resonate with me at all. And I never found myself in that. Like I couldn't resonate with it and I couldn't see how I would actually apply it. But getting to know yourself, your value, and then you can bring to a conference will help you so much more to place yourself in strategic speaking roles that you're trying to get to and would really help you to map that out. So it's worth it. Have you tried speaking to the manager within Yes, I found this on a Surrealist Instagram page. Um, and a big part of that as well is being genuinely genuine. I don't know a better way to phrase this, but audiences are smart. They can tell when you're hiding something. They can tell when you're putting on a facade. Audiences are smart in that way. So your best bet is to be unashamedly yourself. People always will find it more endearing if you make a mistake, but you're really just absolutely yourself when you're doing it. So being really upfront and vulnerable and honest with your audience will always go such a long way, even when it comes to maybe you're worried about technical details of things. I always get very stressed about it if I'm doing what I feel like is a very technical presentation, just because it never seems like it's, it's just always so much harder. So work out what it actually is to be genuine for yourself. So work out a speaking style that works for you specifically. Um, if you're really introverted, find a way to work with that. Don't try to fight that. Just get to the core of who you are, allow yourself to be yourself, and then just power through with that. Um, people will tell you to try and put on a mask or something, but it's just not worth it. Um, and people will, I don't know, I wouldn't like to go to a conference talk that was like that. So instead, think about the conference talks that you really actually like to go to, and what did you notice about it? And so, I don't know, for me, always it's when I really feel like I have a genuine connection to the speaker because I feel like I know them a little bit better after talking. And that's what I always look for in a conference when I'm remembering back on the conference talks that I really enjoyed going to. So if you're being yourself, that always helps so much as well. And it will help you to be more consistent. You're not going to be having to try to put on a consistent brand if your consistent brand is just you the whole time. So be genuinely genuine. I wish I had a better way to sum that point up. And so now we're going to get into the more actionable tips, I guess. Um, and so much of this section, which broadly I'll call work smarter, not harder, is because I just I don't like a lot of these tasks. So I've just worked out ways to optimize them over time to really help just make everything a little bit easier and run more streamlined. Um, so many aspects of this come back to you can get better at talking before you're even talking at conferences by just being more alert and aware when you do go to events. So maybe next time you're even, you haven't even bought tickets to a conference and you're looking through the agenda sheet of a conference, be alert and work out which talks you actually want to go to. Um, are there talk titles that really stick out to you or there's some abstracts that you think are really well written? Make note of them somewhere, keep them in a list. I'm sure if you're very on the ball, you could probably make a machine learning model that reads in all the talk titles you were interested in and just spits out new talk titles for you. I'm sure you could do that. Um, but otherwise, just think about it yourself. Keep a notes file on your phone or something. And just be more aware when you are watching people talk, especially when in-person events start again. Yeah, I think it's crossed. Um, being able to look at what something the speaker says or does that really engages the audience, or is there something that they do that you notice a body language change in the audience? Just being more aware when you are sort of passively listening to conferences or stuff that you would normally be doing anyway will help you so much to get speaking experience and confidence and little tips and tricks without actually having to get up and speak in front of people. Um, and that's across the board, one of the key tips. And then I'll sort of go through now different ways that I've actually applied that, but just be more aware and think about what you're doing. So even if you really didn't like some of my slides, keep a note of that. If there were some aspects you really did like, keep a note of that. And think about that with the rest of the talks this afternoon as well. Think about how you would do it differently if you wanted to or what parts you could incorporate. Think about that. So obviously don't copy things word for word from any speaker, but think about how you can make it your own and be 
that genuine in doing that. With the worst graphic design, learn some graphic design principles is a really key tip. Um, sometimes if you're doing a presentation at work, there might be someone who's going to make all your slides for you and make everything look really nice for you. It's unlikely you'll have someone to do that for other speaking things. So learn some graphic design principles, work out how to make things look nice. That's a really easy, clean way you can keep reproducing that work as well. So you don't have to think about it every time. Just learn some basic principles. And a lot of this you'll start to get an eye for when you just are more engaged when you're looking at other things. So if you really like, not this slide, obviously, but if there's a different slide that you really liked the composition of, work out why it was like that. Or if you liked the design of something, work out how you can achieve that design. Um, you can make slides, different graphic designs in each PowerPoint is actually super helpful. You can make social media posts and if you just change the slide size or things like Figma, if that's something you use with your different add-ons. Work out what's going to actually work for you and how you can get to those principles over time will help you so much as you move through. Uh, and just keep working on what this is actually going to look like. Obviously, don't do this. Um, and we'll talk about more about how to make it a little bit easier. And so the first step is to make your own slide templates. Um, this is helpful because it makes it faster every time you need to present at a conference because you can then just, you're not thinking about what to put on every slide. You've sort of made a template that you can use over time. And this is also really helpful when you start to get a few different conference talks because maybe there's some common slides between. And if you've used the same template, you can sort of drag slides across and it will look really consistent which is super helpful over time. So make your own template that you can reproduce um, and work out how to make it your own. So this is well when you need to understand if you are going to do it as you as an employee of your company or you, you as a person, working out where that actually fits in the middle. Because if you're going to do your first talk as you as a person, um, you probably can't use your company's slide template for that. So just thinking about where this actually does fit in. And I would say as well, the easiest tip to make it look like you know what you're doing with graphic design is, um, well, the first one is just have slides that aren't white. People always think you've tried harder when the background is not white because then you can't paste an image in that's got a white border. Um, it just looks like you've tried harder. Um, and then the other side is just get good fonts and colors and things like that. But especially with virtual conferences, I don't know the composition, but my face is going to be very small compared to the slide. Um, and sometimes if it's a Zoom conference, the picture is tiny, tiny at the bottom corner. So these are going to be full screen and it's going to be what most people see. So making sure it actually looks nice will help you so much along the way. And the easiest way to make this even more consistent is to make your own style guide. Um, a style guide, if you have worked with one, especially if you're a front end developer, you would have seen a style guide and it's just sort of these are the brand colors. These are the fonts that we use. This is how we do things. So it sort of just gives you a recipe for all different types of media and materials. You can have it through for your social media posts even just making sure that it is your style guide. This just makes things really reproducible. They're common in businesses because they might be a huge marketing team and there's different people designing different pieces of material, but they all need to look the same. So it's a way of making it reproducible in that sense, but just make it easy on yourself and make a style guide that's yours. Because then, as I was saying, you can swap slides between slideshows and things like that. And then it really helps you to have, people will know when they see your slides because it looks a certain way. Um, so this is Spotify Designs. I found it just online. If you start searching for brand guidelines, you can find them. There's probably one at your company you can start with. And the easiest thing is to just start with a style guide that you've used before and then work out how you need to fill in the blanks to actually make it right. So the IBM design language is actually really, really thorough, especially for accessibility reasons. But essentially they've got, this is what our logos look like. These are the colors. So instead of thinking about just making your style guide colors. Think about what the actual colors that I've chosen. How many boxes do I need to fill in? Does your, maybe the style guide you're used to working with has maybe four core colors and then they've got a whole color set for visualizations and accents and things. Just think of that as a fill in the box technique and just replace all the colors with colors that are for you. And it will give you more of an idea about how to fix it. And if you start with a style guide that you've used practically before, it'll really help you because then you already know your way around it. There's whole books on how to make a style guide. You don't need to go that far. Just think about what's the minimum pieces that you actually use day to day if you're using a style guide to develop something, especially if you're a front end developer. Um, and then think about how you can actually make that for yourself. And then it will give you a complete style guide at the end 
without having to think too much. And then if you end up adding extra elements and stuff to that, you can just keep that in a file over time so it grows with you and can evolve with you as well. Um, if you don't know how to do font pairing, so a font pairing is when you have a heading in one font and then the text in another. This website's really helpful. So you can scroll down and they've got examples of different font pairs. Um, if you have a font pair, it looks like you know what design is um, because you can have that on every slide and people know that a heading is a heading and body text is that. So you can really sort of just work that out over time. Um, this one's good because it only shows you Google fonts, so it should work if you're using Google Slides or other web-based things. But just decide on a font pairing and go with it. Add that into your style guide. This should help you to make you look like you know design um, without actually having to be an expert in this field. Um, and for colors, so accessibility is good because it helps you to make sure that everyone can actually get the information that you're trying to give them, which is the point of speaking at the end of the day. Um, but accessibility on slides is really important as well if you're ever speaking in real life because lots of projectors are just garbage. So if you have accessible color combinations, so for this contrast checker that I use, this is a WebAIM one. There's so many out there, but if it's passing the WCAG guidelines on the contrast check, so that's the difference in contrast between the front and back layers, essentially of color, that means that you will still be able to see it even if the projector is terrible and the window curtains are open on the windows and it's just bad, but you'll still be able to see it because there's good contrast. So it's good practice to do for accessibility, but it will really give you a lot of safeguards to avoid having to tune a projector to a certain range you'll always be able to see it. Um, and the same thing for color blindness. If you pick your initial color palette when you're making your style guide with these two things in mind, it will be accessible by design because you can already work out what color combinations can I use? Can uh, people with different vision see the differences between the color? Um, this David MathLogic site I use all the time because it shows you through different types of vision how different colors are perceived. So it's really helpful for making the style guide at the start. Um, and it's something I even come into when I'm using user experience design tools and things like that. I always come back to these. So good because it's accessible, but even better if you're just not sure what sort of projector you're going to come into. Um, and on this note as well, when you are designing your slides, try them on lots of different screen types. So put it on your phone with the brightness down and go and stand in the sun somewhere and see what it looks like. Or if you've got a really dodgy projector in the office, try them on that or on an old screen, a TV screen that you can put them on. See what it looks like really large because if you've never worked with a large projector before, you don't really have a good sense of what text is too big. So you can run tests yourself to see like at what point font can you see things or is it too big or is it too small? Being able to test those out over time is really helpful. And if you can then add that into your style guide, um, it just makes everything so much more reproducible. No one ever talks about this in practice, but just do it. Think about it a lot at the start, and then you can reuse the same thing every time. Same thing goes with data viz. Um, if you're someone that does a lot of data visualization in your speaking slides and things like that, work out what a style guide is for your charting and then just make that consistent. Because then if you're reusing chart elements across presentations, great, you can just keep going and it'll be so much easier to skip between them or go back or other things like that, you'll just be able to keep it really consistent over time. Even if you're saying all of my charts will always be in squares or something, that way if you swap the chart out for a different one, there's a square gap in the slide that you can then fill in. So all of this just comes back to making it easy on yourself, which is why I said work smarter, not harder. I know it seems like a lot of work to organize, but honestly, anything you can do to really reduce the amount you have to think about things when you're getting ready for a talk will just take so much pressure off you um, especially if you're already really nervous about speaking, it's just one less thing to worry about and one thing that you know will go smoothly because you've already worked it out. So just think about little things like this that you can do to prepare um, as well. If you're someone that's showing code snippets in your slides, work out what you're actually going to do to use that and do it the same way every time. Um, there's different ways you can do that. Maybe you just want to do a screenshot of whatever code editor you're using. I don't mind. Whatever you do end up using, just make sure you've got a plan so that you can keep doing it every time so that you're able to reproduce it so that then if you have a last minute change to one of the lines of code, it's a one step process to update that, not a 50 step, go screenshot this, crop this, change the colors later. Just have it streamlined so that if there are last minute changes, you're being kind to yourself in that process. Um, so now I'm going to step through every single thing I did 
to get this speaking spot at NGC Sydney. Um, I think, yeah, this is something that, once again, no one ever talks about this because they think that if they're going to tell someone how to speak at a conference, there'll be more competition for speaking at conferences, which there is, but I also think there's enough speaking spots going around for everyone. Um, and I think as well, this is what keeps early career people from speaking, or this is what keeps maybe diverse audiences from speaking, just because no one's really stepped through how to do it. So I'll step through now everything I did to prepare for this. Um, and so the NDC, I found the call for speakers. So I did NDC last year as well. Um, you can watch my video on YouTube where I physically choke in the middle of it. It's fantastic. Um, but you can go through and there's like different call for speaker pages, but I knew there was one for NDC because I'd speak and spoken at it last year. So I went to the NDC website to find that page. I think it was also advertised quite heavily on Twitter. So it's a really good place to keep track of call for speakers. Um, and then it takes you to a website called Sessionize. Sessionize is one of the key speaker platforms I've seen. The other one is called Paper Call that I've seen used as well. Other times it's just a Google form or other times you just email someone. But Sessionize is the biggest sort of centralized platform I've seen. Um, so it's a call for speakers page that will have a little bit of information. So over here it says the regular talks were 60 minutes, lightning talks 15 minutes, workshops to two days. Um, and then they give you some suggestions for topics. So this is where it's really important because NDC is so broad. It's not a really pinpointed conference. So being able to think, what can you actually present? Um, and a way that I get around this is so my previous keynote talk that I would do quite heavily was called the persuasion equation. So that was how to make your voice heard when people don't want to listen to you. So being able to be really persuasive with data visualization. Um, and I chose that as a topic initially because it was a topic that I could really skew for whatever type of conference I was going for. So if I was going to be doing that at a business conference, I could make it super business focused, but I could do the same conference and I have done it at artificial intelligence or really heavily focused data science conferences as well. So it's got this core sort of 80% that's really core material. And then the other 20%, I would fine tune that for whatever conference I was speaking at, which is really helpful. If you can think about how making it easy for yourself, if you can think of a topic that is really helpful but broad, um, then you can tailor that. So something that's not too broad that it means nothing, but something that you can really tailor and apply to other things. So when you're drawing your Venn diagram of the circles, think about something that you could tailor to each of those specific pillars of the Venn diagram as you're going through. So same with how to become a tech conference speaker. I can pretty much do this talk at any different tech conference. Um, and it's just a matter of working out how I can actually tie that in with what's going on. So they will give you some suggestions. Sometimes they're really specific about what they want. Sometimes they're really broad. Just think about how you can then tailor everything you're going to show into something that will actually make sense for this. Um, and then don't miss the closing date. It's a solid tip. Um, and then always assume that it's the day before or the hour before because you never know with time zone differences what will actually occur. Um, and on this page as well, if you scroll down normally on the thing, they'll tell you if travel is covered or if they'll pay you or all that other logistics information is normally on the sessionized page when you apply. And then when you get accepted, uh, this is what it looks like in the back end of Sessionize. So this is the information down here that I gave them. So I chose a 60 minute session, which is what you're in. I said this was intermediate. Um, added some tags that come into the drop down. I hadn't presented this at a conference before. It's my first one for this round of talk. Um, and a target audience. And then there's also a link to previous speaking details. So that's sort of most of the information that you need to give. And then what I'll do now is break down how I actually made the description and things like that. No one tells you how to write a session description. <laughs> um, and so this is when you're coming into, if you're looking more accurately about what sessions you really actually wanted to see at a conference, you can start to sort of get a bank of these together and work out how they're structured what's covered in them, and then what actually made that interesting to you. So why you wanted to see it and what you actually wanted to get out of it. So this is a description that I submitted for this talk that you're in now, which I don't think it was changed. Usually for Sessionize, that information gets published directly to the website, pretty much verbatim. So always keep that in mind as well. Um, make sure anything you put here is fine to be online. Um, every time I read this, I forget that I mentioned having panic attacks at my first conferences. but. Um, Think about what you can actually do. So this is how I step through 
what needs to go in my session description. So the first thing I have a zingy opener, something with a story or journey that shows that this is personal to me and my expertise specifically, because this whole thing, you're not trying to sell the conference organizers or the audiences on the idea just of having this session. It's that, no, we need to have this session and I need to be the one presenting this session. So sort of two prong. Number one, they need to be interested in it, but it has to be why you are the best person to be delivering that as well. So that's sort of my opener. I also talk if there's some social proof in there. So saying that like I started <laughs> panic attack before my first conference in 2019, not a good memory, through to now doing about 20 of them, as well as university guest lectures, lots of things like that. So it's talking more about the journey of how I put this into practice. The second term is what the talk actually is. So when I'm talking about be who you needed when you were younger, this is the talk I wish I could have had early in my career. Great, uh, we're consistent. Um, and then stepping through what's actually in the talk. So breaking the catch 22 of becoming a speaker, when I was talking about how you can film videos and things like that ahead of time, little things you can do to improve your brand, making your voice heard in the industry. So this is what the meat of the talk actually is. Um, being able to show that this is a target audience is really helpful for conference organizers, because if you think about when they're making a conference schedule, they've got different sort of personas in mind for who might attend that conference. So they need to make sure that there's something for everyone in terms of the different personas that we'll have at the conference. So it needs to be, find a way to communicate that it's broad and will be helpful to anyone that attends, but think about specifically the people who, think about someone personally in your life that you would like to come to your talk or that would find value in it, and then talk about why they would. So this is broad because it's from different software and tech backgrounds, but it's specifically about how you can apply it yourself, but it's also really helpful. Any of this can be applied for staff you manage um, because lots of the time in performance reviews, people will say they might, as a goal for the next year ahead, they might want to become a tech conference speaker or they might want to do more content based things. And there's not really any good tools to be able to guide them through that process. So it's one of the other things I'm hoping people are gonna be able to get out of today in terms of being able to mentor their staff and coach their staff through this process because it is really daunting. So thinking about, who should come to the talk? Why would they come to your talk? What will they get out of it? Specifically around the people is good for that third chunk. Um, and the last chunk is being able to show some different additional benefits or being able to look at the problem in a different way. So talking that it is interactive, so we'll have lots of questions at the end. Um, could learn from the stage to show that I will be honest about how things didn't go well. Um, and then the career benefits that come from speaking are really good. People think that it's just that people want to become a speaker because they want to get paid for that specific talk. But as I was saying, especially in Australia, so much of it just comes back to increased salary or being ahead in someone. You could be exactly the same in terms of qualifications as another person um, for a job interview. There's down to two people maybe. But if one of you is done speaking, even if you want the same money, you've got the same experience, everything. If one of you is done speaking, it's just a really good way to show different value to the organization because you just stand out in a little bit different ways. So it is really helpful. Um, and this is how I always write my session descriptions. Um, I don't know what the actual formula is because I don't know if there is one, but this is what I do and it's worked over time. When I was starting out, I would apply really heavily and I would actually split test these descriptions. Um, I had sort of two realm, two versions that I would do and I would send different versions in and then I would see how it goes. And if one was doing really well, then I would start honing that one in. So think about how you can test things out or have a go. Um, the other side is that, as they were alluding to before the program started, you don't actually have to have written your talk when you send in a session description. So being able to, you can send in session descriptions and just see if they get picked up at a conference or not. Um, you have to know that you do actually have to deliver on that if you get booked to do the conference. But thinking about what you can actually do to maybe you could try to write a session description that you're not really sure will work out or not but you can just have a go and then if it does end up getting picked up at a conference fantastic you can write the talk to go along with it but just thinking you don't have to write the entire talk before you start applying for conferences and don't let that stop you or be a friction point in terms of learning to talk at conferences because you can just start applying with session descriptions and then when you get booked for one then you'll actually have to do it but um, it's a really good way if you're just sort of testing the waters to see what will happen you can start applying over time. So now my speaker bio as well. No one tells you how to write this either. Um, and it's really uncomfortable. If you don't want to write your speaker bio, find someone 
um, either that you work with or you work for or find someone in the comments of this who you can trade with or a friend and just write each other's speaker bio. It's so much easier to be really polite and kind to a friend than it is to write nice things about yourself. It's deeply uncomfortable. But just work out someone that you can trade with because then at the end of it, you'll both have speaker buyers. Fantastic and it's easy. This is sort of how I structure mine. Um, this is also what I use as my LinkedIn bio just so it's consistent. The first thing, I have a tagline. This is actually how I explain my job to my parents because I'm head of enablement for AI machine learning and data. That sounds very fake, but it's a very real job. And I'm very much in between the really rigorous maths, data, data engineering tech side with um, user experience and talking to people. So this ties back in with that Venn diagram I was talking about. But then it means that if the at an in-person conference, if they need a way to talk about me and introduce me really quickly, fantastic, they've got it. If they need a tagline when they're writing copy to do social media posts from the conference, they've got information. So just giving people the right information in this section, because this is what you fill out in Sessionize. And once again, they can and will publish it anywhere. So if you give good information to the organization that's going to be running the conference, they'll have everything they need to write about you in a way that makes sense. Um, then you won't get stuck with weird descriptions that don't make sense for you. And that will usually only happen if you haven't given them enough information to work with. So I always start with a really quick tagline. This first paragraph is sort of my actual bio. So what I tell to conferences if I apply to them, not through Sessionize, if I'm just emailing them, I always say, if you need a short bio, just use this first paragraph. If you would like a long bio, use both. And that's because often, especially on printed information, maybe they're only got a small space. Um, or if they want a really long section to fill out a page, that's why I give them both. So think about how you can structure your bio to give them stuff to work with. Um, and that will, once again, just help their marketing team to do a better job of talking about you in a way that makes sense. So this is sort of my actual bio. It talks about my job, where I work, what my degrees are in what I actually do, what I like at my job. So overall, they specialize in researching and developing technically robust solutions that help non-data people harness the power of AI. That's what I do. I talk to people who don't understand data about how to get the most out of it. It's just a very long way of saying that. Um, and the second part is get to know me. So all of this talks about all the other stuff that I do outside of my actual job. So all the speaking, lecturing, things like that, all the work I do in regional Queensland with the queer community. This is good because it shows that I'm a real person <laughs> um, and it makes it a little bit more personal, but it also really filters out if a conference sees this and they don't want anything to do with me, uh, this will surely filter them out straight away and I wouldn't want to speak that either. So it's helpful on two fronts, not only getting to know me a little bit more, but absolutely filters out people that you wouldn't want to be around anyway. So this is how I write my speaker bio. Um, Obviously, if you copy paste this for yourself, it's not going to work out. So think about more about what you actually do and how you can best communicate that. Um, because your speaker bio is well, audiences to see you on the website, but it's also this stuff that will help you to get noticed by conference organizers if they're going to be looking through bios to work out. If they're tossing up between two people, it gives you an opportunity to tell them more about yourself um, when you can't introduce yourself in real life. So that's how I break this down. Once again, I, there's no guidebook to this. This is just what I've worked out over time. Um, so I also did some social media posts. Um, this is what my tweet looks like. I made this graphic myself. I went on the NDC website and found the color schemes and sort of made the graphics myself. If you don't, this is why you need to know how to do a little bit of graphic design. Um, the thing with social media posts is almost always the image size is just 1200 by 628. So if you set a PowerPoint slide at that pixel dimension, um, you can just make the graphic in PowerPoint and then export it as an image and you don't need to have Canva, Figma, or Photoshop, or any actual design tools, you can just crank that up, which is why it's really helpful if you have either a style guide for yourself or something like that, um, just because you can make it easier over time, especially if it's a photo of you, you can work that in. Um, so I always just put, I always make sure I do these ahead of time. This is good for my LinkedIn because it helps you to book other conferences, but it also keeps that conference happy knowing that you've promoted them. And I always make my company logo really large on this just to show that, I am, I don't know, especially if you need time off work to be able to speak at conferences or things like that. Um, always very thankful to, especially Black Book, of being so supportive of me. So I'm always trying to make sure that it's not just me touting myself as Brooke, but it's specifically improving the brand of Black Book AI, my employer as well. So it's just keeping everyone happy. And I always link to where to get more info or tickets or things like that. This one, I actually made a TikTok, which I don't know if this video will work. 
but it's me and a cat that I was babysitting talking about TikTok. I don't know. Find out whatever actually works for you um, and keep going with that over time and just work out different ways that you can talk about what you're doing because then it will help more people to find you and it will really just help you to book more things in future, which is what you're trying to do at the end of the day. Um, and then so how to get experience when you have no experience. So on that sessionized page earlier, there was a link to my previous speaking. So this is what I send in. This is actually the last pages of my resume um, where I list the recent speaking stuff that I've done and also media. If you've never spoken at a conference and you would like to talk at a conference, the easiest thing you can do is just to make LinkedIn videos where you're talking about a topic that you like. So just you can be talking to camera um, or you can film something on Loom or on Zoom or on Cisco WebEx where you're sharing slides and talking to them. Being able to do those little snips of video content is really easy content to crank out, but it's also showing that you can talk to camera um, even if no one's booked you to do that. So you can take control of that and really just get ahead of that. Um, it's sort of like when you buy scissors and they're in a plastic container and you need scissors to cut the scissors out of the container so you can get in and it's just this whole loop ordeal. But getting ahead of this and just thinking about what can I actually do ahead of this? Some of the media that I put down, those are written articles that I've submitted to publications or interviews that I've done for different events and things. So it's all about just showing that, hello, I'm a real person. I have communication skills. Finding different ways to do that will help you so much, especially if it does get down to two or three of you that the conference organizers are trying to work out who will be a safe bet. Because at the end of the day, if they're selling tickets, they want to put on a great event. So just being able to show that you can deliver on what you're saying to deliver, get creative and find different ways to talk about this. Um, even if that's written articles or just getting in the habit of doing some video content somewhere that you can link to show that you are a real person and you can do this will go an absolutely long way, even if you've never been booked to speak somewhere before. Um, if this is relevant to you, so I went to the Global Diversity CFP Day. It's a worldwide event, but there's normally some in capital cities. There's definitely one in Brisbane that I went to. Um, it was in either January or February, and they fully showed us how to write speaker bios, descriptions, even things like Stagecraft. There's also really good resources on their website. Um, if you or anyone you manage is a member of a diverse community, really get them to apply to this and go along. It was honestly one of the most positive things I did in terms of giving myself confidence to speak. So it's a great initiative to get involved with. Um, additionally, if you are from a large employer and you would like to sponsor them, I'm not affiliated with them. I just went to their event. It was fantastic. Definitely sponsor it, put money behind it. If you're ever someone that's complained that you couldn't get a diverse range of speakers for your event, this is a great way to help the pipeline of speakers and to give people confidence that are from diverse backgrounds. So it was really fantastic. Um, the other side is I also became an AWS community builder. Um, so this is sort of, uh, there's a QR code to join the waitlist, I believe, for the next round. This is my LinkedIn post I did about it. It's a community they help you to write more, to learn how to write content to learn how to create video content. Um, I've already booked two speaking things through this because they've helped me to find the CFPs to send into. Um, this is just the one that I'm, I'm sure there's the Microsoft MVP program is probably the most similar one from Microsoft. I'm sure there's one from Google. I'm sure there's one for whatever platform it is that you're really interested in. Get in touch with someone from their community team or from their marketing team, something, find them on LinkedIn and work out how you can actually get involved because all of these vendors want community members to be able to speak at their events. They want people to be able to put out content that's relevant to what they're doing from a company side. So just work with them um, and work out how you can use that as a springboard. So I'm in the machine learning program of the AWS Community Builders, and we get all sorts of benefits and things like that that have really helped out over time. Um, I wish I'd known about this earlier. I would have joined earlier. I think it's quite a new program, but Definitely apply if this is something that's relevant to you or apply to whatever it is that's relevant to the stack that you work with. So when you've made your Venn diagram of things you're actually working with, work out how to hone in on that and then make use of the resources that are available to you because I promise you there is someone in marketing at each and every tech platform who would be absolutely delighted to receive an email saying, hello, how do I get involved? So just make the most of those resources that are actually available to you. Um, this is my closing, second last closing slide. So first of all, <laughs> when I was saying earlier about how your employer really likes it if you do speaking because it can help them, the really big reason for that is because it helps to recruit people. Um, if anyone would like a job at Blackbook, uh, there's a QR code to get to our work with us page. Otherwise, just contact me on LinkedIn and I'll put you in touch. 
through to our general manager for HR and things like that. Um, this is how to get in contact with me. So my LinkedIn, my Twitter, my Dev2 is where I write lots of uh, my more technical articles. If I put the QR code here, it's my motivation to keep actually putting content there. And the same thing with my TikTok that I made less than a week ago. Um, if I put the link here, I'll be forced to keep looking. So that's my final closing slide. And now I'm excited to get into any questions if there are any. Hey, Brooke, yes. Oh, that was an inspirational talk. Uh, it's, there's so many takeaways here. I've got I've got three pages of notes already. Um, uh, yeah, I definitely need to learn a lot of your, your tricks there. Your formulas sound fantastic. Um, cool. So <laughs> there are questions in, in the chat. So I'm going to just call out uh, from top to bottom here. The first one was um, from Lars. So his question is, how do you get over that first anxiety of being on stage? Um, it's really hard. Uh, <laughs> it's really, really hard. Um, I think thinking about all the ways that it can go wrong as an anxious person, I would already do that so I could hedge against them. <laughs> mm. So I already knew that it could go bad and then I could just work out different ways to actually push through. I think that's really important as well. Um, or just working out how you can get past it. The other side is that there's really good text to speech and speech to text things now. So mm -hmm. um, before mm -hmm. you had to practice your talk by talking to people, which I have no interest in. So um, you can do, record it on your voice notes, especially if you're walking your dog or something, mm -hmm. you can just record it and then transcribe mm -hmm. that using AWS, Azure, whatever, um, and then look at what it actually looks like because then you can see what you're saying without having to listen to your voice, which no one should be tortured with. Um, and that will really help you to be more confident <laughs> in what you're saying without having to... Mm -hmm torture yourself as much and then so when you do actually do it you'll be so much more rehearsed um and it's mm. one of those things that will make it more natural for you because you'll see about how you actually speak and you're different yeah that that's actually that sounds really good i wish i did that i remember my first public talk very little preparation it was just i went in cold and it hurt a fair bit i was <laughs> super nervous yeah. and uh your well, voice changes and woo. yeah yeah and that's only right. outgoing people give you tips so they're useless. Yeah. They're like, oh, just think confidently before. Listen to a peppy song. It's not helping. Yeah, just do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh, wow. Look, uh, there's another question from, from Tien. Um, what's your number one mistake you see first-time speakers making all the time? I think when they try to be someone they've seen on YouTube or Netflix or Twitter just, or something, yeah. they're trying to be them pretending to be Tony Robbins or something instead of just being them as themselves. One of the mm -hmm. like the tech conference talks that I like going to the most are when it's someone super technical, just absolutely living their truth, being themselves and just getting mm -hmm. really nerdy on a subject that they're, it's a special interest topic or something. I love going to talks like that. I think lots of people do because they're super engaging because you can just tell the person is having the best time. And yep. yeah, absolutely just getting into that mindset of how you can, that's why I was talking about being genuine because it's how can you do it for you rather than what's your best Tony Robbins impersonation or something. Yeah, that, that, I, now you mentioned it for sure. Like you can see it. In the uh, younger speakers, for instance, who are doing it, or first time speakers, I should say. Um, yeah, they, they would have role models and try and be like them. But I guess, you know, it's a lesson to learn that you should be yourself. It's much easier being yourself uh, um, rather than just forcing yourself down a, a way of behavior that you're not really comfortable with. But yeah. uh, good advice. Mm. Yeah, I noticed it a lot because lots of the speaker role models were all men. So as a young woman, I just didn't, I couldn't see myself doing any of that. So that's why I thought I couldn't be a speaker because all of the tips just were completely not relevant to something I could see myself doing. So it's helpful so much for that mindset as well. I think, uh, I'm not sure what it's like in Brisbane, but in, in Melbourne, at least, there's a lot of uh, female meetup groups, a lot of uh, tech female speakers. Uh, uh, when we actually... Did a CFP for another conference as well. The, the number of women outweighed the number of men. So, yes, it's 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 changing. It's uh, all that the tools and all the, the resources that everyone needs is out there. So, uh, it's it's definitely good to see that change as well. Um, cool. Now, let's see if there are any, uh, any other questions. Um, people have said that they've gone to the uh, the uh, global CFP days, myself included, uh, went a couple of years ago. Uh, very useful, like you say, and they teach you how to write your bios and um, you know, be friendly. You know, don't use things like guys. 
Um, yeah, use other terms, everyone, you know, be respectful. Um, but I'll, I'll go back to one of my notes here is uh, about the speaker bio, right? Do you, do you think the length of your bio matters and, and exactly what you put in there or is it more just, again, like being yourself, more, being more important? I think putting the information in that you would be mad if they didn't know about you when you're applying for a conference is really good. And then that's why I sort of make mine in two chunks. So if they want a really quick one, it is there in a couple sentences or they can add the mm -hmm. longer part. And I think being able to move between both of those is really helpful because then you can just put the most important things at the start and then whatever they cut out at the bottom, you can live with or without, but it will make sure that mm. you're being represented in the way that you want to be represented in that. Mm. Yeah, very cool. It's not a, yeah, it's just, also, the other trip is to look through loads of people on LinkedIn um, and see how they mm. summarize their work and how they talk about it. There's so many people mm. globally that you can sort of just pick and choose and see what you like and don't like. So it's one of those things that mm. when you're being really observant, Aside from the uh, looking at the agenda of conferences, look how speakers talk about themselves and see what you can see working for you or not working. Mm. Now that, that's definitely a good tip. Um, you know, looking around at what other people do, and again, but yeah, don't, don't just copy it, right? You know, get some inspiration for yourself. Um, and you don't want to write a story about yourself sounding like someone else. So um, another thing I, I sort of noted down is that your actual formula that you said for your bio. Um, I, I've looked actually, I couldn't find a formula, but I like your formula. <laughs> I think uh, you definitely need to uh, publish that somewhere and uh, make it a bit more known. It'd be very useful. Um, yeah, no one tells um, you how to do any of this stuff. It's like that's <laughs> right. this hidden secret that apparently everyone who does it knows how to do it, but no one will tell anyone else about it. Like you're saying, the extroverted people, uh, when I started, I asked someone a question and they said, oh, yeah, I just, I just wrote it down. This is whatever came to mind. Yeah. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to try this. It didn't work. <laughs> it took a long time to actually get one out. But um, I, another fantastic trip tip is sort of just more of the techie side of stuff about doing all this is to use PowerPoint to make your Twitter posts or your LinkedIn posts. Oh, yeah. Uh, wow. I was using Photoshop, but that's a good tip. Well, because what you can do is you can make the background in Photoshop and then just put the text on in PowerPoint. Um, you can even yeah. do that if you're doing like the sort of social image that gets attached to blog posts and stuff. I just set it up. Hmm. If you need to set a template for your whole website, you can do that in PowerPoint really fast. Um, and then if you set it up for the any sort of social post is the same size, so you can just crank that through, especially if it's information that gets repeated all the time, like your name and your job title. You can just copy hmm. it from the previous slide and then just export it as an image. It's not supposed to be for that, but it works really well. <laughs> so. It does. It's, I can see it happening. I'm, I'm going to try it out as well. <laughs> so, hey, Brooke, do you want to hang around for our uh, next quiz? Yeah. We've got I the tech you. quiz. But this requires that I need to wear a funny hat. And I don't have a funny hat, but I've got a very colorful one. Let me just chuck this on. I did not bring a hat. Everyone at home, even though you're not on camera, I assume that everyone is putting your hat on as well. And uh, I also, I've got a jacket that goes with this. So, you know, just, no just, one sent me the just amp it up. Beforehand. <laughs> That's all right. I'm going to get this nice and colorful. Somehow they actually matched. Uh, very lucky. All right, here we go. So now everyone can see me asking the questions. Okay, so we have the Slido up there and uh, just would love everyone that's on the live stream and even on the closed streams to join in. If you sign up, we're going to run the quiz and we'll be able to win some really cool prizes. Uh, I think the, the top five winners or uh, positions get to win uh, – uh, 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 an NDC Sydney hoodie, and for the very number one slot, there's a uh, an NDC Sydney ticket for next year, I believe. I think that's the case. Hopefully, someone will correct me. But uh, <laughs> uh, and so, what we have in store? Should join for that alone. I have one from last oh, no, year. I wear all the time. <laughs> oh, they they're so good. Yeah, uh, it's getting a bit hot now, so it's not really hoodie weather. All right. Okay, I'm ready to go. Uh, so this is a, a, a techie quiz. Um, and we have already got eight people. See some of the names from the last session jumping in. People really want that uh, want that NDC ticket. <laughs> All right. Who we got there? Tim Comport, JT, Matt D. Yes, some familiar names. Barman, he's there. 
Ooh. Llama number one. I, that has to be Lars. Is that Lars? Oh, I can't see in the chat if that's Lars. <laughs> All right, cool. So let's just give it another 30 seconds or so. And then we'll start the quiz. Um, Lars says he's got his hat on. Yes, that's good, Lars. Uh, I think we actually got the same colored hat this time. <laughs> All right, okay. Uh, well, people are still coming in. Now, just be mindful that on the live stream, there's, uh, there's a bit of a delay. So what I'm seeing here and what's actually going out on YouTube is between a 10 and 20 second delay. So grab your phone or uh, just go to the actual Slido link itself uh, and play there. So um, yeah, definitely you try and be on the on the trigger, ready to go, get your answers in. Okay, cool. I think it's slowed down a bit now, looking at people joining. So we've got 23. That's gonna be good for competition. All right, so I'm gonna click. So actually, Brooke, can you see the questions that pop out? So we can alternate, I'll ask a question, you ask a question. Yes, you we right should go first there. All right, I'll go. Okay, clicking start. Here we go. ASP.NET applications can be written in any of the following except J Sharp, Visual Basic, Python, or JavaScript. Ooh. Uh, there's some clear choices already, uh, but it's starting to mix up a little bit. Uh, and it's <laughs> interesting. Here we go. So the, the results are in. And the correct answer should be, can has it a guess? Python. You can't write ASP.NET applications with Python. I'm not sure how that would work if you even tried, but if it even would be possible. But yeah. all right. So who won? Who's on the leaderboard? Who came first? Matt 88. All right. He was on the trigger there. Cool. Uh, Koji, Magda, Lambda number one, and Anand. Okay. So I think you'll see who, who stays at the top there. All right. You ready for the next question? Yes. Here we go. What does L-I-N-Q stand for, or link? Ooh, they're all very similar. And what does it stand for in words, not in its values? <gasps> Important. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> I don't want to <laughs> spoil the answer. We give it away. Oh, it's even. Ooh. There's uh, interesting, interesting choices here. La language interface natural query versus language integrated query. Ooh, interesting. What's the answer? Whoa. So that was a surprise. I think, uh, yeah, language integrated query. Uh, we use it well, for .NET developers. You use it fair, fairly often, but uh, there you go. Let's see who, who's on top. Matt 88 and then Jimmy, Matt G. All right, here we go. Heating up the competition. Next one. Who is known as the father of the World Wide Web? Was it Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Brendan Eich, or Tim Berners-Lee? Oh. Do you know? I think I know. <laughs> we'll see here. Let's see what people think. So the answers are in. The correct answer is Sir Tim Berners-Lee. So he's been knighted. And yeah, very, very influential man, that guy. Uh, changed our worlds completely. Uh, who got the top answer there? Matt 88. Oh, this guy's on fire. Didn't Matt win the last round? I think I he think did. They might have, yeah. Oh, Matty. Oh, what are you doing? <laughs> Let's see what happens. You can only have one NDC ticket, so you have to share it, right? <laughs> uh, all right, Brooke, next question. Cool. Um, what does MPEG file extension stand for? Do people say MPEG? Yes. It's one of those words yeah. I never say out loud. Yeah. I just read GIF, so GIF. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, sure, this one should be fairly uh, straightforward. Uh, oh, Matt, Matt Wick said if he wins, he'll share the ticket. Uh, very nice, Matt. Thank you. All right. What did people guess? Oh, it's almost even split. Let's see what the answer was. Motion picture experts group. There we go. That's what it stands for. I didn't actually know that one, so I learned something today. Cool. And on top, is it Matty? It, oh, my goodness. Matt G. All right. So we've got two mats in the running. Uh, and Jimmy is on their tail. All right. Let's see what's next. Uh, what HTML tag can you use to apply CSS rules 
to a document. Okay, someone already answered that one straight away. I've got a special screen here. I can see who's answering what. Uh, not actually who, but how many people are answering for a particular option. So, oh, so cool. I can see who's in the race. Yeah. All right, the answers are in. Let's see, what have we got? Who got it right? Who got it wrong? Correct answer is the style tag. Ooh. Yes, very important. If you're a front-end developer, you need to know that one. All right, leaderboard, we have, yeah, no change at all. And we've got Patrick and Chris, new contenders. Let's see if they can overtake. We're at the halfway mark now. Next question, Brooke. Who is considered as the world's first computer programmer? Wow, Ada Lovelace, Ada Lovelace. Hopper, Margaret Hamilton, and Adele Goldberg. Mm, I've not heard a few of those names. Oh, come on. Everybody, hopefully, everybody knows this one. What have we got? What's the results? Oh, cool. A small mixture there, but let's see what's the answer. Ada Lovelace, yes, there we go. She was the first computer programmer, a very, very famous lady. And who's in the running here? Oh, so I think Chris got knocked off at the bottom there, so JT's back. All right, next question. We've got how many players are there in the Turing test? That's interesting. Ooh. I don't actually know the answer to this one, so here we go. <laughs> Luckily, the answers are pre-programmed. Now I don't have to choose it myself. <laughs> what have we got? What have we got? Ooh, I can I can certainly see people are thinking hard about this one. Look at that. So, uh, is it is it two players? I think so. so I've got, no, it's three players. Okay, cool. Whatever that means, it's, I'm gonna have to look that up now. But uh, you know, what do you do with three players in the Turing test? Okay, we'll have to figure it out. <laughs> All right, who's on top? Maddie, Maddie, Patrick, Jimmy, and JT. All right, Brooke. Next question. Which language came first, Fortran, COBOL, Lisp, or PLI? Mm. I also would like to know if there's a prize for whoever gets all of them wrong on each test. <laughs> that is something oh, that... I would take out if there was one that just. <laughs> I wonder if we could do something like that, a Love special edition for. hoodie. Yeah. <laughs> All right. People are thinking Fortran was uh, the, the first or the oldest language, I guess. Let's see if that's correct. Yes, it is. Wow. Very nice. Lars says there is a the Spoon Award uh, for, for getting everything wrong. But I think we follow Lars's tip. And carved out a of wooden spoon. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny. Um, all right, who's on top? We have Matt eighty eight. So we're on uh, eight out of ten questions already. So we're nearly there. We're nearly there. Next question is: Which of the following JavaScript evaluates to true? Oh wow! False is equal to null. False is equal to false. False is undefined, and false is zero. Okay, yeah. There must be a lot of JavaScript developers out here. Um, <laughs> some people after that wooden spoon. Cool. All right. Let's see. What is true? All these falsehoods being true? How does that work? Uh, leaderboard. Uh, so false equals zero. Yeah, zero is false. It sounds good. That's just probably a weird way of how JavaScript works. But hey, people seem to know the answer. And who got that it on top? That the most even, mm -hmm. I think. And, yeah, you're right. That's right. It's surprising. It definitely shook up the leaderboard a bit. Lama One's back. And um, I forget who. Someone dropped off there. But all oh, good. May still on top. He's a genius. Far out. Next question. What did NDC originally stand for? There's a bunch of options there. None of I hope everyone actually novel, knows this. So that's unfortunate. <laughs> Well, that would be interesting, yeah. There is a company called Narwhal, actually. You do a lot of uh, Angular sort of front-end stuff, yeah. What was the answer? Everyone thinks it's the Norwegian Developers Conference, and I think they are correct. There we go. It's uh, definitely all started all in Oslo uh, you know, many years ago. Maybe Jacob can give us a full history again one day. But uh, let's see, who, who's on top? There's no surprises. Matt G is second. Uh, and the llama's on their tail. All right. So I think now we're going to have the last question, Brooke. Uh, let's see. Finish quiz. Oh, 
No. No, that wasn't one. We yeah. actually that was them. Oh. So Matt G was actually at the top. Sorry, I thought it was one more question. Matt G, you were on the top. No, was it Matt Wicks? I can't see the quiz now. What happened? <laughs> Let's see if I can get back to the results quickly. View results. Uh, in the end, no, I can't see the results. I can see the leaderboard. One second. Let me get everything back on track. All right, so with nine out of ten points. Yes, it was Matt Wicks on top. Second place with Matt G and JT Lama one. Jimmy and Patrick. So Matt uh, Wicks was kind enough to say that he will donate his NDC ticket to uh, someone else. Uh, I think I'll leave it up to Matt Wicks to decide who that is. I don't want to choose for him. Uh, and then we've got Matt G, JT, Lama One, and Jimmy, who all get a nice limited edition NDC Sydney hoodie. Yay! <laughs> Thanks for joining, Brooke. It was a lot of fun Thanks having so you here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no worries. So what have we got up next? I have to actually look at the uh, the run sheet now. Um, uh, actually, well, yes, it's time to thank our sponsors. You know, without them, this event 100% would not be possible. So thank you very much, and here's some videos. And finally, the top spot on our list of medium best workplace winners for 2021, rocketing up from number nine in 2020 to the top place this year. Congratulations to our number one best workplace in the medium category, Mantle Group. Mantle Group is a business that truly lives its principles. Customers rate its service delivery as excellent. Executives embody the best characteristics of the company. Employees and management are in it together. As one employee put it, the COVID crisis was tough for many businesses and watching a team of over 250 people reach consensus to get through the darkness together will be one of the highlights of my working life. To be certified with Great Place to Work here for us as an organisation is extremely important. It helps us translate feedback, input from our team and from the organisation to make us a better place to be on Australia's 2021 best place to work list is a great milestone. It's a, we're super proud to be amongst some really great organisations uh, in this list. We really put focus on, on the team. Uh, during COVID times, tough times, we really centred our business to focus on a few things that really matter. To keep our team employed, to keep people safe, but also to keep productive throughout the last 12 months. The message I'd like to give to our team is a massive thank you. There's so much gratitude as a collective group of people that make up Mandel Group and I'm super proud of everyone's efforts to contribute to making it a great place to work. It's never one person in Mandel Group, it's always a, a team that collectively delivers on our promise as, a, as an organisation. I love running this company. I love running it because uh, of the people I deal with. They're such a great team of people. From a career perspective, it's the best move I ever did. Being a great consultant, which we are, this is W, is half-half between technical skills and communication. It's given me the opportunity to work with lots of different types of technology and explore some stuff that I maybe only dabbled in at university or before. SSW is a company that makes enterprise software solutions uh, and that's what we do. We build software for clients uh, on demand. We build bespoke solutions using the latest technology and the latest best practices. I've been involved in the development of some mining software, been involved in the development of software for a legal firm and everything in between there. Even in just under two years, I've been working across so many different projects it's just a really great place to come into and I always look forward to coming to work. Are you an engineer looking to impact millions of Australians? We're looking for big thinkers, problem solvers and challenge seekers to help us engineer the future of banking. ComBank Engineering. Do you have what it takes? Search engineering at ComBank. All right. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you, Will, for the amazing quiz. I, uh, I love quizzes. 
just a uh, pity that I, as a uh, host, couldn't see the answers, so I didn't bother partaking. Uh, we have now our last talk for the day, uh, which is great. Don't go away after the end of the talk, though, because, of course, afterwards we have the prize draw. So I have to mention expo.ndcsydney.com if you haven't entered yet. Um, but let's bring on our next speaker, who, uh, again, familiar face. Hello, Lars. Hello. Whee! And um, you're going to talk to me about ML, correct? Yeah. Yeah, in a way. Awesome. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of a fun talk because we're at the end of the day here. So um, we'll have a bit, of, a bit of fun. Apologies for the open door, but it's getting really warm in here now. <laughs> So yeah, I've been sitting my, in my own um, steam for a whole day. So, my my kids just got home, and it took them about four seconds before they started screaming at each other. So uh, I'm going to mute myself, oh, yeah. and over to you. <laughs> no worries at all. Oh yeah, welcome everybody. See again, I'm changing from being host to being a speaker now, but that's okay. Um, I have got. It's a little bit of a fun talk. We'll see how long it takes. Um, it's something that I've been dabbling with. It's, it's part of a project that I'm doing at work, really, uh, which is a training project for, for A Club Guru. And I thought I'll share with you. And it's, yeah, it's, it's about spam. Uh, I think spam is misunderstood. Um, but, you know, we can uh, um, share my screen. That'd be great. We can show the screen share, I think, and we'll put that up and we can, uh, we can get into it. Um, so... No, 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 not sure. Oh, I'll just keep talking then. Um, so we have, um, oh, there we go. <laughs> just be a bit of, ah. um, yeah, so it's 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 a talk about spam. There's a bit of a humorous twist to it, but there's also a bit of machine learning to it. Um, there's a bit of coding to it. There's a bit of everything, right? So so stick with me. And again, please ask questions on, on YouTube. Yeah, just put them in the comment and we'll get to them either throughout because I can see them right here next to me or at the end. We'll see how we go. Um, so I have created a talk. It's called Does Spam Have an Opinion? Um, and using machine learning to understand spam. And it's interesting because I just realized, um, <clears throat> a bit ashamed to admit, that there was a talk on track four, room four, um, earlier, even this session before, that was also about sentiment analysis and machine learning, or a bit step, step further. So I should probably go first. Anyway, now we go. You can always go back and watch it as well. So. Let me just see here. Here we go. It's going to change. Here we go. So that's me. Um, I am supposed to say, hey, I work for a cloud guru, which is a you know cloud training company. I do a lot of Azure stuff. I do a lot of stuff on camera, on YouTube, uh, on our own platform. Um, and it's fun because I get to talk to people that are really excited about learning new stuff. And I get to learn stuff to teach it so that you can learn. Hey, um, I'm also a Microsoft MVP, which means you get a lot of stickers from Microsoft. Um, Humor aside, it does open a lot of doors, and it means that they award you something for all the community work that you do. So it's not a you're not employed by Microsoft or anything like that. Uh, but yeah, it's um it's also what I have on you know behind me all my MVP awards because that's quite a proud moment, and you should take pride in your achievements. Um, if I take something from um, all the talk we heard today, Melissa and Brookins in particular. So I'm gonna keep going. Um, actually, it says my title is title is training architect. Um, and then <laughs> the the HR system mucked up. I don't know what happened, but suddenly I became a train architect and I'm just stuck with it. So from now on, I'm a train architect because it sounds so much cooler um, and I like trains. So I'm a train architect. So there, exactly. All right. So I am just going to get my notes. Hang on a second. So you, if you watch the stream earlier, you might have seen the llamas because those are llamas in the background. But what you also might see is that there's a satellite dish, right? So I used to be on this not ancient but somewhat rural internet connection. Uh, it's called SkyMuster, which is the Australian government's way of providing internet connection to people that live in the middle of nowhere like I do. You can see there's no neighbors around me. And, and that's great. Uh, the problem is that especially because it was a geosynchronous satellite, it was really far away, really, really far away, like 45,000 kilometers, which means that your ping goes up. Now, the benefit is that there's only one satellite and it stays exactly the same spot. So it's very easy, easy. I say that in quotation marks because whereas nothing about satellite launches are easy, but it's an easy technology compared to, you know, satellites that move around. And that also means that it was always a problem um, Come on, change your slide. There we go. 
There we go. It was always a problem streaming llamas, right? So I talked about this in the break before that I have llama cam and it is running and it is via satellite connection, um, but it was never quite amazing. So usually what would happen, I've actually created talks about this, is that the internet experience here would be like banjo coding in the outback. This is an actual slide from a talk I gave a few years ago because it's such a weird thing to get used to. Actually, this is what normally happens, to be honest. Usually that you get this little lag, right? And it cuts out and you don't see anyone. Um, but what happened is that I, I got Starlink, right? And I wanted to put this in because it's such a huge change in how I work with technology, not just in what we're going to talk about with spam, um, but it is, in fact, complete space nectar. So this system, and this is just me nerding out right now. We At the end of the day, we need to have something that's interesting, right? There's currently about 1,700 satellites rather than one, but they are, instead of 45,000 kilometers up, they're about 400 kilometers, 450, 500 kilometers up, which means they're much closer to the Earth, which means that the ping time is really slow, um, um, low, right? It's a very fast connection, or well, the latency is low. Um, but they move because they are constantly falling because of Earth's gravity, but they fall around the Earth, essentially, right? So they circle the Earth, and that's why there's so many of them in like a super constellation. And then that means that the dish that I have on my roof now moves to capture all the satellites, and it's very complex. I'm amazed that they made it work. And now apparently there's also satellites that talk to each other. So not only can we get it with a dish that moves and catches the satellite that is here right now, you can also get it in the middle of the ocean or where there is no, because you need a ground station. So I, my satellite goes up to, sorry, my dish goes up to a satellite that goes down to a ground station. That's how I get internet connection. Um, I'm just blown away. So if you hear about Starlink, it's an absolutely fantastic um, invention. Just marvelous. Um, anyway, that's enough about Starlink, I think. So the connection is pretty good now. I'm actually not. Um, I have better connection than most Australians, funny enough. So it is a bit of a... Um, contentious issue with people sometimes because they can't get Starlink if they're in the city usually. Anyway, we're going to talk about spam. Um, right. So we, yeah, we're not just talking about spam, but we're actually talking about spam that for my, you know, my purpose goes at seven and a half kilometers a second. That's how fast the satellites move. And we all have, let's say, a restrained relationship with spam, right? Um, it does help that we can kind of put it in space. I think that's pretty cool that we have space spam now with satellite connections. But anyway, <laughs> um, spam is something that we get every day, right? Some have spam filters that work more or less. Some have not. Um, there we go. I'm just looking at the comments as well. Please put them in the in, in YouTube. Actually, I can move my computer a bit over here so I can see it better. Um, so please do put them in the comments. I can see it all. Um, and but what is spam? Like what what is spam in fact? What is it that we use um, for spam? So the official definition, and this is from Oxford Dictionary, I think, it says what is spam? It's irrelevant or unsolicited unsolicited messages sent over the internet, typically to a large number of users. Yes, for the purposes of advertising, phishing, spreading malware, etc. That etc. means there's a whole lot of things that spam tries to do. Now, when I first read this, when I was trying to figure out how what how, what I could do with all these spam emails, what really caught my eye was the word irrelevant. How do we know? Someone obviously took a lot of time writing these spam messages out because you know they send them to a lot of people and they're hoping for a result, whether that's good for you or not. But are they irrelevant? Are they irrelevant messages? Ooh, I thought, well, they make me think. Hmm. Maybe we can do something with this, right? Now, okay, I'm going to need you all to go in the YouTube chat and give me your answer to this. How much of the email that gets sent, how many, how large a percentage, I should say, uh, of the emails that, that, that get sent are spam? What do you think? Uh, and I want you, if you can, that would be fantastic. Now, I have a couple of suggestions here. Might be 12%. Um, Maybe it's 20%. Is it that high? Maybe it's 35%, 40%. Like, how high is it? Is it 50%? What do you reckon? Come on. There's 42 people here watching. I'm sure you can uh, give me some numbers. Just blurt it out. 35%. J thank you, JT. Keep going. We've got 20%, Michelle. 
Now, I'm not saying you should pick one of these numbers. These are just like suggestions to get your mind going. Like, give me what you actually think. Right? Someone's saying 99.99%. That's true in some cases, I think. <laughs> um, feels like that. So, yeah. I say, because according to a survey um, in June of this year, so not that long, 84% price is spam because they apparently are irrelevant and unsolicited, right? So in numbers, 362 billion for, that's an awful lot of data. <laughs> yep, no, it's an awful, some people have taken to analyzing spam in other ways, which I think is quite hilarious. So this is something I found on Reddit. Um, someone got 182 spam emails in a week and they analyzed where, what categories that was down to quite a lot of detail. Um, I, I mean, there's the obvious like Viagra and unsolicited sex things, sure. But then there's also gutter protection, <laughs> sure, what? Or business insurance in French. So I'm though, like, is that really spam? How, how would you, anyway, yeah, business insurance. But anyway, I found these quite humorous because there's just always stuff that comes out of it that I didn't realize or didn't expect, to be honest. So um, what about this one? Spam sources. There we go. Um, this is where, who actually sends the spam, or allegedly. Um, most of it is finance. And that's, I don't think that's completely um, unsurprising. I, I think that's kind of as you'd expect. Um, but then I thought something like online games would be much higher, but it's only about a percent, one half percent. Um, IT vendors, I don't know why they do spamming stuff anyway. Um, but obviously not a lot of global internet portals. Um, this comes from the old school way of thinking about SEO, that if you have a link to your website more places, then it goes high in Google. I don't think it works like that anymore. But that would be some of those internet portals, I suspect. Um, but yeah, there's an interesting split of it. There's a whole lot of it, right? And then if you look at something like phishing in, in particular, so phishing is the action of trying to get you to do a thing by sending you an email, right? So it could be clicking on a link or, hey, your, I, your um, iCloud account is closed or your, e your PayPal balance is in a negative, click here to sort it out kind of thing. Those are phishing uh, emails. And a lot of that comes with fake invoices. And um, I don't know if anyone remembers the I love you virus in like 1998 or 99, but that was like a, an Excel spreadsheet that came with us, a bit like a fake invoice that someone clicked and there was a, a VB script, I think it was, that ran and it sent it to everybody else and this clocked up everything. Um, yeah, what we got? <laughs> the, the Viagra spam is insane. That's right, Michelle. Um, yeah, it's, um, and that wasn't my email account, just make that sure, make that clear um so a, a lot of phishing scam tactics as well um but what do we do with it like the destiny of all this spam is just junk right we just get rid of it and it just piles up like where does spam go when it dies hmm all the data that is used on it just sort of disappears and it just becomes junk um we just disregard it right we just click that delete button and just get rid of it and i think we can do more with it i think we can do more with it so uh, let's just have a look. I'll make sure I listen for any notifications here. So um, we um, often, well, come on, it's going a bit slow here, sorry. There we go. Often it's a spam filter um, that takes care of it. It could be a junk folder. Uh, we all have junk folders. Um, I'll show you mine in just a second while well, screenshot of it. Um, and then we have the vicious delete button, right? We all know this delete button. We just keep pressing it all the time. Um, so, wow, that is really jerky, that GIF, isn't it? Anyway, we'll go away from the GIFs because that's... But I think there's a way that we can maybe coexist with spam, right? We need to understand it. We need to understand what is, what is the sentiment, what is inside of this spam. And if we can do that, maybe we can learn to live together. Hey, maybe. I don't know. But we'll look at it. So um, that is part of, that was my thinking for it. I thought there was a terrible waste where 84% of spam gets discarded. Well, most of it does at least. Um, and we just don't do anything with it. It's just junk, right? 
hence the junk junk mail. Um, but maybe there's a way that spam can be here somewhere. Maybe there's a, a way that emails and pie charts can live together, right? So why not use robots or some sort of robots? Let's use digital robots. Um, th there's a, I think there's for us to maybe investigate how this might work. And we, I mean, I'd love to use Wally, but I don't think Wally might be the right choice, but that was the best picture I could find. I think instead we need to use something like machine learning because I think machine learning can uh, outpace spam. So machine learning in very brief description, right? It's a lot more than this is the study of computer algorithms that can improve automatically through experience and using data. And I think machine learning as a tool now, if you haven't done any machine learning before, don't worry. This is going to be really simple. Um, this is the whole point of this is that you can use tools as a technical developer type person. You can absolutely do this too. Um, I'm sort of at the very beginner stage of machine learning. I'm just dipping my toes in now because I like to understand it more. I think machine learning is one of those tools a bit like blockchain. I don't think anyone cares about blockchain of, in terms of consumers. right? I think it's a bit the same with machine learning. But I think those two, machine learning blockchain as examples, will be part of many, many, many tools um, over the years or in, in, the, in the future. Such as, for example, Azure SQL right now is using blockchain for, or you can use blockchain for um, log, um, um, what's the right word? I forgot the word. Not authentication, but integrity. Like, so you know that your logs are correct and no one's fiddled with anything in, inside of, of Azure SQL. I think things like that is where it can really improve. The same with machine learning. And this is part of part of the story, right? So, um, okay, we still have a... Don't forget... Oops, sorry. Move the mic. Don't forget to um, ask questions. Please do ask questions. So let's learn about the inner workings of spam. Let's understand... Why, maybe what's the sentiment behind it? I think that's a really interesting word. Um, so we're going to be using my spam, right? So here is my inbox. Um, this is of, as of, oh, what was this? About a month ago, I think, or something. I started collecting spam. And this is a typical, I, I would say, a typical inbox for spam, right? So I have something about sheds. I have this one, which is the smoothie diet. For some reason, I got this a lot. So someone thinks I should be on the smoothie diet. Um, something about toenail fungus. Hey, fantastic. Um, and then I've got some creative stuff. I've got Cointree, which I think is crypto something, Bitcoin, something like that. More sheds and something about diabetes as an example here, right? So I took all of this junk and I, and I, I saved it over a period of time um, and I extracted it. So I, I took messages like this one. <laughs> boost your horse tail and mane growth effortlessly like, i've never thought i needed this but there you go promote mane and tail growth i didn't even know that was a thing see i'm being educated equine hair nourishment so i bet you that most of you wouldn't know that this was a thing either have you ever thought about the equine hair nourishment industry i thought so uh horse safe natural ingredient etc etc right and there's a link there of course god knows why that goes i didn't click on the links um but this could be a legit thing. I just, I don't, I don't think I signed up for horse hair care, I think. Um, but there we go. So that's one of them. Another one with a lot more uh, effort, I think, that was put into it was this one. It's almost like a poem. You know, has it ever felt like fat is just stuck to your bones? And I'm like, well, I don't know. Mm, not really. That's how I was with Jenny. Oh, it's about Jenny. I'm not Jenny, right? And then it, it, it tells about Jenny. It tells a story about Jenny. Um, and how that she eventually had this breakfast um, trick, apparently, and fat peeled away. I'm not sure fat peels away, but okay. Um, and then it has the, the call to action, right? So click here to see five-second breakfast trick. And I'm not sure, again, I couldn't click on it. But there's a whole story. Someone took a lot of effort writing this, I think. Um, so I thought, let's take all of this spam and let's do something with it, like all of it. So what were the tools that I used? Well, I am a Microsoft MVP in the Azure award category. So yes, I used Azure. Uh, the cool thing about cloud technology is that you can use very, very compute heavy things with a click of a button. You don't need to buy all the hardware and everything, right? And this particular thing, I, I, in this particular instance, I used cognitive services, which is 
a fantastic tool. Um, it's, I'll show you all in live in just a minute. It's really, really simple to use. It's super easy. Um, all you have to know is just this, like a bit of logistic regression, neural networks, and partial derivatives, and you're set. That's all you need to know. No, you don't. Um, all you need to know is just how to log into Azure Portal. Um, obviously, all of that is behind it for machine learning. But again, I like mathematics, but that's another level. Um, and if I want to do a thing with machine learning, I don't need to know what the mathematics are underneath it at first. I need to know how that affects my project, right? So there are a bunch of different cognitive services on Azure. Uh, we have some here that are, um, uh, well, this is not the, the full list, but there's some of them here. Um, I'm going to use what's called text analytics. So that's the one you can see, you know, second row, third um, square there detect sentiment, key phrases, and named entities. So there's a bunch of things you can do with text analytics, not just what we're going to do. But there's a whole bunch of them. Um, and if you are interested in this, in, in machine learning, in, in the, the sort of modeling of data to automate it, these cognitive services are fantastic. Like there's so many different things you can do with this. Computer vision, um, that's another one that I'm actually thinking of using for my Llama cam. Um, I've started using it, so that, that's the bottom uh, bottom row, first square there says computer vision. I thought I was going to use, the, I'm thinking of using that for Llama Cam in the sense that when I get um, a notification and there's a movement, I can take that still image, pass it through computer vision, and then there's a model I can tell whether it's a Llama or not, right? And I've trained the model. I have the model going. That's not what we're talking about today, but as an example. And I did all that in like two hours or something. I had just a bunch of images of llamas, a bunch of images that aren't llamas, like zebras and giraffes and horses and dogs and whatever. And then it trains it so it knows what llamas are. Now I need to do the next step. But my point is, it's really, really approachable, even though it's called machine learning and sounds scary. So we're going to use text analytics for this. Um, so I've created a text analytics service. I'm going to call it Spam Cognition because we are looking for, uh, you know, Cognitive services, we're using that for spam, sentiment analysis. Um, and it just, it looks like any other Azure service. There's, if you're familiar with Azure, this is very stock standard. If you're not familiar with Azure, um, if you create a storage account or a VM or, right, it's all the same over time, and then it almost becomes second nature. Um, so, Still no questions? Oh, we got no llama hair nourishment required, Matt says. Well, I don't know. Um, they do like a, they look they do look a bit raggedy, so maybe, but um um <laughs> yeah, why not? Once again, someone can tell me that. Like equine bovine, the llamas or something. The same as goats, I think. Anyway, um this uh, text analytics service, cognitive service in Asia, you get an endpoint. So it's publicly available. Obviously, it's authentic. So, um, oh, and you get some keys and endpoints. This is, we're gonna, I'm going to show you where that is and how that works. Right. Um, and then we get an actual interface. So we're going to use this at first before we go into some of the code. Um, but there's a text analyst. I'm actually going to use version 3.1 because that just came out just to uh, you know mess up my demo and see if we can break it. <laughs> um, but I am going to do a demo. So. Demo time, right? So, uh, not used to standing up. Yeah, I'm a nerd. I sit down. Um, so, I'm just going to share this. So, no, I'm not going to share that. Let's jump over to, bear with me here. Doo -doo -doo, there we go. So, we have, oh, come on. Slow, slow, slow. There we go. There's the spam cognition, and I'm just going to get my cognitive services as well. Come on, Chrome. Yeah, you can do it. There we go. So um, let me just make that a bit bigger. It's really struggling a bit here. I hope you can see that. There we go. It's coming up. Yep. Um, yeah. Okay. Yep, we got it. All right. Let me just make that a bit bigger as well. Okay, so let's start here. So first of all, here's the service. Here's the spam cognition service. Um, there's not much to it because everything is done for you, right? It's already done the model for you and everything. Um, so you just got to set up the service, and then there's an API of how you use it, which I'll show you just in a sec. 
Um, so here, let me just show you the keys and endpoint because this is all the bit you need, right? Um, da, 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 da. Come on, there we go. So we have an endpoint. We have a location. So the location is important uh, because you can only access it in one location um, the way you created it for the, for the um, uh, for the service, for the cognitive service test I'm going to do in a minute. And then there's two keys, right? And they don't show you. So we want to we want to use those keys to authenticate with, it's like a token, right? Uh, okay. So let's go over here to the text analytics API. So this is, you can see on the left here, just within text analytics, there's all these different APIs, right? So we're going to use the sentiment API. And uh, the name of that is here. So, yep. This is for my test. And then there's a few parameters that you can add. Now, I'm just going to go through a couple of them. There's more parameters, but we don't have enough time to go through that. Um, so show stats. Yes, we want to show the output of what actually is the stats. That's what we're interested in. This is we, We're going to analyze the sentiment of something. Uh, in this case, our spam email, right? Um, and then there's opinion mining. I'll get back to that in a second. Then there's just a string index that just tells you what the format is. Uh, and then in here, this key here, the OCP APIM subscription key is the key from there. So this, in this case, it's key one, right? And obviously there's two keys because you're supposed to rotate them regularly. So that key one, key two becomes key one, et cetera. Uh, and you put a new one, new key in. Um, so that's, that's how you authenticate with it. Then I have a, a body here of JSON. Very, very simple in this case. Um, it needs an ID. And again, this is purely for demonstration purposes. This is just to show you how the IPA resp API responds, right? Um, give it a language and then the text. So this one is a, oh, there's a bit of a, yeah, you got to format it right. So I've taken all these uh, um, emails and I've removed all the carriage returns and everything and I've put that in. So it's all just one long string, right? That goes in here. That's the text. And that's what I'm going to do a sentiment analysis on. And then it also is here that gives you the actual request. So this is a post request. Um, this is what actually gets sent to uh, Australia East API. This endpoint here with these parameters, show stats true, opinion mining false, and so on. Um, and of course, there's a there's an authentication key in there as well. It doesn't show you that. And then if I click on send in this, that just sends well, come on, here we go. 107 millisecond response, pretty good. And then I get a whole bunch of data to back. Um, so the top bit here is not as interesting. So here are my statistics. So I sent a reasonably long string from directly taken from a spam email. There was no no cheating. It was exactly from it. And um, Amanda had tried everything to lose weight, but after having a second son, the weight wasn't coming off. That's the first sentence. So the sentiment analysis takes it sentence by sentence by sentence by sentence, and it figures out what is the sentiment in this sentence, right? So in this case, it's saying that's negative. Whoops, sorry. Um, this sentence, so there's a, you can see it's just a standard JSON format. There's a sentences collection here, and the sentiment for the first sentence is negative. It's 100% sure that's negative, right? And we can see, okay, yeah, well, the weight wasn't coming off. Could be that's a negative. Then the next sentence, it says she tried all the popular plans like Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig, even some crazy fad diets from Dr. Oz, I think. And there's another weird character, but nothing worked. And in this case, it's 95% sure that that's a negative. And then we get down to, we've all been there, right? And it's pretty sure that's a positive, et cetera, et cetera. So it's analyzing each sentence for sentiment, positive, negative, or neutral. Overall, Wow, this is laggy. There we go. This is the overall document sentiment was mixed. So it can't determine if it was just positive or negative. It's mainly positive. You can see the numbers here. It says it's 69% positive, but it's also 29% negative. So that's where you get a mixed back, uh, a mixed result, right? Okay. So, oh, come on. I have a whole bunch of them here. Let me just hang on a second. So I have a whole list of them. So. Let me just try another one, just because we can. And then I'll get into some of the coding stuff. Um, OK, so we have one about Einstein and Tesla here. Oh, come on. It's, I think my computer is struggling a bit, so we'll see how we go. Uh, da, 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 da. Go. 
All right, so I'm just going to paste that in. So this one is, what do Einstein, Tesla, and even Nostradamus have in common? They all knew something, yada, yada, yada. So that's, again, I've just copied it in. I'm doing the same thing, just so you can see a, a different text here. 38, oh, bad response. So I've probably got something in there. Uh, it doesn't like these. Uh, let's see, we can, uh, oh, it, no, it's not actually not the, it's the double quotation. It doesn't like, because, yeah. So this is a formatting thing. You could do that in code very easily, just remove or, or change them, right? So let's just try it again. Send that one, there we go. Response, okay. So, in this case, it says it's negative. Whoops. And it's 100% sure that that document is negative, right? So that's interesting. And I thought, okay, we can do this with lots of spam messages. We can put this through a whole bunch of stuff, but can we automate it? Well, we can. Now, I haven't quite got to the point of automating it, but I'll give you a, a sample of what it could look like. So we are in Visual Studio, good old 2019, because I don't live on the edge. Or something um and all you do here is that you um there's a whole api obviously for it so you create you to create you use the nuget package hang on let me just go into nuget if it will let me right click come on talk about yourselves wow that's uh it's not happy come on nope oh there we go uh, no, of course not, because I clicked on the file to get it to open. Come on. There we go. Manage NuGet packages. So I'll show you the NuGet package that you need to do. And that's the only thing. And it's an official Microsoft NuGet package. Um, wow. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Live demos. Good, isn't it? So, oh, hang on. I click install. I have just the Azure AI text analytics uh, New Year package. That's it. That's all you need, right? And then we can go in and obviously you can see here is my token. That's the one that was hidden before. You gotta put that in somewhere. Don't put it in code, people. All right? Never put these things in code. This is a demo, it's a sample. Don't do this. Um, and then we have the endpoint URL where we're gonna to talk to. And all you have to do is then create a text analytics client and then I'm going to pass that client. So that's with the endpoint credentials. That gives you the, the object, the client object. And then I pass it through to this um, uh, function here, which, by the way, I got most of this from a Microsoft example. It's that simple. There's no point in writing it again. Um, and that client, all you need to do is create an analyzed sentiment batch, and you just give it that document, right? That's all you need to do. Now, in this case, for this particular one, I also get the um, opinion mining segment, segment of it. Now, opinion mining is a way of um, trying to figure out where, which part of, or, so which keyword, keyword you are analyzing the sentiment about. Now, I couldn't get this to work 100% on all the spam, but I think it's worth um, trying. I can show you for a very simple example. It says the food and service were unacceptable, but the concierge were nice. Was, were. Um, and that is a, a way that you can show uh, something negative and something positive, right? But we want to find out what was negative and what was positive. What are they talking about? So in this case, all I do here is just a huge for each thing that I just print out stuff, right? I just print out all the, the results. So if I run this, it's just a console app, remember? Um, and wait, because it has to fire up. Come on, build it. Um, that does exactly the same as I just did before on the website, right? It's it's really that simple. Now, my point is that, oh, and it goes on the other screen. Thank you very much. Come on. So that now runs, it connects to Azure using that token that we saw. And here's the score. So that's similar to what you came out before, but formatted a bit nicely. Um, so what it says here is that we have the aspect. So the aspect is what are we talking about? Like what's the target? of this sentiment. In this case, it's the food. It's negative, which is what it says. The food and service were unacceptable. But we also have an aspect called service, which was also negative, right? You say it's 100% sure that that was negative. And then we have the concierge, which was positive. Now, this is very cool because you could use something like this to analyze your Google reviews. Like if you run a restaurant, if you run a business, you can 
I in this case a restaurant because they talk about food. Um, but if you have a business that you and and feedback, as we know, I don't know how many here get surveys after after every single interaction with a company. Yeah, exactly. Everybody wants to know what you think so that they can stand out and be better. I think. Um, and this could be really cool for that. If you automate this and you plug this into, um, let's say, a logic app on Azure, which is also very simple to do, um, you could have all the Google reviews plugged into the logic app that then runs a cognitive um, service sentiment analysis on it and then spits it out. And then you could know what is it that people like and what is it that they don't like. And I think this is very, very cool. It's it's very simple. And all this came about because I was looking at spam. <laughs> oh, no. Um, so, oh, let me go. Is there a logic app connector for the text analytics client? And Matt's already answered it. Yes, there is. Um, and if there wasn't, you can just plug in an API, by the way, an API endpoint. You can do that with logic apps as well. Um, logic app is one of those things that a lot of developers sort of look down their nose at, to be honest, because it's not real coding. Because logic apps are one of those services where you just plug things in. But the they're so powerful and they're so fast to use that it's like the, the point is moot. Like it is development because you're plugging things together. It's just that there's no actual code in it. You can write JavaScript to do little things and whatnot, but you don't have to. And there's plenty of other areas where you do need coding. So logic apps are very cool. Very cool. And yeah, it's one of those things where I would have that table that says logic apps are cool, so change my mind. Um, I just I, I don't see any argument for why they're not cool. Mm -hmm. And they keep doing developed and they're serverless, which is also very cool, I heard. Um, all right. So, yep, that was it for that. Thanks for entering that, Matt, by the way. Matt, I, uh, no, yeah. Oh, yeah, you were about the llama. That's right. Okay. So let me just go out of this. Um, so this code example is very simple. Come on, close. There we go. There's not much to it because it really is that simple. But you could imagine if you plug that into um, you know, that documents object there, if you plug that into something that, you know, feeds stuff into it or a logic app, but you can build your own as well. Um, so, yeah. So where does this all lead us to then? So we've seen now how we, um, what we create on Azure, a cognitive service sentiment, uh, text analytics uh, client. We know use sentiment analysis through an API. We can get opinion mining even. Now, I tried this on larger examples and it didn't quite work. It usually had the object the target is just um, null. So I'm guessing there's some work to be done on that part, but it's very cool when it works. Um, and it's often very accurate when it does work. So that's cool. Um, and we've now seen it in code as well. Very rudimentary, basic thing, but we don't have that much time. And, and I didn't create a large experiment. Maybe I'll do that. Actually, this is part of a, a project like I was saying earlier that I'm doing for ACG. So this will be in a much more polished and edited way soon um, on YouTube and our platform. Hmm, there's a plug. Plug. So I'll close this again. I'll bring up my slides again. There we go. Let's see if. Yeah, of course it shows. Why does it always do that? Why does PowerPoint not remember where you were? Uh, which screen was what? Anyway. So enough of you, Gordon. Goodbye. So this is all it is, right? It's just JSON that you can't that that comes back. And it's if you haven't worked with JSON notation before, it's almost human readable. Almost. It's that simple. But there are so many libraries that take JSON natively and just works with it and makes this all into objects um, for in your code that you can use. So it's super easy to use. And it's it's very in this case, it's very simple JSON. There's not not a lot of um um, finagle or, or tricks to it. So, all right, we need some results because I did this on 20 spam messages that I found that I picked out. And this is was my spam count in percentage because who doesn't like a good pie chart, right? I'm talking to you, Mr. Manager, Madam Manager. Um, so a lot of this was about health because I think what they're trying to do with spam is obviously the sentiment of it is that they want you to, you know, something that relates. And health is something that we, most of us think about, unless you're 21 and think you're invincible. But other than that, you know, reasonable uh, part of us would, would consider health being a, a part of what we, you know, strive to keep on top of. Then there's shopping, obviously, buy my thing. There's business stuff, which is like a business proposal. You know, come and invest in this or buy these shares or the crypto mining thing. Um, 
it was a lot about weight loss in particular. You could say that's health, but it was it was you know there was specific ones that were just about weight loss. So I put those in as that. And then there's one about the mind, you know, so mental health kind of on about the mind. So that was my split, right? So what was the overall sentiment? Like what was the actual result of all of this analytics and all of this finagling going around with code and Azure and everything? Where do we end up? So it turns out that shopping overall is very neutral. Um, no, it, it never seems to be positive or negative. You can see that is overwhelmingly neutral. It was just buy my thing. Um, health was very negative. And it's probably to call an action, right? It was all about, hey, you, you know, your toenail fungus is really bad, or you die, you might get diabetes or whatever it is. Um, business was all positive. Hey, buy my thing, it's awesome. Right. And weight loss, weight loss was sort of in between, um, negative and positive. And it was all, I added all this up. It was a lot of fun <laughs> to put in. Um, so that was uh, um, the conclusion, right? It's, it's you know, there are, if you've got to form a bond with spam, you, you go for business opportunities. That's where, that's the positive thing, right? And as we talked about with Melissa this morning that she was talking about, try and get into that positive mood, right? Negative fosters negativity. So um, yeah, spam can make it positive, maybe. Or something. Um, right. Now, just before we end and we go into Q&A, if there is anything. Um, oh yeah, price draw, into the price draw. Um, I just wanted to pull out a few quotes. <laughs> from some of these messages because I thought they were amazing. Um, so there's one from Sheds because I got, I don't know why, but I get spam about building Sheds, maybe because I live on a farm, I don't know. Um, but it says here that our, our plans so complete they build themselves. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm amazed. That's quite the, uh, quite the claim. So I'd like to get a shed that builds itself. I'm, uh, I'm currently building a shed that's about a meter by half a meter for like garden tools. And that's taking me six months already. I don't know what I'm doing. So build themselves, that'd be great. Um, another one, President Putin has been using this Russian method for years and is one of the reasons he's in such incredible shape. It's almost like he wrote it himself. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if he is, but anyway. Yep, I'm gonna leave that one there. And then about this one, I'm, I'm still confused. Why do we punish a finger that has done nothing to deserve it? I, 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 there was no context. Why, why are we punishing fingers? It's painful. And this is, again, what's the sentiment? For some, it's nauseating to punish a finger. Plus, seeing your own blood in the morning ruins your appetite for your frosted flakes. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah. So, don't just discount spam, right? Because it, it brings you humor and stuff. Anyway, my point with all this is, of course, we don't like spam, right? But what you can do is that you can use Azure Cognitive Services um, with little effort. If you even if you've got a free account, I think you can still spin up a cognitive service and you get like 5,000 um, API queries a month for free, which is a lot if you're just doing you know something like this, a personal project. Um, it is kind of fun to work with because you don't have to be a machine learning guru. You can get access to all of these different tools that do all these different things, like the one I did with the Llama Cam, train a model, like try and train a model that says, is this a whatever or not, or I can recognize things, right? It's very cool. Um, so yeah, I think I ended up, oh, that's 45 minutes, not bad. I think we're gonna go to Q and A. Um, so I'm gonna do that and I'll just see if I can bring back Dave. I need to go back to, there it is, A. Hey. Hello, Dave. Oh, look at that. You're on mute, Dave. <laughs> How do you mean? I wasn't even here. <laughs> it was Wally. <laughs> oh, very How good. A bit of fun here at the end of the day. Um, so yes, what did we get? A nice dessert <laughs> at all. Well, I think you covered all the questions uh, while you were doing it. You're, uh, you're a little Well, Matt answered it for me. Well, that's true, too. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm curious... Other than Llama Cam, which you've talked about, uh -huh. um, I'm kind of curious how this fits in or like whether you have ideas for what's next. I know you're big into home assistant, that sort of thing. Um, hmm. What's the next thing that you'd like to tackle with it? Or, you know? Well, I think, to be honest, so we, so we run a, um, uh, like an Airbnb thing as well. 
Mm-hmm. And I wasn't completely kidding when I said that it, it matters what people think is good and bad. And like, how else can you fix it? Right. If someone yeah. says, oh, the fly screen's broken, uh, but the TV was great. Like, is it, you need to kind of pick that out. Now, as a, as a business with, with like one room, mm-hmm. it's not hard to do it as people <laughs> post it, right? It's, it's not, yeah. you don't need to build a whole machine learning you know, operation to do that. Um, but something like that, I, it's, and I, I, yeah, as you said, I do a lot with home automation. Um, and I'm trying to figure out because it's, so I use you know, a product called Unify and there's a bunch of cameras that I have and they all bring in motion events. And yeah. I think, oh, I could do something with those motion events. Um, and then trigger stuff, but I don't know exactly how that might fit in with cognitive um, services. And there are so many of them anyway. Um, yeah. So there's, yeah, it's, it's, I'm not hundred percent sure. I'll just go have a look. Uh, hang on. Yeah. I'm, I'm, that, that, that idea, that makes sense to me. I have, I have a, a couple of cameras as well and motion events. There's one pointing up front and, you know, you can try to, to tell it where to look, but then at night the headlights flash up the lights on the fence and so it thinks something moved and so if refining yeah. that or something would be yeah interesting. yeah um and i saw i saw someone that had done it with with that and and had a because the the camera a lot of the cameras nowadays have an rtsp feed like a real-time streaming mm-hmm. protocol feed mm-hmm. so with, that's a local protocol this is how you can yeah. see the camera on your local network right and um if you can somehow get that feed into something that you know, you don't want to send, you know, all of it up to the cloud because it's big bytes of data, right? So yeah. you got to segment the data and you can then use those images to say, hey, is this a car or a dude that's in the carport, right? Mm-hmm. If it's a dude uh, or a person, I want to know, right? Because it's yeah. not supposed to be a person there. Those kind yeah. of things. Yeah. It's cool. Um, yeah. <sighs> well, we can, uh, am I a host now or am I still presenting? I don't know. This is, as I said before, this is the weird transition before. <laughs> it <your> is weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know <laughs> um but no I, we can talk about hang on let me just find this bear with me with a minute here i mean we pretty much have nothing to do officially until the uh the prize draw yeah well so people should go and join the prize draw right if they haven't already absolutely uh, mm. submit i haven't i don't know if i'm allowed but let's assume i'm not <laughs> yeah i figured i wasn't allowed either i thought that would yeah. be weird I um i did do that once actually i was um what was that? I think it was my Jeep Club. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm a member of Jeep Club. It's okay. Um, and uh, and we had this Christmas thing or whatever it was. And I drew my own hat, my own name out of the hat for winning something. <laughs> I looked at it and I just no put it back. I'm like, that's that. so yeah. weird. No, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. How many of those did you bring? So, anyway, I'm just looking up the cognitive services on the Azure side of it. So, it's called cognitive services because it's for speech, vision language and decision that's the last one decision mm-hmm. All right. and there's a whole bunch of services within that so it's like an umbrella of a t- bunch of models so that's what it's called in machine learning world is a model that microsoft has made for you to use without knowing about machine learning just knowing about apis and code um and there are okay let me just read out some of the speech to text could be useful if you're doing something um text to speech again you can get someone to talk for you speech translation now, this is one of the ones that I think they used on Skype. I believe there is still on Skype. Um, so, Skype still exist? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that's so rude. Now, if you, if, you did, if you do use Skype, right? I use it with my parents who are in their 70s. I'm not going to make them do something else. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> it's path of least resistance. But on Skype, if you speak English into the thing, the camera or whatever, it can in real time translate it to German and Spanish, I believe, and the other way around. Mm-hmm. So and it does even, speech yeah. to text, text translation, text to speech, maybe. No, it's just speech maybe. translation. So if it's in real time. Oh, it's actually. Yeah, wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's like the old, remember that Martian thing from yeah. the cartoons where you're talking to one <laughs> end and the, all the other languages come out the other? Uh-huh. It's a bit like that. Awesome. Um, speaker recognition. I haven't tried this one. Identify and verify the people speaking based on audio. That would be okay. that would be interesting. I don't know if your cameras mm. pick up audio, but that would be yeah. interesting to see if you you know if it sees a person but it hears your voice. Oh, ignore that one. But if it hears yeah. someone else, hmm. huh? Um, but there's yeah, there's languages. So sentiment analysis that we 
that I went through. Um, you can do the the usual bot stuff, you know, yeah. support sort of like question answer things. Those are a bit boring. Um, conversational language understanding. So enable the apps to interact with users throughout natural language. Yeah, it's a bit sort of still the bot thing ish. Whoops. Um, or you translate stuff, which is useful for certain things. Uh, computer vision, that's the one I like. Computer vision and custom vision. Um, they're the ones that actually use images to yeah. to visual to analyze and to come up with stuff. Um, there's a face API that I know um, my good friend Hank Bullman, who's also a, of the NDC alumni, he did a lot of stuff for that um, about how you detect whether people are happy or sad or what the mood is uh, and all that sort of stuff, right? That's um, cool. He's also a total AI nerd. And decision and, making. Uh, I just gonna say, Brooke, uh, Brooke actually in the chat has uh, recommended the Azure AI fundamentals uh, cert. Oh, if, uh, people want to learn more to get ideas, so that's cool. I can only encourage that. Thank you, Brooke. That's fantastic. Um, yeah, that's right. There is there is a cert for that. Um, I have not set that exam nor nor looked at it, so I'll take Brooke's word for it. She's sort of the AI expert in this in this uh, audience. Um, oh, Matt. Do you want to bring that that question up? There we go. Can you integrate this all into a Teams app so it listens to your speech and lets you know how casual, formal you are speaking? I would say yes, you can. Um, I believe PowerPoint has that inbuilt, and so I suspect that yeah, behind the scenes, he's probably using those same Azure services. So, wait, what? Yeah, PowerPoint has a mode where when you're doing a practice presentation, it'll give you feedback on, you know, you're saying um too much or I haven't actually tried it, but I've, I didn't know that. It. Yeah, I don't I'm know. Terrible at um. I say yeah, um okay. all the time and I do this. Speak it to us. There you go. Thank you, Brooke. Ah, see, PowerPoint speaking to us. This is so awesome. Hey, Brooke, do you want to do this talking? <laughs> I think it'd be more useful. <laughs> um, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I didn't know that existed. I've never used it. I'm going to use that next time. That's absolutely. Um, yeah. And speaking of Matt, uh, Matt W, who won the uh, NDC Sydney ticket, uh, the yes, NDC ticket for next year, uh, he would like to give his ticket away to a deserving student. Ooh. So if you are a deserving student, uh, reach out to someone at NDC. Uh, I'm sure someone can make up an email address. What, is, uh, uh, what does that mean, deserving? Uh, that well, enough? that's I don't know. He he didn't specify, but twenty five words okay. or less. Uh, <laughs> yes, you'll find oh, a coupon if you go in the cupboard. There's a rice bubbles box, and uh, just cut out the coupon. <laughs> Does that work for Lego too? I wish. Yeah. And of ah. course, the, uh, the the next question: When are the prizes being announced? Well, yep, when, when that's, that's uh, not long. Lot. Yeah, we are just minutes. waffling a bit along here because we need to compile the list and do the thing so yeah. that I can draw the the people out. That's basically what we're doing. So it won't be long. We're just waiting on the queue. That's why we're filling in the time now with a bit of yeah. AI and um and if and we did it now, there'd be there'd be three names in that and it would be well, <laughs> Lars, David, <laughs> William. Yep. I win again. Um cool. Okay, so um I don't know how we do this ticket. Anyway, I'm going to let NDC figure that one out. That's nice handball, isn't it? Mm. Um, because I I don't know what that constitutes. So I'm not a student. Well, that's not true. I'm, I study I'm all the student. time. <laughs> but are we talking about student of a institution or a student of life? Or we don't know. Well, I don't know. Is that up to NDC or is that up to Matt? Well, maybe we'll let Matt work it out. He tried to handball. Let's handball it back. Yeah. Sorry. I'm just looking at the chat as well. Um, there's something about the open AI. Ah, they just added open AI. Yeah, to Teams. That's right. Um, I think it's the Teams. There was some announcement about Teams. Um, okay. Matt saying maybe junior dev. All right. Yeah. Um, that's a good idea. Yeah, Powers GitHub Copilot. That's right. So that that's another one. Yeah, that's the one. There's the question. Um, that's cool. They being Microsoft added uh, open AI. I think that's to Teams in specific specifically. Yeah, there was there was a bunch of teams announcements at Ignite that uh, I haven't caught up on yet, so possibly that one. All right, uh, I'm just looking. Sorry, I'm just um, paying attention to whether we. Uh, no, we're still not there. Not ready yet. No, not mm -hmm. quite yet. Um, yeah, so uh, I think that answered the question about 
what to use it for. But I, I am going to do more machine learning stuff in the next year, I think. I am not going to be that complete in the depths of machine learning kind of person. I usually take yeah. a practical approach to it. So like, hey, what can I use this service for? Um, yeah. More than and that. I think it was like the, the question and, <laughs> and answer from Matt about uh, Power Apps being able to access them obviously makes that a lot easier as well you know for sure perhaps yep start start with an idea and then yeah you can always add add code later rather than having to work out i actually uh i kind of talk to you occasionally there's a there's a ml model builder built into visual studio and i talk to that team occasionally about some stuff and uh, that yeah. it's a similar idea where they're trying to uh they will like it has a mode where they will detect what the best type of machine learning is so you don't have to know necessarily the differences until you know later when it might become an issue so yeah it's cool um there's a lot of new new things coming in 2022 i haven't looked at most of it um which which bit of it you worked on 2022 don't you yeah yeah which bit of on... it did you right. uh, well in, in in the biggest the biggest bit i worked on or helped with is hot reload um oh right oh nice the the dot net six slash 2022 yep. thing if we ignore all the drama um i, was, yeah, I, I also wasn't gonna go there i wasn't gonna go there <laughs> it's, it's you, gotta, you gotta say it otherwise everyone does it is exactly yeah. it's all good now yeah. um but yeah i i don't know I, I i do a few things i uh i i work on razor tooling as well so uh hopefully okay. yeah there's a new editor for razor files so yeah uh -huh. i do stuff i do stuff i do stuff My, too my, um, my my proudest achievement so far is is in .NET six, uh, every single PDB that is produced by the compiler is teeny tiny bit bigger thanks to me. <laughs> is that I just put thing? my name in every one. Yeah, just Dave was here. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Increment count plus one. Yep, uh, exactly. That's right. You know, look, we've um, all got to make our mark. So yeah, do it. exactly. <laughs> oh man. Ah, uh, all right. Well, I think that we are going to go to uh, show a few ads for our sponsors because we cannot do this without sponsors. We seriously cannot. Um, and then when we come back, we should be good to do some prizes. Good. And finally, the top spot on our list of medium best workplace winners for 2021, rocketing up from number nine in 2020 to the top place this year. Congratulations to our number one best workplace in the medium category, Mantle Group. Mantle Group is a business that truly lives its principles. Customers rate its service delivery as excellent. Executives embody the best characteristics of the company. Employees and management are in it together. As one employee put it, the COVID crisis was tough for many businesses and watching a team of over 250 people reach consensus to get through the darkness together will be one of the highlights of my working life. To be certified with Great Place to Work here for us as an organisation is extremely important. It helps us translate feedback, input from our team and from the organisation to make us a better place to be on Australia's 2021 best place to work list is a great milestone. It's a, we're super proud to be amongst some really great organisations uh, in this list. We really put focus on, on the team. Uh, during COVID times, tough times, we really centred our business to focus on a few things that really matter. To keep our team employed, to keep people safe, but also to keep productive throughout the last 12 months. The message I'd like to give to our team is a massive thank you. There's so much gratitude as a collective group of people that make up Mandel Group and I'm super proud of everyone's efforts to contribute to making it a great place to work. It's never one person in Mandel Group, it's always a, a team that collectively delivers on our promise as, a, as an organisation. Are you an engineer looking to impact millions of Australians? We're looking for big thinkers, problem solvers and challenge seekers to help us engineer the future of banking. ComBank Engineering. Do you have what it takes? 
Search Engineering at Combank. I love running this company. I love running it because uh, of the people I deal with. There's such a great team of people. From a career perspective, it's the best move I ever did. Being a great consultant, which we are, this is W, is half-half between technical skills and communication. It's given me the opportunity to work with lots of different types of technology and explore some stuff that I maybe only dabbled in at university or before. SSW is a company that makes enterprise software solutions uh, and that's what we do. We build software for clients uh, on demand. We build bespoke solutions using the latest technology and the latest best practices. I've been involved in the development of some mining software, been involved in the development of software for a legal firm and everything in between there. Even in just under two years, I've been working across so many different projects it's just a really great place to come into and I always look forward to coming to work. When you're talking sovereign ICT capability, it's more than a safe pair of hands. It's people with very specialised capabilities. It's why we created Telstra Purple. But talking is one thing. Being able to walk the walk is another. We've supported all levels of government across Australia with customised technology solutions. We help government agencies cope with a huge increase in demand for support in times of need, all while shifting to remote working themselves. And our long-term collaboration with Ambulance Victoria resulted in a digital platform that came to the rescue in a national emergency. A perfect example of how adaptable, purpose-driven technology can be. We believe purposeful technology, inspired and delivered by people, can make the difference. We believe we're uniquely poised to help write Australia's next chapter with you. All right. Okay, hang on a second here, people. I got my hat on, but we're just getting there. Okay. All right. So <laughs> we're here for the price draw. It's very exciting. Um, we should be able to see the wheels spinning, I think, if we can. There we go. Look at that. We are ready. Now, let's just remind ourselves what we're actually playing for here. So if you've entered at the expo.ndc.sydney.com price draw, you can win one of three Amazon gift cards from Launch Darkly, uh, a smartwatch, and 10 Xiaomi fitness trackers from SSW. There is two Uber Eats vouchers at $125 and Apple AirPods from Combank. Uh, as an ex giving away $250 gift pay vouchers. Uh, as Chester Purple giving away a Nintendo Switch OLED model. Um, that must be the good one, I think. Um, and we got a free ticket. Well, we got some free tickets for NDC conferences. I'm not sure how many. Can we get someone to tell me that? That would be great. Um, so that's what we're playing for right now. So let me just here do this. There we go. All right. Cool. So I am ready for the, uh, what are we doing here? No, don't do that. Okay, now I'm ready. Hey. Okay. Well, we can all, we can all be in the price draw. Come on, put us in. That's all right. We just, we can, we can have more. We can have more people. Come on. William wants to go in. Come on, William. You can be in the price draw. All right. And uh, yeah, we got three tickets for next year. Three NDC Sydney tickets for next year. Here we go. Hello, William. Hello. I got my hat on. Oh, good, good. I've got a special hat on. This one has got so many sparkles on it, I can't touch it because it gets sparkles everywhere. Anyway, um, 
So you we just have, sprinkle that on the oh, ticket, make it nice and glowy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So this is all based on your entries on the expo site uh, to enter for the price draws. And I don't know who's in it, and I'm just going to click, and we'll see who the first one is. So we're going to give away, from top to bottom, three Amazon $100 gift cards. So I'm going to click to spin, and we see if there's audio on it. I don't know. I'm trying to share the audio. Um, I can go. hear it. Oh, you can hear it. Whee! And come on. Esteban Vigano. Hooray. And we're going to make sure that we uh, keep track of all these as well. So we're going to remove you, Esteban, because you can only win once. And then click again, and we're going to go for another Amazon gift card. And we're going to get William to read this one out. Oh, it's so tiny. <laughs> it gets bigger. Oh, yeah. wait, wait for it. Derek Lee. There we go. Hey. Well hey, done, Derek. Derek. All right. Apparently, there is going. more than one Jason Taylor in the list, a red and a yellow one. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, you can only win once. All right. <laughs> So the next winner is, who is it, Dave? Nicholas Ho, congratulations. Well done. So that's his three $100 Amazon gift cards. Nice. And uh, don't worry, we're keeping track of who's winning, and it's also being recorded anyway. So SSW has got, <laughs> now we're not going to do the 10 Xiaomi fitness trackers. We're going to do those after the fact because it takes too long, to be honest. Uh, but you, they will be drawn, and you will be notified if you win. Don't worry about that. Uh, we are going to draw for the smartwatch, though because it's, uh, and you can choose Apple or Samsung. So when you get in touch with SSW, mm -hmm. just let them know if you prefer an Apple or a Samsung smartwatch. Um, and here we go. I prefer a Rolex, personally. Yeah, smartwatch. <laughs> or not smart. And we've got Brad. Brad Gorman. Well done. You are the you lucky winner of the smartwatch. Well done. I'll remove Brad as well. All right. Next one, we have two Uber Eats vouchers, $125 each from Combank. So that's mm -hmm. going to be you. See who that is, William. Do, 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 do. Mm. Oh, and people sitting there going, no, it was so close. <laughs> uh, Stratton V. There you go, Stratton. Yeah. <laughs> you got Uber Eats voucher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got that name to say. Um, and then we got another $125 uh, Uber Eats voucher from Combank. All right, let's see. Da, 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 da. Who we got? Who we got? Actually, I'm gonna. Congratulations, Kenneth Arneson. See if you can Arneson dinner tonight. That's a very Danish surname. Well done, Kenneth. Okay, and then finally we got the Apple AirPods, also from Combank. And we're gonna roll it away. Mm. Definitely do with a pair of them. Come on, who's winning? Oh. Eddie Lamb. Well done, Eddie. Congratulations. All right. That's awesome. All right. And then, um, so I don't know how to say it. You're going to have to say it, William. Uh, Azenix? Azenix? How do you say it? <laughs> Azenix, yes. It, Azenix. Fun fact, it's the combination of Azure and Microsoft's first operating system called uh, Xenix. <sighs> You're right. Bit of nostalgia there you go. There. The first $150 <laughs> gift pay voucher is won by, who is this, William? Uh, Shane Ruud. That's I know Shane. He's from NetWealth. Wealth. Hello, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Shane. All right. And the second one from Azenix. Azenix? I ways. thought it was Sorry, I thought the like operating Azure system was Xenix. Xenix. Yeah. Is uh, JC Hong. Well done, JC. All right. And this is one of the big ones, I think, I could imagine. For all the gamers out there, one of the uh, the Nintendo Switch console OLED model. Does either you two mm. know what that means? Is yeah, that that's like the new, new version. One. Yeah, new screen. Uh -huh. New screen. Hence you can play anywhere. In the sun, in the dark, obviously. <laughs> Super cool. <laughs> hey, Anandaraj Sankar. Apologies if I mispronounce your name. Uh, well done. You won a, a Switch. Hey. Awesome. Congratulations. All right. And then we have three tickets for NDC Sydney 2022. Ooh. And Ooh, I'm going to let you do, the, you do the first one, Dave. Who is the first winner of All right. the NDC? Oh, this is a good one. Who's going to NDC? Hopefully we'll all see you there. Oh, it's just... 
Wow. Lai Hong, congratulations. That's fantastic. Well done, Lai. All right. And who is the second one, William? All right. Let's see. Let's see. Can I guess? No, that won't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll just move the screen a bit to bump it to the next one. Oh, your screen's frozen, Lars. Give me a sec. Uh, Sean Strandon. Well done, Sean. Congratulations, Sean. All right. Congrats. And we have the last one, the very last ticket for NEC Sydney 2022. Here we go. The golden Ooh. tickets, but with the same as golden the other non-gold ticket. tickets. <laughs> yeah, do the same thing now. Oh, James Dodd. Well done, James. Hooray. Yay, James. Cool. That's awesome. <laughs> So as I said, there's still the 10 Xiaomi um, fitness trackers as well. We'll do those after we end the stream and you will be notified by SSW um, mm -hmm. with, with how you claim your prize for those and all the others, you'll, you'll hear from them as well. So um, that's all going to happen. That's all the boring admin stuff. So um, I, I can just say thank you to my co-hosts. This has been a fantastic day. Um, we had mm -hmm. everything, haven't we? Oh, yeah, yeah. A lot of great yeah. talks, a lot of bits in the middle there just chit chat it was great yeah i had a lot of fun today yeah. um but now it's it's the end of the day unfortunately oh, can't it wait is, for the next one <laughs> i know it's a bit um anyway it, i yeah i enjoyed myself to be honest it's uh, i wanted to wear lots of hats they were llamas <laughs> it was fantastic <laughs> oh, oh, I had them. um yeah <laughs> so hey look at I, that uh, bunnings doesn't nice. work with oh, him, yes. no, <laughs> hey lars actually i just want to say thanks to Absolutely, everyone in the background, Jacob, Landon, Tien, uh, Steiner, everyone involved with NDC Sydney today. Uh, we, we get to do the fun bit. They they do some of the really difficult stuff in the background, making sure this all runs nice and smoothly. So a uh, big thanks to everybody on, on the background. Absolutely. So with that, I hope to see you all at NDC Sydney 2022 in person. Fingers yes. crossed. I'm definitely going to be there. Um, and um, thanks again for joining us all through the day. And until next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.